This is Audible. The Tower of the Swallow Written by Andrzej Szatkowski Translated from the Polish by David French And read by Peter Kenny To Dandera they came at dead of night For to seek the witcher maid They ringed the hamlet from all sides And sealed it with a barricade Caesar they would in perfidy But their plans were all in vain Ere the sun arose on the frozen road Three dozen brigands lay slain a beggar's song about the frightful massacre which took place in Dundere on Samhain Eve. I can give you everything you desire, said the fortune teller. Riches, power and influence, fame and a long and happy life. Choose. I wish for neither riches nor fame, neither power nor influence, rejoined the witcher girl. I wish for a horse as black and swift as a nightly gale. I wish for a sword, as bright and keen as a moonbeam. I wish to overstride the world on my black horse through the black night. I wish to smite the forces of evil and darkness with my luminous blade. This I would have. I shall give you a horse, blacker than the night and fleeter than a nightly gale, vowed the fortune teller. I shall give you a sword, brighter and keener than a moonbeam. But you demand much, witcher girl. Thus you must pay me dearly. With what? For I have nothing. With your blood. Florence Delanoy. Fairy Tales and Stories. Chapter One. As is generally known, the universe, like life, describes a wheel. A wheel on whose rim eight magical points are etched, making a complete turn the annual cycle. These points, lying on the rim in pairs directly opposite each other, include Imoloch, or budding, Lunasa, or mellowing, Beltana, or blooming, and Soin, or dying. Also marked on the wheel are the two solstices, the winter one called Midinvian, and Midete, for the summer. There are also the two equinoxes, Birka in spring and Velen in autumn. These dates divide the circle into eight parts, and so in the elven calendar the year is also divided up like that. When they landed on the beaches in the vicinity of the Yeruga and the Pontar, people brought with them their own calendar, based on the moon, which divided the year into twelve months, giving the farmers annual working cycle from the beginning with the markers in January until the end when the frost turns the sod into a hard lump. But although people divided up the year and reckoned dates differently, they accepted the elven wheel and the eight points around its rim. Adopted from the elven calendar, Imluk and Lunasa, Sawin and Beltana, both solstices and both equinoxes became important holidays, sacred tides for human folk. They stood out from the other dates as a lone tree stands out in a meadow. Those dates are also set apart by magic. It was not, and is not, a secret that the eight dates are days and nights during which the enchanted aura is greatly intensified. No longer is anyone astonished by the magical phenomena and mysterious occurrences that accompany the eight dates, in particular the equinoxes and solstices. Everyone is now accustomed to such phenomena, and they seldom evoke a great sensation. But that year it was different. That year, people had, as usual, celebrated the autumnal equinox with a solemn family meal, during which all the kinds of fruits from that year's harvest had to be arrayed on the table, even if only a little of each. Custom dictated it. Having eaten and given thanks to the goddess Melitila for the harvest, the people retired for the night. And then the nightmare began. Just before midnight, a frightful storm got up, and a hellish gale blew, in which a ghastly howling, screaming and wailing were heard above the rustling of trees being bent almost to the ground, the creaking of rafters and the banging of shutters. The clouds driven across the sky assumed outlandish shapes, among which the most common were silhouettes of galloping horses and unicorns. The gale did not abate for a good hour, and in the sudden silence that followed it, the night came alive with the trilling and whirring of the wings of hundreds of goat-sucker nightjars, those mysterious fowl which, according to folk tales, gather together to sing a demonic death knell over a dying person. 
This time, the chorus of night jars was as mighty and loud as if the entire world were about to expire. The night jars sang their death knell in clamorous voices, while the horizon became shrouded in clouds, quenching the remains of the moonlight. At that moment sounded the howl of the fell Banshee, the harbinger of imminent and violent death, and across the black sky galloped the wild hunt, a procession of fiery-eyed phantoms on skeleton horses, their tattered cloaks and standards fluttering behind them. So it was every few years. The wild hunt gathered its harvest, but it had not been this terrible for decades. In Novigrad alone, over two dozen people went missing without a trace. After the hunt had galloped by and the clouds had dispersed, people saw the moon on the wane, as was customary during the equinox. But that night, the moon was the color of blood. Simple folk had many explanations for these equinoctial phenomena, which tended to differ considerably from each other according to the specifics of local demonology. Astrologers, druids, and sorcerers also had their explanations, but they were in the main erroneous and cobbled together haphazardly. Few, very few people were able to connect the phenomena to real facts. On the Isles of Skellige, for example, a few very superstitious people saw in the curious events a harbinger of Teth Direa, the end of the world, preceded by Rach Naroch, the last battle between light and darkness. The violent storm which rocked the islands on the night of the autumn equinox was regarded by the superstitious as a wave pushed by the prow of the fearsome Nagelfar of Morhuch, a longship with sides built of dead men's fingernails and toenails, bearing an army of spectres and demons of chaos. More enlightened or better informed people, however, linked the turmoil of the heavens with the evil witch Yennefer and her dreadful death. Others yet, who were even better informed, saw in the churned-up sea a sign that someone was dying. Someone in whose veins flowed the blood of the kings of Skellige and Sintra. The world over, the autumn equinox was a night of spectres, nightmares and apparitions, a night of sudden, suffocating awakenings, fraught with menace, among sweat-soaked and rumpled sheets. Neither did the most illustrious escape the apparitions and awakenings. Emperor Emrieva Emris awoke with a cry in the Golden Towers in Nilfgaard. In the north, in Lan Exeter, King Esterad Tyson leapt from his bed waking his spouse, Queen Zuleika. In Tretogor, the arch-spy Dijkstra leapt up and reached for his dagger, waking the wife of the state treasurer. In the huge castle of Monte Calvo, the sorceress Philippa Eilhart leapt from damask sheets without waking the Comte de Denoyle's wife. The dwarf Yarpen Zigrin and Mahakam the old witcher Vesemir in the mountain stronghold of Kier Moren, the bank clerk Fabio Sachs in the city of Gors Valen, and Jarl Krach and Krait on board the longboat Ringhorn, all awoke more or less abruptly. The sorceress Fringila Vigo came awake in Beauclair Castle, as did the priestess Siodrifer of the temple of the goddess Freya on the island of Hindersval. Daniel Echeverry, Count of Garamon, awoke in the besieged fortress of Maribor, as did Zyvik, Decurion of the Dun Banner in Bangean Fort, and the merchant Dominic Bombastus Uvenagel in the town of Claremont, and many, many others. Few, though, were capable of connecting all those occurrences and phenomena with an actual specific fact, or a specific person. A stroke of luck meant that three such people were spending the night of the autumn equinox under one roof. They were in the temple of the goddess Melitila in Elander. Lich fell, groaned the scribe, Yara, staring into the darkness filling the temple grounds. There must be thousands of them, whole flocks. They're crying over someone's death. Over her death. She's dying. Don't talk nonsense. Triss Merigold spun around, raised a clenched fist, and for a moment looked as though she would shove the boy or strike him in the chest. Do you believe in foolish superstitions? September is coming to an end, and the night jars are gathering before taking flight. It's quite natural. She's dying. No one is dying, screamed the sorceress, paling in fury. No one. Do you understand? Stop talking nonsense. Several young female adepts appeared in the library corridor, aroused by the nocturnal alarm. Their countenances were grave and ashen. Yara. Triss had calmed down. 
She placed the hand on the boy's shoulder and squeezed hard. You're the only man in the temple. We're all watching you, looking for support and succor from you. You must not fear. You must not panic. Master yourself. Do not let us down. Yara took a deep breath, trying to calm the trembling of his hands and lips. It is not fear, he whispered, avoiding the sorceress's gaze. I'm not afraid. I'm troubled. About her. I saw her in a dream. I saw her too. Triss pursed her lips. We had the same dream, you, I, and Neneka. Not a word about it. Blood on her face. So much blood. Be silent, I say. Neneka approaches. The high priestess joined them. She looked weary. She shook her head in answer to Triss's wordless question. Seeing that Yara had opened his mouth, she forestalled him. Nothing, sadly. Almost all the girls awoke when the wild hunt flew over the temple, but none of them had a vision. Not even one as hazy as ours. Go to bed, lad. You cannot help. Back to the dormitory, girls. She rubbed her face and eyes with both hands. Oh, the equinox. This accursed night. Go to bed, Triss. We can do nothing. The sorceress clenched her fists. This helplessness is driving me to insanity. The thought that somewhere she is suffering, bleeding, that she's in peril. If I only knew what to do, damn it. Neneka, high priestess of the temple of Melitola, turned around. Have you tried praying? In the south, far beyond the mountains of Amel, in Ebbing, in the land called Periplut, on the vast marshes crisscrossed by the rivers Velda, Leite, and Aret, in a place 800 miles as the crow flies from the city of Elanda and the temple of Melitola, a nightmare jerked the old hermit Visigotta from sleep. Once awake, Visigotta could not for the life of him recall his dream, but a weird unease prevented him from falling asleep again. It's cold. <sighs> Cold, cold, said Visigotta to himself, as he tramped along a path among the reeds. It's cold, cold. <sighs> Yet another trap was empty. Not a single muskrat. A most unsuccessful night. Visigotta cleaned sludge and duckweed from the trap, muttering curses and sniffing through his frozen nostrils. It's cold, <sighs> he said walking towards the edge of the swamp. And September not yet over. It's but four days after the equinox. Oh, I don't recall such chills at the end of September. Not for as long as I've lived. And I've lived a long time. The next and penultimate trap was also empty. Visigotta didn't even feel like cursing. There's no doubt, he witted on as he walked, that the climate grows colder with every passing year, and now it looks as though the cooling will progress apace. <laughs> the elves predicted that long since, but who believed in elven forecasts? Once again, small wings whirred, and incredibly swift grey shapes flashed by above the old man's head. Once again, the fog over the swamps echoed with the wild, intermittent cheering of the goatsucker nightjars and the rapid slapping of their wings. Visigotta paid no attention to the birds. He was not superstitious, and there were always plenty of lichfowl on the bogs, particularly at dawn. The air was so thick with them that he feared they would collide with him. No, perhaps there weren't always as many as there were today. Perhaps they didn't always call quite so blood-curdlingly. Ah, well, he thought. Latterly, nature has been playing queer pranks, and it's been one oddity after another, each one queerer than the last. He was just removing the last empty trap from the water when he heard the neighing of a horse. The nightjars suddenly all fell silent. 
There were hummocks on the swamps of Periplet, dry raised places with river birch, alder, dogwood and blackthorn growing on them. Most of the hummocks were surrounded so completely by the bogs that it was impossible for a horse or a rider who didn't know the paths to reach them. But the neighing, Visigotta heard it once again, was coming from one of them hillocks. Curiosity got the better of caution. Visigotta was no expert on horses and their breeds, but he was an aesthete and was able to recognize and appreciate beauty. And the black horse he saw framed against the birch trunks, with its coat gleaming like anthracite, was extraordinarily beautiful. It was the sheer quintessence of beauty. It was so beautiful it seemed unreal. But it was real, and quite really caught in a trap, its reins and bridle entangled in the blood-red clinging branches of a dogwood bush. When Visigotta went closer, the horse put its ears back and stamped so hard the ground shuddered, jerking its shapely head and whirling around. Now it was clear it was a mare. There was something else, something that made Visigotta's heart pound frantically and invisible pincers of adrenaline tighten around his throat. Behind the horse, in a shallow hollow, lay a body. Visigotta dropped his sack on the ground and was ashamed of his first thought, which was to turn tail and run. He went closer, exercising caution, because the black mare was stamping her hooves, flattening her ears, baring her teeth on the bit, and just waiting for the opportunity to bite or kick him. The corpse was that of a teenage boy. He was lying face down, with one arm pinned by his trunk, the other extended to one side with its fingers digging into the sand. The boy was wearing a short suede jacket, tight leather breeches, and soft knee-high elven boots with buckles. Visagotta leaned over. And just then, the corpse gave a loud groan. The black mare gave a long, drawn-out neigh and thumped its hooves against the ground. The hermit knelt down and cautiously turned over the injured boy. He involuntarily drew back and hissed at the sight of the ghastly mask of dirt and congealed blood where the boy's face should have been. He delicately picked moss, leaves and sand from the spittle and mucus-covered lips and tried to pull away the matted hair stuck with blood to his cheek. The injured boy moaned softly and tensed up, and began to shake. Visigotta peeled the hair away from the boy's face. A girl, he said aloud, unable to believe what was right in front of him. It's a girl. That day, had someone quietly crept up at dusk to the remote cottage in the midst of the swamp with its sunken, moss-grown thatched roof, had they peered through the slits of the shutters in the weak glow of tallow candles, they would have seen a teenage girl with her head thickly bound in bandages, lying with almost corpse-like motionlessness on a pallet covered in animal skins. They would also have seen an old man with a grey, wedge-shaped beard and long white hair, which fell down onto his shoulders and back from the edge of a broad bald patch that extended from his soiled forehead far beyond his crown. They would have noticed the old man lighting another tallow candle, placing an hourglass on the table, sharpening a quill, and hunching over a leaf of parchment. Seen him ponder and mumble something to himself, keeping a close watch on the girl lying on the pallet. But it would not have been possible. No one could have seen it. The cottage of the hermit Visagotta was well concealed amidst the marshes, in a wilderness permanently shrouded in mist, where no one dared to venture. We shall note down as follows. Visagotta dipped his quill in the ink. Third hour after my intervention. Diagnosis, vulnus incisivum, an open wound, dealt with great force, using an unidentified sharp instrument, probably a curved blade. It encompasses the left part of the face, beginning in the infraorbital region, running across the cheek and extending as far as the parotid plexus and masseter muscle. The wound is deepest, reaching the periosteum in the initial part beneath the orbit on the zygomatic bone. 
probable length of time from when the wound was sustained to when it was first dressed? Ten hours. The quill scratched on the parchment, but the scratching didn't last longer than a few moments, or lines. Visagotta did not find everything he said to himself worthy of being written down. Returning to the dressing of the wound, the old man began again, staring at the flickering and smoking candle flame. Let us write as follows. I did not excise the edges of the cut. I limited myself to the removal of shreds of dead tissue and coagulated blood. I bathed the wound with willow bark extract. I removed dirt and foreign bodies. I put in sutures, uh, hemp sutures. Let it be written that I did not have any other kinds of thread at my disposal. I used a poultice of wolfsbane and applied a formed muslin dressing. A mouse scampered out into the middle of the chamber. Visagotta threw it a piece of bread. The girl on the pallet breathed restlessly and groaned in her sleep. Eighth hour following my intervention. Condition of the patient? Unchanged. Condition of the doctor? <laughs> I mean my condition. Has improved since I have enjoyed a little sleep. I can continue my notes. It behooves me to commit onto these leaves some information about my patient. For posterity. Assuming that posterity reaches these swamps before everything decays and crumbles into dust. Visagotta sighed heavily, dipped his quill, and wiped it on the edge of his inkwell. As far as the patient is concerned, he muttered, let the following be noted down. Age, I would say around sixteen. Tall. Strikingly slim build, but by no means puny. No indication of undernourishment. Musculature and physical construction rather typical for a young elf woman, but no mixed blood traits found. Can't be more than one-eighth elven. A smaller proportion of elven blood may, of course, not leave any traces. Visagotta only now seemed to have realised that he hadn't written a single word on the page. He put his quill to the parchment, but the ink had dried. The old man was not bothered in the slightest. May it be noted, he continued, that the girl has had no children. I emphasise, I refer to old scars. No shortage of fresh wounds on her body. The girl has been beaten. Flogged and by various means, probably at her father's hand. She has probably also been kicked. I also found on her body quite a strange distinguishing mark. Hmm, let's write this down for the good of science. The girl has a red rose tattooed on her loins right by the pubic mound. Visagotta stared at the sharpened quill point before dipping it into the inkwell. This time, though, he did not forget why he had done it. He quickly began to cover the page with even lines of sloping script. He wrote until the quill was dry. She was talking and shouting in befuddlement, he said. Her accent and way of expressing herself, if I pass over frequent interjections in profane criminal cant, are Quite confusing, difficult to place, but I would risk the assertion that they originate rather from the north than the south. Some of the words. Once again, his quill scratched over the parchment, much too briefly to write down everything he had said a short while before, and then he took up his monologue in exactly the place he had left it. Some of the words and names the girl mumbled in her delirium are worth remembering, and investigating. Everything suggests a very, I mean, very extraordinary person has found their way to old Visagotta's cottage. He said nothing for a while and listened. I just hope, he muttered, that old Visagotta's cottage doesn't prove the end of her road. 
Visigotha bent over the parchment and even pressed his quilt to it, but wrote nothing, not a single letter. He threw the quill onto the table. He breathed heavily for a while, muttered angrily, and blew his nose. He looked at the pallet and listened to the sounds coming from it. It must be stated and noted, he said in a weary voice, that things look very ill. All my endeavours may be insufficient, and my exertions in vain. My fears were well founded. The wound is infected. The girl is most worryingly feverish. Three of the four cardinal symptoms of acute inflammation have appeared. Rubor, calor, and tumor can easily be confirmed by eye and touch. When the post-treatment shock passes, the fourth symptom, dolor, will also appear. Let it be writ that almost half a century has passed since I have practised medicine. I feel the years weighing on my memory and the dexterity of my fingers. I have little practical skill, and there is little I can do. I have painfully few resources or medicaments. The only hope lies in the young body's immune mechanisms. Twelfth hour following my intervention. In accordance with expectations came the fourth cardinal symptom of inflammation, dolor. The patient is crying out in pain. The fever and shivers are growing stronger. I have nothing, not a single physic to give her. I have a small quantity of stinkweed elixir, but the girl is too frail to survive its effects. I also have monkshood, but monkshood would surely kill her. Fifteenth hour following my intervention. Dawn. Patient, unconscious. The fever advances rapidly. The shivers intensify. Moreover, powerful spasms of the facial muscles are occurring. If it is tetanus, the girl is done for. Let us hope it is only the facial nerve or the trigeminal nerve, or both of them. The girl would be left disfigured, but she would live. Visigotha glanced at the parchment, on which not a single word was written. On condition, he said hollowly, that she survives the infection. Twentieth hour... Following my intervention, the fever advances. The rubor, calor, tumor, and dolor are reaching, I venture, critical limits. But the girl has no chance of survival, of even reaching those limits. Thus do I write. I, Visagota of Corvo, do not believe in the existence of gods. But were they by any chance to exist, let them take this girl into their care and may they forgive me what I have done, if what I did turns out to be in error. Visigotha put down his quill, rubbed his swollen and itchy eyelids, and pressed a fist against his temple. I have given her a mixture of stinkweed and monk's hood, he said hollowly. The next hours will determine everything. He was not sleeping, only dozing, when a knocking and a pounding, accompanied by a groan, wrenched him from his slumber. It was a groan more of fury than of pain. Outside, the day was dawning. A faint light filtered through the slits in the shutters. The hourglass had run its course long before. As usual, Visigotha had forgotten to turn it over. The oil lamp flickered, and the ruby glow of the hearth dimly lit the corner of the chamber. The old man stood up, and moved away the makeshift screen of blankets which separated the pallet from the rest of the room in order to give the patient peace and quiet. The patient had already picked herself up from the floor where she had fallen a moment earlier 
and was sitting, hunched on the edge of her pallet, trying to scratch her face under the dressing. Visigotta cleared his throat. I uh, asked you not to rise. You are too feeble. If you need anything, call. I'm always at hand. Well, I don't want you to be at hand, she said softly, under her breath, but quite clearly. I need to pee. When he returned to remove the chamber pot, she was lying on her back on the pallet, fingering the dressing attached to her cheek by strips of bandage wrapped around her forehead and neck. When he went over to her again a moment later, she was in the same position. Four days, she asked, looking at the ceiling. Five. Almost a day has passed since our last conversation. You slept the whole day. That is good. You need sleep. I feel better. I'm gladdened to hear it. Let's remove the dressing. I'll help you sit up. Take my hand. The wound was healing well and cleanly. This time, the removal of the bandages passed without the painful tearing of the dressing from the scab. The girl gingerly touched her cheek. She grimaced, but Visigotta knew it wasn't only from the pain. Every time she checked the extent of the disfigurement, she appreciated the gravity of the wound. She made certain, with horror, that what she had touched before had not been a fevered nightmare. Do you have a looking glass? I do not, he lied. She looked at him, totally clear-headed, possibly for the first time. You mean it's that bad? she asked, cautiously running her fingers over the stitches. It's a very long cut, he mumbled, angry at himself that he was making excuses and justifying himself to a girl. Your face is still swollen. In a few days I shall remove the sutures. Until then I shall be applying wolfsbane and extract of willow. I shall no longer bandage your entire head. It's healing nicely, very nicely. She did not reply. She moved her mouth and jaw and wrinkled and contorted her face, testing what the wound permitted and what not. I've made pigeon broth. Will you eat some? I will. But this time, I'll try by myself. It's humiliating to be spoon-fed when I'm not paralyzed. Eating took her a long time. She lifted the wooden spoon to her mouth cautiously, using as much effort as if it weighed two pounds. But she managed without the help of Visigotta, who was observing her with interest. Visigotta was inquisitive and burning with curiosity. He knew that the girl's return to health would lead to conversations which could throw light on the whole mysterious matter. He knew it and couldn't wait for that moment. He had lived too long alone in the wilderness. She finished eating and sank back onto her pillow. For a moment, she gazed lifelessly at the ceiling and then turned her head. The extraordinarily large green eyes, Visigotta realized once again, gave her face an innocently childlike expression, now clashing violently with her hideously disfigured cheek. Visigotta knew those looks. A big-eyed, permanent child, where a physiognomy arousing an instinctive, sympathetic reaction. A perennial girl, even when her twentieth, thirtieth, why, even fortieth birthday, had long ago sunk into oblivion. Yes, Visigotta knew those looks well. His second wife had been like that, and his daughter too. I must flee from here, the girl suddenly said. Urgently, I'm being hunted. You know that, don't you? I do, he nodded. Those were your first words, which, contrary to appearances, were not ravings. To be more precise, they were among the first. First you asked about your horse and your sword, in that order. Once I had assured you that your horse and sword were in good hands, you became suspicious that I was the comrade of a certain Bonhart, and wasn't treating you but inflicting the torture of hope. When, not without difficulty, I put you right, you introduced yourself as Falker and thanked me for saving you. I'm glad. She turned her head away on the pillow, as though wanting to avoid meeting his eyes. I'm glad I didn't forget to thank you. I, I remember that vaguely. 
I didn't know what was reality and what was a dream. I was afraid I hadn't thanked you. My name's not Falker. I learned that, too, although rather accidentally. You were talking in your fever. I'm a runaway, she said, without turning around. A fugitive? It's dangerous to give me shelter. It's dangerous to know what I'm really called. I must get on my horse and flee before they catch up with me. A moment ago, he said kindly, you had difficulty sitting on a chamber pot. I don't really see you mounting a horse, but I assure you, you are safe. No one will track you here. I'm certainly being pursued. They're on my trail, combing the area. Calm down. It rains every day. No one will find your tracks. You are in a wilderness, in a hermitage, in the home of a hermit who has cut himself off from the world, to such an extent that it would also be difficult for the world to find him. If, however you wish it, I can look for a way to send tidings about you to your family or friends. You don't even know who I am. You are a wounded girl, he interrupted running from somebody who does not flinch from injuring girls. Do you wish me to pass on some tidings? There is no one, she replied a moment later, and Visigotha's ear caught a change in her voice. My friends are dead. They were massacred. He made no comment. I... I'm death, she began again, in a strange-sounding voice. Everyone who encounters me dies. Not everyone, he contradicted, scrutinizing her. Not Von Hart, the one whose name you screamed out in the fever, the one you are running from. Your encounter seems to have harmed you rather than him. Did he? Did he cut your face? No. She pursed her lips to stifle something which was either a groan or a curse. My face was cut by Tawny Owl, Stefan Skellen, but Bonhart... Bonhart hurt me much more gravely. More deeply? Did I talk about that in the fever? Calm down. You're weak. You should avoid powerful emotions. My name is Siri. I'll make you a compress of Wolfsbane, Siri. Hold on a, a moment. Give me a looking glass, I told you. Please. He did as she asked, judging that he had to, that he could delay it no longer. He even brought the oil lamp so she could better see what had been done to her face. Well, yes she said in an altered, trembling voice. Well, yes, it's just as I thought. Almost as I thought. He went away, pulling the makeshift screen of blankets after him. She tried hard to sob quietly, so he wouldn't hear. The following day, Visigotta removed half of the stitches. Siri touched her cheek, hissed like a viper, and complained of an intense pain in her ear and heightened sensitivity in her neck near her jaw. Nonetheless, she got up, dressed, and went outside. Visigotta did not protest. He went out with her. He didn't have to help her or hold her up. The girl was healthy and much stronger than he had expected. She only wobbled once outside and held onto the doorframe, why, she said, sucking in lungfuls of air. What a chill. Is it a frost or, or what? Winter already? How long have I been lying here? A, a few weeks? Exactly six days. It's the fifth day of October, but it promises to be a very cold October. The fifth of October? She frowned and hissed in pain. How can it be? Two weeks? What? What two weeks? Never mind, she shrugged. 
Perhaps I've got something wrong. But perhaps I haven't. T tell me, what is it that reeks around here? Pelts. I hunt muskrat, beaver, koipu and otter, and cure their hides. Even hermits have to make a living. Where's my horse? In the barn. The black mare greeted them with a loud neighing, joined by the bleating of Visigotta's goat, which was greatly displeased by having to share its lodgings with another resident. Siri hugged the horse's neck, patted it and stroked its mane. The mare snorted and pawed the straw with a hoof. Where's my saddle? Saddlecloth? Harness? Here? He did not protest, make any comments, nor voice his opinion. He leaned on his stick and said nothing. He did not move when she grunted, trying to lift the saddle. Didn't budge when she staggered beneath the weight and flopped down heavily onto the straw-covered floor with a loud groan. He did not approach her or help her to stand. He watched intently. Very well, she said through clenched teeth, pushing away the mare which was trying to shove its nose down her collar. I get it, but I have to move on from here, damn it. I must. Where would you go? he asked coldly. Still sitting on the straw next to her fallen saddle, she touched her face. As far away as possible? He nodded as though her answer had satisfied him made everything clear and didn't leave any room for speculation. Siri struggled to her feet. She didn't even try to reach down to pick up the saddle or harness. She just checked that there was hay and oats in the manger and began to rub the horse's back and sides with a wisp of straw. Visigotta stood in silence. He didn't have to wait long. The girl staggered against the post supporting the ceiling, now as white as a sheet. Without a word, he handed her his stick. There's nothing wrong with me. It's just... It's just you felt giddy because you're sick and as weak as a kitten. Let's go back. You must lie down. Siri went out again at sunset after sleeping for a good few hours. Visigotta, returning from the river, happened upon her by the bramble hedge. Don't go too far from the cottage, he said curtly. Firstly, you're too weak. I'm feeling better. Secondly, it's dangerous. There is a huge marsh all around us, endless tracts of reeds. You don't know the paths. You might get lost or drown in the bog. And you, she said, pointing at the sack he was dragging, know the paths, of course. And you don't walk that far, so the swamp can't be so huge at all. You tan hides to support yourself, I understand. Kelpie. My mare has oats, but I don't see any fields around here. We ate chicken and groats and bread. Real bread, not flat bread. You couldn't have got the bread from a trapper. So there's a village nearby. Unerringly deduced, he calmly agreed. Indeed, I get provisions from the nearest village. The nearest, which doesn't mean it's near. It lies on the edge of the swamp. The swamp adjoins the river. I exchange pelts for food, which they bring me by boat. Bread, kasha, flour, salt, cheese. Sometimes a coney or a hen. Occasionally news. No question was forthcoming, so he continued. A band of horsemen on the hunt were in the village twice. The first time they warned people not to hide you. They threatened the peasants with fire and sword if you were seized in the village. The second time, they promised a reward for finding your corpse. Your pursuers are convinced that you're lying dead in the forests, in a gorge or a ravine. They won't rest, she muttered, until they find a body. They have to have proof that I'm dead. They won't give up without that proof. They'll root around everywhere until they finally end up here. It really matters to them, he observed. I'd say it matters uncommonly to them. She pursed her lips. Don't be afraid. I'll leave before they find me here. I won't put you at risk. Don't be afraid. Why do you think I'm afraid? He shrugged. Is there a reason to be afraid? No one will find this place. No one will track you here. If, however, 
you stick your nose out of the reeds, you'll fall straight into your pursuer's hands. In other words, she tossed her head proudly, I have to stay here. Is that what you mean? You aren't a prisoner. You can leave when you want. More precisely, whenever you're able to. But you can stay with me and wait. Your pursuers will eventually become disheartened. They always get disheartened, sooner or later. Always. You can believe me. I know what I'm saying. Her green eyes flashed when she looked at him. And anyway, he said quickly, shrugging and avoiding her gaze, you'll do as you please. I repeat, I'm not holding you a prisoner here. I don't think I'll leave today, she said. I'm too weak, and the sun will soon be setting. And anyway, I don't know the paths. So let's go back to the cottage. I'm frozen. You said I was lying here for six days. Is that true? Why would I lie? Well, don't take on. I'm trying to count the days. I ran away. I was wounded on the day of the equinox, the 23rd of September, if you prefer to count according to the elves, the last day of Lunasar. That's impossible. Why would I lie? She screamed, and then groaned, grabbing her face. Visigotta looked calmly at her. I don't know why, he said coldly, but I was once a doctor, Siri. Long ago, and I'm still capable of distinguishing between a wound inflicted ten hours ago and one inflicted four days ago. I found you on the 27th of September, so you were wounded on the 26th, the third day of Valen, if you prefer to count according to the elves, three days after the equinox. I was wounded on the equinox itself. That's impossible, Siri. You must have got the dates wrong. I most certainly haven't. You've got some antiquated hermit calendar here. Have it your way. Does the date carry such importance? No, it doesn't. Visigotta removed the last stitches three days later. He had every reason to be pleased and proud of his work. The line was even and clean. There was no need to fear a tattoo of dirt embedded in the wound. However, the satisfaction of the surgeon was spoiled by the sight of Siri, in sombre silence, contemplating the scar in the looking-glass held at various angles and trying vainly to cover it by pulling her hair over her cheek. The scar disfigured her. It was simply a fact. Nothing could be done. Pretending that it was different could not help in any way. Still scarlet, bulging like a cord, surrounded by needle punctures and marked with the scars from the stitches, the scar looked truly horrifying. There was a chance of it undergoing gradual or even rapid improvement. Visigotta knew, though, that there was no chance of the disfiguring scar vanishing. Siri was feeling much better, and to Visigotta's astonishment and pleasure, did not talk about leaving at all. She led her black mare, Kelpie, out of the barn. Visigotta knew that in the north, the name Kelpie was borne by a water spirit, a dangerous sea monster, according to superstition, able to assume the form of a splendid steed, dolphin, or even a comely woman, although in reality it always looked like a heap of seaweed. Siri saddled her mare and trotted around the yard and cottage, after which Kelpie went back to the barn to keep the goat company, while Siri went to the cottage to keep Visigotta company. She even helped him, probably out of boredom, as he worked with the pelts. While he was segregating the koipu according to their size and colouring, she divided the muskrats up into backs and bellies, slitting the skins along slats inserted into them. Her fingers were exceptionally nimble. While they worked, they had quite a strange conversation. You don't know who I am. You can't even imagine who I am. She repeated that banal statement several times and slightly annoyed him with it. Of course, he did not betray his annoyance. He wouldn't betray his feelings before such a chit. Uh, no. He couldn't allow that, nor could he betray the curiosity that was consuming him. Groundless curiosity and truth, for he could have guessed who she was without any difficulty. Gangs of youths hadn't been rare in Visigotta's younger days either. 
nor could the years that had passed eliminate the magnetic power with which gangs lured whelps hungry for adventure and thrills, very often to their death. Whelps flaunting scars on their faces could count their luck. Torture, the noose, the hook or the stake awaited the less fortunate of them. Since Visigotha's younger days, only one thing had changed, growing emancipation. Not only teenage boys, but also reckless girls, preferring a horse, a sword and adventures to lace-making, the spinning wheel and waiting for the matchmakers. Visigotha did not say all that straight out. He said it in a roundabout way, but so that she knew that he knew. To make her aware that if someone in the cottage was an enigma, it was certainly not her, a young thug from a band of underage thugs who had miraculously escaped a manhunt, a disfigured teenage girl trying to cloak herself in an aura of mystery. You don't know who I am. But don't worry, I'll be leaving shortly. I won't put you at risk. Risa Gotta had had enough. I'm not at risk, he said dryly. For what peril would there be? Even if a search party were to show up here, which I doubt, what ill could befall me? Giving help to fugitive criminals is punishable, but not for a hermit, since a hermit is unaware of worldly matters. It is my privilege to give asylum to anyone who comes to my retreat. You said it correctly. I don't know who you are. How am I, a hermit, to know who you are, what mischief you've been up to, and why the law is pursuing you, and which law? For I don't even know what law applies in this region, or what and whose jurisdiction I live in. And it does not concern me. I am a hermit. He had mentioned the hermit's life a few too many times. He sensed it, but he did not quit. Her furious green eyes pricked him like spurs. I am a penniless anchorite, dead to the world and its concerns. I am a simple, uneducated man, unaware of worldly matters. That was an exaggeration. Like hell you are, she yelled, hurling a pelt and the knife to the floor. Do you take me for a fool? I'm not a fool. Be sure of that. A hermit. A penniless anchorite. I had a look around when you weren't here. I looked in the corner, behind that rather filthy curtain. How did learned books get on those shelves, eh? My simple, ignorant man. Visa Gotta threw a koipu skin down on the pile. A tax collector once lived here, he said lightheartedly. They are cadasters and bookkeeping ledgers. You're lying. Siri grimaced, massaging her scar. You're lying through your teeth. He did not reply, pretending to be assessing the hue of another hide. Perhaps you think, the girl began again, that if you have a white beard, wrinkles, and you've lived a hundred years, you can easily hoodwink a naive young maid, eh? Let me tell you, maybe you would have tricked just any lass. But I'm not just any lass. He raised his eyebrows in a wordless but provocative question. He didn't have to wait long. I, my dear hermit, have studied in places where there were plenty of books, including the same titles you have on your shelves. I know plenty of them. Visagotta raised his eyebrows even higher. She looked him straight in the eye. This filthy sloven, this ragged orphan, she drawled, is saying strange things. Must be a thief or bandit discovered in the bushes with her mush cut up. And yet you ought to know, Hermit, that I have read the history of Roderick de November. I've looked through the Materia Medica several times. I know the Hiberius you have on your shelf. I also know what the gules cross Armin blazon on the spines of those books means. It means the book was published by the University of Oxenfurt. She broke off still observing him intently. Visigotta was silent, trying not to let his face betray anything. Which is why I think, she said, making her habitual sharp, haughty toss of head, that you aren't a simple hermit at all, that you didn't die for the world either, but fled from it. And you're hiding here in the wilderness, disguised by appearances and a boundless reed bed. If that is so... Visigotta smiled. Then our fates really have become uncannily entwined, my well-read young lady. This destiny has flung us together in a highly mysterious way. After all, you're also in hiding. You too, Siri, are skillfully spinning a veil of deception around yourself. 
I am, however, an old man, full of suspicion and embittered senile mistrust. Mistrust regarding me? Regarding the world, Siri. A world in which a deceptive appearance dons the mask of truth to pull the wool over the eyes of another truth, a false one, incidentally, which also tries to deceive. A world in which the arms of the University of Oxenfurt are painted on the doors of bordellos. A world in which wounded thugs pass themselves off as worldly learned and perhaps nobly born maidens, intellectuals and polymaths, reading Roderick de November and familiar with the crest of the academy. In spite of all appearances, in spite of the fact they carry another mark, a bandit's tattoo, a red rose tattooed on the groin. Indeed, you were right. She bit her lip, and her face turned a crimson so intense that the line of the scar seemed black. You are an embittered old man, and a nosy old prick. On my shelf behind the curtain, he nodded toward it, is a copy of Enog Mab Moch, a collection of elven fairy tales and rhyming parables. There is a story there of a venerable old raven and a youthful swallow, very fitting to our situation and conversation. Because I am a polymath like you, Siri, let me quote an appropriate excerpt. The raven, as you certainly recall, accuses the swallow of flightiness and unseemly frivolity. In herben dich e noch zireel, ach ach ke voilte velo el, zireel? He broke off, rested his elbows on the table, and his chin on his interlocked fingers. Siri jerked her head, straightened up, and looked at him defiantly, and completed the verse. Zireil veloe, que es esanach, mabo hen herben vian ich quirch quirch. The embittered and mistrustful old man... Visagotta said a moment later, without changing his position, apologizes to the young polymath. The venerable old raven, sensing everywhere deceit and trickery, asks for forgiveness of the swallow, whose only crime is to be young and full of life. And very pretty. Now you're talking drivel, she said crossly, involuntarily covering the scar on her cheek. You can forget compliments like that, they won't correct those wonky stitches you tacked my skin with. Don't think either that you'll gain my trust by apologising. I still don't know who you really are, why you lied to me about those dates and days, or why you looked between my legs when I'd been wounded in the face, and if looking was where it finished. This time she made him lose his temper. What are you saying, you brat? he roared. I could be your father. Grandfather, she corrected him coldly or even great-grandfather. But you aren't. I don't know who you are. But you are certainly not who you pretend to be. I am he who found you on the bog, almost frozen to the moss, with a black crust instead of a face, unconscious and filthy. I am he who took you home, although I didn't know who you were, and was within my rights to expect the worst, who bandaged you and put you to bed, tended to you when you were expiring with fever. Nursed you, washed you, thoroughly, in the tattoo region as well. She blushed again, but had no intention of changing her insolent, defiant expression. In this world, she growled, deceptive appearances occasionally feign the truth. You said it yourself. I also know the world a little, if you can imagine it. You rescued me, tended my wounds, nursed me. Thank you for that. I'm grateful for your... Your kindness, although I know that there is no such thing as kindness without without a calculation or the hope of some profit, he finished with a smile. Yes, yes, I know, I'm a worldly man. Perhaps I know the world as well as you do, Siri. Wounded girls, of course, are robbed of everything that has any value. If they're unconscious or too weak to defend themselves, free reign is normally given to one's urges and lust, often in immoral and unnatural ways. Isn't that so? Nothing is as it seems, answered Siri, her cheeks reddening once more. How true a statement, he said, 
throwing another pelt on one of the piles. And how mercilessly does it lead us to the conclusion that we, Siri, know nothing about each other. We know only appearances, and appearances are deceptive. He waited a while, but Siri wasn't hurrying to say anything. Although both of us have managed to carry out something of a provisional inquisition, we still know nothing about each other. I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. This time, he waited with calculation. She looked at him, and in her eyes, there was the hint of the question he was expecting. Something strange flashed in her eyes when she posed the question. Who shall begin? Had someone crept up after nightfall to the cottage with the sunken, moss-grown thatched roof, had peered inside, in the firelight and glow of the hearth, they would have seen a grey-bearded old man hunched over a pile of pelts. They would have seen an ashen-haired girl with a hideous scar on her cheek, a scar which in no way suited her huge, green, childlike eyes. But no one could have seen that, for the cottage stood among reeds in a swamp where no one dared to venture. My name is Visogotta of Corvo. I was once a doctor, a surgeon. I was an alchemist. I was a scholar, a historian, a philosopher, and an ethicist. I was a professor at the Academy of Oxenfurt. I had to flee after publishing a paper which was deemed godless. At that time, fifty years ago, it was punishable by death. I had to emigrate. My wife did not want to emigrate, so she left me, and I only ceased my flight when I reached the far south in the Nilfgaardian Empire. Later, I finally became a lecturer in ethics at the Imperial Academy in Castelgrappian, a position I held for almost ten years. But I had to run from there, too, after the publication of another treatise. Incidentally, the work dealt with totalitarian power and the criminal character of imperialist wars, but officially I and my work were accused of metaphysical mysticism and clerical schism. It was ruled I had been goaded into action by the expansive and revisionist groups of priests who were actually governing the kingdoms of the Nordlings. Quite amusing in the light of my death sentence for atheism twenty years previously. Indeed, it so happened that the expansive priests in the north had long since been forgotten by their people, but that had not been acknowledged in Nilfgaard. Combining mysticism and superstition with politics was a severely punishable offence. Today, looking back down the years, I think that had I humbled myself and shown remorse, perhaps the scandal would have blown over and the emperor limited himself to disfavour without using extreme measures. But I was bitter. I considered some of my arguments timeless, superior to this or that dominion or politics. I felt wronged, unjustly wronged, tyrannously wronged. So I made active contact with the dissidents secretly fighting the tyrant, before I knew it, I was in a dungeon with those dissidents, and some of them, when they were shown the torture instruments, pointed me out as the movement's chief ideologue. The emperor availed himself of his privilege to issue a pardon, though I was sentenced to exile, under the threat of immediate execution should I return to imperial territories. Thus, I took offence against the entire world against kingdoms, empires, and universities, against dissidents, civil servants, and lawyers, against my colleagues and friends who stopped being such at the touch of a magic wand, against my second wife who, like my first, thought her husband's difficulties a suitable reason for a divorce, against my children who disowned me. I became a hermit here in Ebbing, in the Periplot Marshes, I inherited a dwelling from an anchorite I had once known. Unfortunately, Nilfgaard annexed Ebbing, and all of a sudden I found myself in the Empire again. Now I have neither the strength nor the inclination to continue wandering, so I must hide. Imperial sentences do not lapse, 
even in a situation when the emperor who issued it died long ago, and the present emperor has no cause to remember the previous one fondly or share his views. The death sentence remains in force. That is the law and custom in Nilfgaard. Sentences for high treason do not expire, and neither are they subject to the amnesties that every emperor proclaims after his coronation. After the accession to the throne of a new emperor, everybody who was sentenced by his predecessor is given an amnesty, except those guilty of high treason. It is unimportant who reigns in Nilfgaard. If news gets out that I'm alive and am breaking my sentence of exile, dwelling in imperial territory, my head is for the noose. So, as you see, Siri, we find ourselves in wholly similar situation. What is ethics? I knew, but I've forgotten. The study of morality, of the precepts of conduct, of being decorous, noble, decent and honest, of the heights of goodness to which probity and morality carry up the human spirit, and of the chasms of evil into which malice and immorality are flung. The heights of goodness, she snorted. Probity, morality. Don't make me laugh, or the scar on my face will burst. You were lucky that you weren't hunted, that they didn't send bounty hunters after you. People like... Bonhart. You'd see what chasms of evil are. Ethics. Your ethics are worth shit, or Visigotter of Corvo. It isn't the evil and indecent who are flung down into the depths. No. Oh, no. The evil and decisive fling down those who are moral, honest and noble but maladroit, hesitant, and full of scruples. Thanks for the lesson, he sneered. In truth, though one may have lived a century, it is never too late to learn something new. Indeed, it is always worth listening to mature, worldly, and experienced people. Mock! Go ahead and mock! She tossed her head. While you still can. For now it's my turn. Now... I shall entertain you with a tale. I'll tell you what happened to me. And when I'm done, we'll see if you still feel like mocking me. Had someone crept up after nightfall to the cottage with the sunken, moss-grown thatched roof? Had they peered inside, in the dimly lit interior, they would have seen a grey-bearded old man listening raptly to a tale told by an ashen-haired girl sitting on a log by the fireplace. They would have noticed that the girl was speaking slowly, as though having difficulty finding the words, that she was nervously rubbing her cheek, which was disfigured by a hideous scar, and that she was interweaving her story with long silences. A tale about the lessons she had received, of which all, to the last one, turned out to be false and misleading. About the promises made to her which were not kept, a story about how the destiny she'd been ordered to believe in betrayed her disgracefully and deprived her of her inheritance. About how each time she began to believe in her destiny, she was made to suffer misery, pain, injustice and humiliation. About how those she trusted and loved betrayed her, did not come to her aid when she was afflicted, when she was menaced by dishonour, agony and death. A tale about the ideals to which she was instructed to remain loyal and which, disappointed, betrayed and abandoned her when she needed them, proving of what little value they were. About how she finally found help, friendship and love with those among whom she should have sought neither help nor friendship, not to mention love. But no one could have seen that, much less heard it for the cottage with the sunken, moss-grown thatched roof was well hidden among the fog, in a swamp where no one dared venture. Chapter Two A west wind brought a storm that night. The purple-black sky burst along the line of lightning, exploding in a long, drawn-out clatter of thunder. The sudden rain struck the dust of the road with drops as viscous as oil, roared on the roofs, smeared the dirt on the skins covering the windows. But the powerful wind quickly chased off the downpour, drove the storm somewhere far, far away beyond the horizon, which was blazing with lightning. 
And then dogs began to bark. Hooves thudded and weapons clanged. A wild howling and whistling made the hair stand up on the heads of the peasants who had woken and now sprang up in panic, barring their doors and shutters. Hands, wet with sweat, tightened on the hafts of axes and the handles of pitchforks. Clenched them tightly, but helplessly. Terror sped through the village. Were they the hunted or the hunters? Insane and cruel from ferocity or fear. Will they gallop through without stopping, or will the night soon be lit up by the glare of blazing thatch? Quiet, quiet, children. Mama, are they demons? Is it the wild hunt? Phantoms from hell? Mama, mama, quiet, quiet, children. They are not demons, not devils. Worse than that, they are people. The dogs barked, the gale blew, horses neighed, horseshoes thudded. The gang raced through the village and the night. Hotspurn rode up onto the hillock, reined in and turned his horse around. He was prudent and cautious and did not like taking risks, particularly when vigilance cost nothing. He didn't hurry to ride down to the postal station by the small river. He preferred to have a good look first. There were no horses or horse-drawn vehicles outside the station, only a single small wagon harnessed with a pair of mules. There was some writing on the tarpaulin, which Hotspurn could not make out at a distance, but it did not look dangerous. Hotspurn was capable of sensing danger. He was a professional. He rode down to the bank, which was covered in bushes and osiers, spurred his horse decisively into the river, crossed at a gallop among gouts of water, many splashing him above his saddle. Some ducks swimming by the bank flew away with a loud quacking. Hotspurn urged his horse on and rode into the station courtyard through the open fence. Now he could read the writing on the tarpaulin, proclaiming Master Almavera, tattoo artist. Each word was painted in a different colour and began with an excessively large, decoratively illuminated letter. And on the wagon's box, above the right front wheel, was a small split arrow rendered in purple paint. Dismount, he heard behind him. On the ground and fast, hands away from your hilt. They approached and surrounded him noiselessly. Asa from the right in a silver-studded black leather jacket. Falker from the left in a short green suede jerkin and berry with feathers. Hotspurn removed his hood and pulled the scarf from his face. Ah, Asa lowered his sword. It's you, Hotspurn. I would have recognized you but for that black horse. What a gorgeous little mare, said Falka with delight, sliding her berry over one ear. Black and gleaming like coal, not a light hair on her, and so well shaped. Oh, she's a beauty. Aye, came up for less than five score florins, smiled Hotspurn. Where's Gisela? Inside? Asa nodded. Falka, looking at the mare as though bewitched, patted her on the neck. When she ran through the water said Falka, raising her huge green eyes up to Hotspurn. She looked like a veritable Kelpie. Had she emerged from the sea and not a river, I would have believed she was a real one. Have you seen a real Kelpie, Miss Falka? Only in a painting. The girl suddenly grew serious. But that would be a long story. Come inside. Gazela's waiting. There was a table by the window which let in a little light. Missal was half lying on the table, resting on her elbows, almost naked from the waist down, with nothing on but a pair of black stockings. Between her shamelessly spread legs knelt a skinny, long-haired individual in a brownish-grey smock. It could not have been anyone but Master Almavera, tattoo artist, busy tattooing a colourful picture on Missal's thigh. Come closer, Hotspurn, invited Gisela, drawing a stool away from the next table, where he was sitting with Iskra, Kaylee and Reef. The latter two, like Asa, were also dressed in black calfskin covered in buckles, studs, chains, and other elaborate silver accessories. Some craftsman must have made a fortune on them, thought Hotspurn. The rats, when the whim to dress up seized them, would pay tailors, shoemakers, and leather workers handsomely. Naturally, neither did they miss any opportunity to simply wrest any clothing or jewellery that took their fancy from anyone they assailed. I see you found our message in the ruins of the old station. Gisela said, stretching. Ah, what am I saying? You wouldn't be here otherwise, would you? 
He wrote it pretty quickly, I must say. Because the mere is gorgeous, Falca interjected. I'll bet she's fleet, too. I found your message. Hotspurn did not take his eye off Gisela. What about mine? Did it reach you? It did, stammered the leader of the rats. But, well, to put it briefly, there wasn't time. And then we got drunk and were forced to rest a little. And later another path came up. Damned pops, thought Hotspurn. To put it briefly, you didn't do the job. Well, no. Forgive me, Hotspurn. Couldn't be done. But next time, huh? Without fail? Without fail, repeated Cayley with emphasis, though no one had asked him to repeat it. Damned irresponsible pups. Got drunk, and then another path came up. To a tailor to get some fancy costumes, I'll be bound. Want a drink? No, thank you. Fancy some of this? Gisela pointed at a small decorative lacquer casket among some demijohns and beakers. Now Hotspur knew why a strange light was flashing in the rat's eyes, why their movements were so nervous and quick. First rate powder, Gisela assured him. When you take a pinch. No, thank you. Hotspurn glanced knowingly at a red stain and a dwindling bloody streak on the sawdust of the chamber, clearly indicating which way a body had been dragged. Gisela noticed the look. One of the lackeys thought he'd play the hero, he snorted. So, Iskra had to scold him. Iskra laughed throatily. She was clearly very aroused by the narcotic. I scolded him so much, he choked on his blood, she crowed. And the others were cowed at once. That's what you call terror. She was dripping in jewels as usual, and even had a diamond stud in her nose. She was not wearing leather, but a short cherry-red jacket with a fine brocade pattern. Her look was established enough to be all the rage among the gilded youth of Thurn. Like the silk scarf wrapped around Gisela's head, Hotspurn had even heard of girls asking for missile haircuts. That's what you call terror, he repeated pensively still looking at the patch of blood on the floor. What about the station keeper, his wife and son? No, no, Gisela scowled. Think we did for all of them? Not at all. We locked him in the pantry for a while. Now the station, as you see, is ours. Cayley swilled wine around his mouth, then spat it out on the floor. He took a small quantity of fish tech from the casket with a tiny spoon, meticulously sprinkled it on the spit-moistened tip of his index finger and rubbed the narcotic into his gums. He handed the casket to Falker, who repeated the ritual and passed the fish tech to Reef. The Nilfgaardian turned it down, busy looking at a catalogue of colourful tattoos and handed the box to Iskra. The she-elf passed it to Gisela without taking any. Terror, she growled, narrowing her flashing eyes and sniffing. We have the station in the grip of terror. Emperor Emir holds the entire world this way, and we only this hovel. But the principle's the same. Ow, damn it, yelled Missile from the table. Be careful what you prick. Do that one more time and I'll prick you right through. The rats, apart from Folker and Gisela, roared with laughter. If you want to be beautiful, you have to suffer, Iskra called. Pricker, master, pricker, Cayley added. She's hardened between the legs. Folker swore copiously and threw a beaker at him. Cayley ducked and the rats roared with laughter again. So, Hotspurn decided to put an end to the gaiety. You hold the station in the grip of terror. But what for, other than the satisfaction you derive from terrorizing station keepers' families? We, oui, Gisela answered rubbing fish tech into his gums, are lying in wait. Should someone stop to change horses or rest, they'll be stripped clean. It's more comfortable here than on a crossroads or in the thicket by the highway. But, as Iskra has just said, the principle's the same. But today, since daybreak, only this one's fallen into our grasp, Reef interjected, pointing at Master Almavera, his head almost hidden between missiles' parted thighs. A pauper, like every artist, had nothing to rob, so we're robbing him of his art. Take a look at how ingeniously he draws. He bared his forearm and displayed a bloody tattoo, a naked woman who wiggled her buttocks when he clenched his fist. Cayley also showed off, 
A green snake with an open maw and a scarlet forked tongue writhed around his arm above a spiked bracelet. A tasteful piece, Hotspurn said indifferently, and helpful when corpses are being identified. However, you failed with the robbery, my dear rats. You'll have to pay the artist for his skill. There was no time to warn you. For seven days from the 1st of September, the sign has been a purple split arrow. He has one painted on his wagon. Reef swore under his breath, and Cayley laughed. Gisela waved a hand indifferently. Too bad. If needs must, we'll pay him for his needles and die. A purple arrow, say you? We'll remember. If someone rides up with the sign of the arrow between now and tomorrow, he won't be harmed. You plan to stay here till tomorrow? Hotspurn said with slightly exaggerated astonishment. That's imprudent, rats. It's risky and dangerous. You what? Risky and dangerous. Gisela shrugged. Iskra snorted and cleared her nose onto the floor. Reef, Cayley and Falker looked at Hotspurn as though he'd just declared that the sun had fallen into the river and must be fished out before the crayfish pinched it. Hotspurn understood that he had merely appealed to the reckless pup's good sense, of which they had little, that he had alerted these braggarts to risk and danger. Braggarts, all reckless bravado, for whom those concepts were utterly alien. They're coming for you, rats. What of it? Hotspurn sighed. Missile, without having taken the trouble to dress, came over to them and interrupted the discussion. She placed a foot on the bench and, twisting her hips, demonstrated to all and sundry the work of Master Almavera. A crimson rose on a green stem, with two leaves on her inner thigh, right by her groin. Well, she asked, hands on hips. Her bracelets, which almost reached her elbows, flashed brilliantly. What do you say? Exquisite, Cayley snorted, brushing his hair aside. Hotspurn had noticed that the rat had rings in his ears. There was no doubt that similar earrings, like studded leather or silk scarves, would soon be the latest thing among the gilded youth in Thurn and the whole of Jeso. Your turn, Falker, said Missile. What will you have? Falker touched her friend's thigh, leaned over and examined the tattoo from very close. Missile ruffled Falker's ashen grey hair tenderly. Falker giggled, and without further ado, began to undress. I want the same rose, she said, in the same place as you, darling. How many mice you have here, Visigotta? Siri said, breaking off her story and looking down at the floor, where a veritable mouse circus was taking place in the circle of light thrown by the oil lamp. One could only imagine what was happening in the gloom beyond the light. A cat would come in useful, or better still, too. Uh, the rodents, <laughs> the hermit coughed, are coming inside because winter is drawing nigh. And I had a cat, but it wandered off somewhere, the good-for-nothing, and never came back. It was probably taken by a fox or Martin. You never saw that cat, Siri. If something took it, it would have had to be a dragon, nothing smaller. Was he that ferocious? Oh, that's a pity. He wouldn't have let these mice scamper all over my bed. Pity. Yes, it is a pity. But I think he'll return. Cats always do. I'll build up the fire. It's cold. It is. The nights are perishingly cold now, and it's not even halfway through October yet. Go on, Siri. For a while, Siri sat motionless, staring into the fireplace. The fire sprang to life with the new wood, crackled, roared, and threw golden light and flickering shadows onto the girl's scarred face. Go on. Master Almavera pricked, and Siri felt the tears tingling in the corners of her eyes. Although she had prudently intoxicated herself before the operation with wine and white powder, the pain was almost unbearable. She clenched her teeth. She did not groan, naturally, but pretended not to pay attention to the needle and to scorn the pain. She tried blithely to take part in the conversation the rats were having with Hotspurn, an individual who wished to be thought of as a merchant, but who, apart from the fact that he lived off merchants, had nothing in common with trade. Dark clouds have gathered above your heads, Hotspurn said, his dark eyes sweeping over the rats' faces. Isn't it bad enough that the prefect of Amarillo is hunting you? That the Van Hagens are pursuing you? 
that the Baron of Cassidy, him, Gisela grimaced. I can understand the prefect and the Van Hagens, but what has that Cassidy got against us? The wolf is dressed in sheep's clothing, Hotspurn said, smiling, and pitifully bleats, Ba ba! no one likes me, no one understands me. Wherever I appear, they throw stones at me. They shout, Hello! Why, oh why, why such unfairness and injustice? The daughter of the Baron of Cassidy, my dear rats, after her adventure by the River Wagtail, grows ever weaker and feverish. Ah, Isela recalled. That carriage with those four spotted horses? That maiden? That one. Now, as I said, she ails, wakes up in the night screaming, recalling Mr. Cayley, but especially Miss Falker and the brooch, a keepsake of her departed mamma, which Miss Falker wrested from her dress. Various words are repeated all the while. It wasn't like that at all, Siri yelled from the table able to react to the pain by shouting. We showed the Baron's daughter contempt and disrespect by letting her get away with it. The wench should have been ravaged. Indeed. Siri sensed Hotspurn's gaze on her naked thighs. Verily, a great dishonour not to have ravaged her. No wonder, then, that the offended Cassidy has assembled an armed squad and offered a reward. He has sworn publicly that you will all hang head down from the corbels on the walls of his castle. He also swore that, for the brooch wrenched from his daughter, he will flay Miss Falker. Alive. Siri swore, and the rats roared in wild laughter. Iskra sneezed and covered herself in snot. The fish tech was irritating her mucous membranes. We disdain our pursuers, she declared, wiping her nose, mouth, chin, and the table. The prefect, the baron, the Van Hagens. They can hunt us, but they won't catch us. We are the rats. We zigzagged back and forth on the far side of the Velda, and now those dolts are at sixes and sevens going the wrong way along a cold trail. They will have gone too far to turn around by the time they catch on. Let them turn around, Asa said hatedly. He had returned some time before from sentry duty. No one had replaced him, and no one seemed about to. We'll slaughter them, and that's that. Exactly, Siri screamed from the table having already forgotten how they had fled from their pursuers through the villages beside the Velda and how terrified she had been. Very well. Gisela slammed his open palm down on the table, abruptly putting an end to the noisy chatter. Speak, Hotspurn, for I can see you wish to tell us something else, something of greater note than the prefect, the Van Hagens, the Baron of Cassidy and his sensitive daughter. Barnhart is on your trail. A very long silence fell. Even Master Almavera stopped working for a moment. Bonhart, Gisela repeated, in a slow, drawling voice. That grey-haired old blackguard. We must have really annoyed someone. Someone wealthy, Miss Ladded. Not everyone can afford Bonhart. Siri was about to ask who this Bonhart was, but Asa and Reef, speaking almost at once in unison, were quicker. He's a bounty hunter, Gisela explained grimly. Years ago, he took the king's shilling, they say. Then he was a wandering merchant and finally began killing people for the bounty. He's a horseman like no other. They say, Cayley said quite carelessly, that if you wanted to bury everyone... Bonnot has put to the sword in one graveyard. It would have to measure a good half acre. Missile poured a pinch of the white powder into the dimple between her thumb and forefinger and sniffed it up vigorously. Bonnot broke up Big Lothar's gang, she said. He carved him up and his brother, the one they called Machomarek. Stabbed him in the back, they say, Cayley threw in. He killed Valdez too, Gisela added. And when Valdez perished, his gang fell apart. One of the better ones. A solid, hard, firm. Good scrappers. I thought about joining them at one time, before we teamed up. It's all true, Hotspurn said. There's never been a gang like Valdez's, and there never will be again. A merry air is sung about how they fought their way out of a trap at Sarda. Aye, bold they were. Aye, daredevils they were. Few are their equal. 
The rats suddenly fell silent and fixed their eyes on him, blazing and furious. The six of us, Cayley drawled after a brief silence, once broke through a troop of Nilfgaardian horse. We sprang Cayley from the Nithiers, Asa snapped. Few are our equal, Reef hissed. That is so, Hotspurn. Gisela threw out his chest. The rats are second to no other gang, not even Valdez's mob. Daredevils, you say? Well, I'll tell you something about she-devils. Iskra, Missile and Folker, the very three sitting here before you, rode in broad daylight down the high street in Druich. And when they realised that the Van Hagens were in the tavern, they galloped right through it, right through, I tell you. They rode in through the front and out into the courtyard, and the Van Hagens were left standing open-mouthed over broken beer mugs and spilled beer. Will you say that wasn't dashing? He won't, Missile cut in, before Hotspurn could reply, smiling nastily. He won't, because he knows who the rats are, and his guild knows too. Master Almavera had finished the tattoo. Siri thanked him with a haughty expression, dressed and sat down with the company. She snorted, feeling the strange, appraising and seemingly mocking gaze of Hotspurn on her. She glowered at him, ostentatiously cuddling up to Missile. She had already learned that such behaviour discomforted and cooled the zeal of gentlemen with flirtation in mind. In the case of Hotspurn, she acted with a little more exaggeration, for the pretend merchant was not so intrusive in that way. Hotspurn was an enigma to Siri. She had only seen him once before, and Missile had told her the rest. Hotspurn and Gisela, she had explained, knew each other and had been comrades for ages and had agreed signals, passwords and meeting places. During those rendezvous, Hotspurn passed on information and then they travelled to the road indicated and robbed the indicated merchant, convoy or caravan. Sometimes they killed a specific person. There was always also an agreed sign. They were not allowed to attack merchants with that sign on their wagons. At first, Siri had been astonished and slightly disappointed. She looked up to Gisela and considered the rats a model of freedom and independence. She loved their freedom, their contempt for everything and everybody. And now they unexpectedly had to carry out contracts, like hired thugs they were being told who to beat up. But that was not all. Someone was ordering them to beat someone up, and they were sheepishly complying. It's quid pro quo, Missile had shrugged when Siri bombarded her with questions. Hotspurn gives us orders, but also information, thanks to which we survive. Freedom and contempt have their limits. Anyway, it's always like that. You're always somebody's tool. Such is life, little falcon. Siri was surprised and disappointed, but she got over it quickly. She was learning. She had also learned not to be too surprised or to expect too much, for then the disappointment was less acute. I, my dear rats, Hotspurn said in the meantime, might have a remedy for your difficulties, for the Nissiers, barons, prefects, and even Bonhart. Yes, yes, for even though the noose is tightening around your necks, I might have a way for you to slip out of it. Iskra snorted, Reef cackled, but Gisela silenced them with a gesture, allowing Hotspurn to continue. The word is out, the merchant said a moment later, that an amnesty will be proclaimed any day now, that even if a sentence is hanging over someone, why, even if the noose is hanging over them, it will be waived if they simply present themselves to the authorities and confess their guilt. That applies to you too. Bollocks, Cayley cried, eyes watering a little, because he had just inhaled a pinch of fish tech. It's an Ilfgaardian trick, a ruse. We old war horses won't be taken in like that. Hold hard, Gisela halted him. Don't be hasty, Cayley. Hotspurn, as we know, doesn't usually dissemble nor break his word. He usually knows what he's saying and why. So he surely knows and will tell us where this sudden Nilfgaardian generosity has come from. Emperor Emir, Hotspurn said calmly, is taking a wife. We shall soon have an empress in Nilfgaard, which is why they're to proclaim an amnesty. The emperor is reportedly mighty content, so he wishes contentment on others too. I don't give a shit about imperial contentment, Missile announced haughtily, and I won't be availing myself of the amnesty, because that Nilfgaardian kindness smells like fresh shavings, 
as though someone's been sharpening a stake. <laughs> Hotspurn shrugged. I doubt that it's trickery. It's a political matter, and a great one, greater than you, rats, than all of the local mobs put together. It's politics. You what? Gisela frowned. I don't understand a damned thing you're saying. Emir's marriage is political, and political issues are to be secured through that wedding. The emperor is forging a union through marriage. He wants to unify the empire more securely, put an end to border unrest, bring peace. For do you know who he's marrying? Cyrilla, the heiress to the throne of Sintra. Lies! Siri yelled. Hogwash! By what right do you accuse me of lying, Miss Volker? Hotspurn raised his eyes towards her. Perhaps you are better informed. Certainly am. Quiet, Volker, Gisela grimaced. He pricked your tail on the table and you were quiet and now you're bawling. What is this Sintra, Hotspurn? Who is this Cyrilla? Why should it be so important? Sintra, Reef interjected, pouring fish stick on his finger, is a little state in the north of which the Empire fought with the local rulers about three or four years ago. Agreed, Hotspurn confirmed. The Imperial forces conquered Sintra and even crossed the river Yara, but had to withdraw later. Because they took a beating at Sodden Hill, snapped Ciri. They almost lost their britches, they retreated so fast. Miss Falker, I see, is familiar with recent history. It's creditable, creditable at such a young age. May one ask where Miss Falker attended school? One may not enough. Gisela demanded quiet again. Talk about this Sintra Hotspur, and about the amnesty. Imperator Emir, the so-called merchant said, has decided to turn Sintra into a parasitic state. A what? Parasitic. Like ivy, which can't exist without a powerful tree trunk around which it wraps itself. And the tree trunk is, of course, Nilfgaard. There are other such states, such as Metina, Mecht, Toussaint, where local dynasties govern or pretend to govern. That's called appearance antinomy, Reith boasted. I've heard of it. Nonetheless, the problem with Sintra was that the royal line died out. Died out? It was as though green sparks would shoot from Ciri's eyes at any moment. Died out my hat! The Nilfgaardians murdered Queen Calanthe. Simply murdered her! I do own... With a gesture, Hotspurn quieted Gisela, who was once again about to berate Siri for interrupting. That Miss Falker continues to dazzle us with her knowledge. The Queen of Sintra did indeed fall during the war. It is believed that her granddaughter, Cyrilla, the last of the royal blood, also fell. Thus, Emir did not have much from which to create that apparent autonomy, as Mr. Reef so wisely said. Until Cyrilla suddenly showed up again as if from nowhere. Ha! Huh, just fairy tales, snorted Iskra, resting on Gisela's arm. Indeed, Hotspur nodded. A little like a fairy tale, it must be confessed. They say that this Cyrilla was imprisoned by an evil witch somewhere in the far north, in a magical tower. But Cyrilla managed to flee and beg for asylum in the empire. That is one damn great load of false hogwash and boulder dash, yelled Siri, reaching for the casket of Fishtek with shaking hands. While Imperator Emir, so the rumour goes, Hotspurn continued unperturbed, fell madly in love with her when he saw her and wants to take her for his wife. So he offers an amnesty. Little Falcon is right, Missile said firmly, emphasising her words by banging her fist on the table. That's balderdash. I can't bloody under bloody stand what this is all about. One thing I know for certain, basing any hopes of Nilfgaardian benevolence on that balderdash would be even greater balderdash. That's right, Reef said, supporting her. There's nothing in the imperial marriage for us. No matter whom the emperor marries, another betrothed will always be waiting for us, one twisted out of hemp. This isn't about your necks, my dear rats. Hotspurn reminded them. This is politics. There's no let up to the endless rebellions, uprisings and disorders on the northern marches of the empire, particularly in Sintra and its surroundings. And if the imperator takes the heiress of Sintra for a wife, Sintra will calm down. 
There'll be a solemn amnesty, and the rebellious parties will come down from the mountains, stop besetting the imperial forces and making trouble. Why, if the Sintron ascends the imperial throne, perhaps the rebels will join the imperial army. And you know, after all, that in the north, on the far side of the river Yara, there is war, and every soldier counts. Aha! Cayley grimaced. Now I get it. That's their amnesty. They'll give us the choice. Here's a sharpened steak, and there's the imperial livery. You can have a steak up your ass or the livery on your back, and off to war to die for the empire. Indeed, Hotspurn said slowly. Anything can happen in war. Nonetheless, not everyone must fight, my dear rats. Of course, after fulfilling the terms of the amnesty, after disclosing and admitting one's guilt, a certain kind of substitute service might be possible. What? I know what this is about. Gisela's teeth flashed briefly in his weather-beaten face, blue from stubble. The Merchants Guild, my little ones, would like to take us in. Caress and nurse us, like a doting mother. Poor mother more like, Iskra grunted under her breath. Hotspurn pretended not to hear. You are completely right, Gisela, he said coldly. The Guild may, if it so wishes, hire you. Officially, for a change, and take you in. Give you protection, also officially, and also for a change. Kaylee was going to say something, missile too, but a swift glance from Gisela kept them both silent. Tell the guild, Hotspurn, the leader of the rats said icily, that we are grateful for the offer. We shall think it over, reflect on it, and discuss it, and decide what to do. Hotspurn stood up. I ride. Now, with darkness falling, I shall overnight in the village. I feel awkward here. And tomorrow, straight to the border with Metina, then down the main highway to Forgeum, where I'll stay until the equinox. And who knows? Maybe longer. For I shall wait there for anyone who has thought it through, and is ready to turn themselves in, and wait for the amnesty under my protection. And I advise you not to dilly-dally either, with your reflecting and your pondering. For Bonart is liable to outpace the amnesty. You keep frightening us with Bonart, Gisela said slowly also standing up. Anyone would think he was just around the corner, when he's probably over the hills and far away. In jealousy, Hotspurn finished calmly, in the inn called the Chimera's Head, about thirty miles hence. If not for your zigzags by the Velder, you probably would have run into him yesterday. But that doesn't worry you, I know. Farewell, Gisela. Farewell, rats. Master Almavera, I'm riding to Metina, and I'm always happy to have company on the road. Uh, what did you say? Gladly, as I thought. Back up your things, then. Pay the master rats for his artistic efforts. The postal station smelled of fried onions and potato soup. They had been cooked by the station keeper's wife, temporarily released from her imprisonment in the pantry. A candle on the table spat pulsated and swayed with a whisker of flame. The rats leaned so tightly over the table that the flame warmed their almost touching heads. He's in jealousy, Gisela said softly, in the chimera's head, only a day's ride from here. What do you think of that? The same as you, Cayley snarled. Let's ride over and kill the whore son. Let's avenge Valdes, Reef said, and Mukumorek. Then various hotspurns, Iskra hissed, won't shove other people's fame and daring down our throats. We'll kill Bonart, that scavenger, that werewolf. We'll nail his head above the inn door to match the name. So everyone will see he wasn't a hard man, but a mere mortal like everyone else. One who finally took on someone better than himself. That'll show folk which gang is number one, from Korath to Periplot. They'll be singing songs about us at markets, Cayley said heatedly. Why? And in castles? Let's ride. Asa slammed his hand down hard on the table. Let's ride and destroy the bastard. And afterwards, Gisela pondered, we'll think about that amnesty, that guild. Why are you twisting up your face, Cayley, as though you've bitten a louse? They're on our heels and winter's coming. Here's what I think, little rats. 
Let's winter warming our asses by the fireplace, blanketed from the cold by the amnesty, swigging mulled amnesty beer. We'll see out this amnesty nice and politely, more or less, till the spring. And in the spring, when the grass peeps out from under the snow... The rats laughed in unison, softly, ominously. Their eyes flared like those of real rats when they approach a wounded man incapable of defending himself at night in a dark alley. Let's drink, Gisela said, to Bonart's confusion. Let's eat that soup and then go to bed. Rest, for we set off before sunrise. That's right, Iskra snorted. Let's follow Miss Landfolker's example. They've been in bed for an hour. The postal station keeper's wife trembled by the cauldron, hearing once again their soft, evil, hideous giggling. Siri raised her head. For a long time, she said nothing, eyes fixed on the barely flickering flame of the lamp where the last fish oil was burning down. I slipped out of the station like a thief, she continued the story, before dawn, in total darkness. But I didn't manage to flee unseen. Missile must have woken when I was getting out of bed. She caught me in the stable when I was saddling the horse, but she didn't show any surprise. And she didn't try to stop me. The sun was starting to rise. No, it's not too far till our dawn, yawned Visigotta. Tied to sleep, Siri. You can take up the story tomorrow. Perhaps you're right. She also yawned, stood and stretched vigorously. Because my eyelids are getting heavy. But at this pace, Hermit, I'll never finish. How many evenings have we had together? At least ten. I'm afraid that the whole story might take a thousand and one nights. We have time, Siri. We have time. Who do you want to run from, little falcon? From me. Or from yourself. I've finished running. Now I want to catch up with something. Which is why I must return to where everything began. I must. Please understand, Missile. So that was why... Why you were so nice to me today. For the first time in so many days. The last time? To bid farewell? And then forget me. I'll never forget you, Missile. You will. Never. I swear. And it wasn't the last time. I'll find you. I'll come to you. I'll come in a golden carriage and six, with a retinue of courtiers. You'll see. I'll soon have... possibilities. Great possibilities. I'll change your fortunes. You'll see. You'll find out what I'll be capable of doing, of changing. You need great power to do that. Missile sighed. And tremendous magic. And that's... Also possible. Siri licked her lips. Magic, too. I can recover. Everything I once lost can be restored. And be mine once more. I promise you, you'll be astonished when we meet again. Missile turned her closely cropped head away, eyes fixed on the pink and blue streaks the dawn had painted above the eastern edge of the world. Indeed she said quietly. I shall be astonished if we ever meet again. If I ever see you again, little one. Go. Let's not drag this out. W wait for me, Siri sniffed. A and don't get yourself killed. Think about the amnesty Hotspurn was talking about. Even if Gisela and the others don't want to. You think about it, Missile. It may be a way to survive... Because I will come back for you. I swear. Kiss me. The dawn broke. The light grew and it became colder and colder. I love you, 
Waxwing. I love you, little falcon. Now go. Of course, she didn't believe me. She was convinced I'd got cold feet, that I'd rather rush after Hotspurn to look for help, to beg for that tempting amnesty. How could she know what feelings had overcome me as I listened to what Hotspurn had said about Sintra and my grandmama Calanthe, and about how some Cyrilla would become the wife of the Emperor of Nilfgaard? That same Emperor who had murdered my grandmama and who had sent that black knight with feathers on his helmet after me. I told you, remember? On the Isle of Thaneth, when he held out his hand to me, I made him bleed. I ought to have killed him, but somehow I couldn't. I was a fool. Oh, never mind. Perhaps he bled to death on Thaneth. Why are you looking at me like that? Go on. Tell me how you rode after Hotspurn to recover your inheritance, to recover what belonged to you. There's no need to sneer, no need to mock. Yes, I know it was stupid. I see it now. I saw it then too. I was cleverer in Caer Moran and in the temple of Melitola. There I knew that what had passed could not return, that I wasn't the princess of Sintra, but someone completely different, that I had no inheritance. All of that was lost and I had to reconcile myself to it. It was explained to me wisely and solemnly, and I accepted it. Calmly, too. And then it suddenly began to come back. First, when they tried to impress me with the Baron of Cassidy's daughter's title. I'd never been bothered about such things, but suddenly I fell into a fury, put on airs, and yelled that I was more titled and of better birth than she. And from then on, I began to think about it. I felt the fury growing in me. Do you understand that, Visigotha? I do. And Hotspurn's story was the last straw. I was almost boiling with rage. I had been told so much about destiny in the past. But here was someone else about to benefit from my destiny thanks to simple fraud. Someone had passed themselves off as me, as Siri of Sintra, and would have everything, would live in the lap of luxury. I couldn't think of anything else. I suddenly realised I was hungry, cold, sleeping outdoors, that I had to wash in freezing streams. Me! When I ought to have a gold-plated bathtub, water perfumed with spikenard and roses, warmed towels, clean bed linen. Do you understand, Visigotha? I do. I was suddenly ready to ride to the nearest prefecture, to the nearest fort, to those black-cloaked Nils guardians whom I so feared and whom I hated so much. I was ready to say, I am Siri, you Nils guardian morons. Your stupid emperor ought to take me as his wife. Some impudent fraud has been shoved into your emperor's arms and that idiot hasn't realised he's being swindled. I was so determined I would have done it given the opportunity, without a thought. Do you understand, Visigotha? I do. Fortunately, I calmed down. To your great fortune. He nodded gravely. The matter of the imperial marriage bears all the hallmarks of a political scandal. A battle of factions or fractions. Had you revealed yourself thwarting other influential forces, you wouldn't have escaped the dagger or poison. I understood that too, and remembered it. I remembered it well. To reveal who I was would mean death. I had the chance to convince myself of it. But let us not get ahead of the story. They were silent for some time working with the skins. A few days before, the catch had been unexpectedly good. Many muskrats and koipu, two otters and a beaver had been caught in the traps and snares, so they had a great deal of work. Did you catch up with Hotspurn? Visigotha finally asked. I did. Siri wiped her forehead with her sleeve. Quite quickly, actually, because he was in no hurry. And he wasn't at all surprised when he saw me.
Miss Falker. Hotspurn tugged at the reins, gracefully spinning the black mare around. What a pleasant surprise, although I confess it's not such a great one. I expected it. I can't conceal that I expected it. I knew you would make the right choice, miss. A wise choice. I noticed the flash of intelligence in your lovely and charming eyes. Siri rode closer so that their stirrups almost touched. Then she hawked at length, leaned over and spat on the sand of the highway. She had learned to spit in that hideous but effective way when it was necessary to dampen somebody's enthusiasm. I understand. Hotspurn smiled slightly. You wish to take advantage of the amnesty? No. To what, then, should I ascribe the joy which the sight of your comely face evokes in me, miss? Must there be a reason? she snapped. You said you'd be pleased to have company on the road. Nothing has changed. He grinned more broadly. But if I'm wrong about the issue of the amnesty, I'm not certain we should keep company. We find ourselves, as you see, at a crossroads. A junction. The four points of the compass. The need for a choice. Symbolism, as in that well-known legend. If you ride east, you will not return. If you ride west, you will not return. If you ride north... Hmm. Amnesty lies north of this post. You can shove your amnesty. Whatever you say, miss. So where, if I may ask, does your road lead? Which path from this symbolic crossroads will you choose? Master Almavera, artist of the needle, drove his mules westwards towards the small town of Fano. The eastern highway leads to the settlement of jealousy, but I would very much advise against that. The River Yara, Siri said slowly. Is the Nilfgaardian name for the river Yaruga, right? Such a learned maiden. He leaned over and looked her in the eye. And she doesn't know that. Can't you answer in a civilized fashion when you're asked in a civilized fashion? I was only joking. Why bristle so? Yes, it's the same river. In Elven and in Nilfgaardian, it's the Yara. In the north, it's the Yaruga. And at the mouth of that river, continued Siri, Lies Sintra? That's right, Sintra. From where we are now, how far is it to Sintra? How many miles? Plenty. And it depends what kind of miles you count it in. Almost every nation has its own, so it's easy to make a mistake. It's more convenient, using the method of all wandering merchants, to calculate such distances in days. Reaching Sintra would take twenty-five to thirty days. Which way? Due north. Miss Falker seems very curious about Sintra. Why? I want to ascend to the throne there. Very well, very well. Hotspurn raised his hand in a defensive gesture. I understood the gentle deflection. I won't ask any more questions. The most direct road to Sintra, paradoxically, doesn't lead due north, for wildernesses and boggy lakes would hinder your progress. First, you should head towards the town of Forgem, and then northwest to Metina, the capital of a country with exactly the same name. Afterwards, you ought to ride across the plain of Magdera, on the merchant's road to the town of Neunreuth. Only from there should you head for the north road, which runs along the valley of the river Yelena. From there it's easy. Military units and transports ply the road without let-up by Nazir and the Marnadal Stairs, which is a pass leading north to the Marnadal Valley, and the Marnadal Valley is Sintra. Hmm. Siri's eyes were fixed on the misty horizon, at the blurred line of black hills. To Forgem and then northwest. You mean, which way? You know what, miss? Hotspurn smiled slightly. I'm heading towards Forgem and then to Metina. See, down that track, that line of yellow sand between those young pines? Ride that way with me, and you won't lose your way. Amnesty or no amnesty, but it will be pleasant to travel with such a charming maiden. Siri measured him up with the coldest glance she could manage. Hotspurn bit his lip with a puckish smile. So? Let's ride. Bravo, Miss Falker. Wise decision. I said that you were as wise as you were beautiful. I was right. Stop calling me Miss Hotspurn. In your mouth it sounds insulting. 
and I won't let myself be insulted with impunity. As you wish, miss. The day did not fulfill the beautiful dawn's promise. It was grey and wet. The damp fog dimmed the intensity of the autumnal leaves of the trees leaning over the road, displaying a thousand shades of ochre, red and yellow. The damp air smelled of bark and mushrooms. They rode at a walk over a carpet of fallen leaves, but Hotspurn often spurred his black mare to a gentle trot or canter. During those moments, Siri looked on in delight. Does she have a name? No. Hotspurn flashed his teeth. I treat my mans functionally. I change them regularly and don't become attached to them. I think giving horses names is pretentious if one doesn't run a stable. Do you agree with me? Blackie the horse, Fido the dog, and Felix the cat. Pretentious. Siri didn't like his gaze or ambiguous smiles, and especially disliked the slightly mocking tone he used when talking and answering questions. So she adopted a simple tactic. She remained silent, spoke in monosyllables, and did not provoke him. When possible. It was not always possible, particularly when he talked about that amnesty of his. Thus, when once again, and quite sternly, she expressed her reluctance, Hotspurn surprisingly changed his approach. He abruptly began trying to prove that in her case an amnesty was not necessary. It simply did not apply to her. The amnesty concerned criminals, he said, not victims of crimes. Siri roared with laughter. You're a victim yourself, Hotspurn. I was speaking seriously, he assured her, not in order to arouse your girlish glee, but to suggest a way of saving your skin in the event of being captured. Something like that won't work on the Baron of Cassidy nor can you expect clemency from the Van Hagens. The most favourable outcome is that they would hang you on the spot, quickly and, all being well, quite painlessly. Were you, however, to fall into the hands of the prefect and stood before the austere but just imperial law, ah, then I would suggest the following line of defence. Break down in tears and declare that you were the innocent victim of a coincidence. And who would believe that? Everybody would. Hotspurn leaned over in the saddle and looked her in the eye. Because that's the truth. You are an innocent victim, Falker. You aren't even sixteen, so according to the Empire's law, you're a minor. You ended up in the Rats Gang by accident. It's not your fault that one of the bandits, Missile, whose unnatural tastes are no secret, took a fancy to you. You were dominated by Missile, sexually abused and forced to... Now it's all clear, Siri interrupted amazed by her own calm. It's finally clear what this is all about, Hotspurn. I've seen men like you before. Indeed. Just like every cockerel, she said, still composed. Your comb bristles at the thought of me and missile. Like every stupid tomcat, it dawns in your stupid noggin to try to cure me of this sickness which is contrary to nature to turn the deviant back onto the road of truth. But do you know what is truly disgusting and contrary to nature and all that? Your thoughts. Hotspurn observed her in silence, with a somewhat mysterious smirk on his thin lips. My thoughts, dear Falker, he said a moment later, may not be decent, may not be nice, and they are obviously not innocent. But... By the gods they are in keeping with nature, with my nature. You do me a disservice thinking that my attraction to you has its basis in some perverted curiosity. Ha! Huh. You also do yourself a disservice by not being aware or not wanting to realize that your captivating appeal and uncommon beauty are capable of bringing any man to his knees. That the charm of your glance... Listen, Hotspurn, she interrupted. Do you want to bed me? What intelligence, he said, spreading his hands. I'm simply lost for words. Then I'll help you. She spurred her horse a little in order to look at him over her shoulder. Because I have plenty of words. I feel honoured. In other circumstances, who knows? If you were someone else. Ha! But you, Hotspurn, do not attract me at all. Nothing. Simply Nothing about you attracts me. And actually, I'd say it's the reverse. Everything about you puts me off. 
You could see for yourself that in such circumstances the sexual act would be contrary to nature. Hotspurn laughed, also spurring on his horse. The black mare danced on the track, gracefully lifting her shapely head. Siri fidgeted in the saddle, fighting with a strange feeling which had suddenly woken in her, somewhere deep in the pit of her stomach, but which quickly and doggedly struggled outside, onto her skin, quivering from the touch of her clothing. I've told him the truth, she thought. I don't like him by the devil. It's his horse I like, that black mare. Not him, but his horse. What damned foolishness. No, no, no. Even if I wasn't thinking of Missile, it would be ridiculous and stupid to yield to him just because the sight of that black mare dancing on the track excites me. Hotspurn let her ride closer and looked her in the eyes with a strange smirk. Then he jerked the reins again, making the mare take short steps, circle and walk gracefully sideways. He knows, thought Siri. The old rascal knows what I'm feeling. Damn it, I'm simply curious. Some pine needles, Hotspurn said gently, riding up very close and extending a hand. Have got caught in your hair. I'll remove them if you allow. And I'll add that the gesture springs from my gallantry, not from perverted lust. The touch, which came as no surprise to her at all, caused her pleasure. She was still very far from a decision, but just to be sure, she reckoned the days from her last bleeding. Yennefer had taught her that, to count in advance under the cool head, because afterwards, when things got hot, a strange aversion to counting developed, linked to a tendency to ignore the potential result. Hotspurn looked her in the eye and smiled, just as though he knew that the reckoning had come out in his favour. If only he weren't so old, Siri sighed. He's got to be at least thirty. Tourmalines, said Hotspurn, his fingers gently touching her ear and earring. Pretty, but only tourmalines. I would gladly give you emeralds. They are precious and have a more intense green, which would suit your looks and the colour of your eyes much better. No, she drawled, looking at him insolently. If it came to it, I'd demand emeralds in advance, because no doubt it's not just horses you treat functionally, Hotspurn. No doubt, after a heady night, you'd think recalling my first name was pretentious. Fido the dog, Felix the cat, and the maiden? Mary Jane? Pardon my honour, he laughed artificially. You can chill the most feverish desire, O oh Snow Queen. I've been well schooled. The fog had lifted a little, but it was still gloomy and soporific, until the languorous mood was brutally interrupted by yelling and the thudding of hooves. Some horsemen rushed out from behind a clump of oaks they had just passed. The two of them reacted as quickly and as smoothly as if they had been practising it for weeks. They spurred and reined their horses around, breaking into a gallop. A furious dash pressed to their horses' manes, urging their mounts on with shouts and kicks of their heels. Above their heads, crossbow bolts whirred, and up came a shouting, a clanging and a thudding of hoofbeat. Into the trees, Hotspurn yelled. Turn into the forest, into the undergrowth. They turned without slowing. Siri pressed herself harder and lower to her horse's neck, for the branches lashing her as she sped past threatened to knock her from the saddle. She saw a crossbow bolt flick a splinter from the trunk of an alder they were passing. She shouted at her horse to go faster, expecting the thud of a bolt in her back at any moment. Hotspurn, riding just in front of her, suddenly groaned strangely. They cleared a deep hollow and rode recklessly down a precipice into a thorny thicket. Just then, Hotspurn slid from his saddle and tumbled into a cranberry bush. The black mare neighed, kicked, thrashed her tail and rushed on. Siri did not think twice. She dismounted and slapped her horse on the rump. As it ran after the black mare, she helped Hotspurn up. The two of them dived into the bushes into an alder corpse, fell over, tumbled down the slope and into some tall ferns at the bottom of the ravine. Moss cushioned their fall. The thudding of their pursuers' hooves resounded from the precipice above them. Fortunately, they were riding higher up through the forest after the fleeing horses. 
it seemed that their disappearance among the ferns had gone undetected. Who are they? Siri hissed, pulling crushed Rusula mushrooms from under Hotspurn and shaking them from her hair. The prefect's men? The Van Hagens? Common bandits. Hotspurn spat out leaves. Thugs. Offer them an amnesty, she said, spitting sand. Promise them, be quiet, they'll hear. Hey! Hey! Over here! They heard from above. Over on the left! On the left! Hotspurn? What? You have blood on your back. I know, he answered coldly, pulling a wad of linen from his jacket and turning over on his side. Shove this under my shirt, by my left shoulder blade. Where were you hit? I can't see the bolt. It was an arbalest. Iron shot. The head of a horseshoe nail, most probably. Leave it there. Don't touch it. It's right by the backbone. Damn it. What can I do? Keep quiet. They're returning. Hooves pounded. Someone whistled piercingly. Somebody yelled cold and ordered somebody else to go back. Siri listened intently. They're riding off, she murmured. They've given up the chase. They didn't even catch the horses. Good. We won't catch them either. Will you be able to walk? I won't have to. He smiled, showing her a cheap-looking bracelet fastened to his wrist. I bought this trinket with the horse. It's magical. The mare has carried it since she was a foal. When I rub it like this, it's as though I were calling her, as though she were hearing my voice. She'll run here. It'll take some time, but she'll come for certain. With a bit of fortune, your roan will follow her. And with a bit of bad luck, you'll ride off by yourself? Volker, he said, becoming grave. I won't. I'm counting on your help. I'll have to be held up in the saddle. My toes are already going numb. I may lose consciousness. Listen, this ravine will lead you to a narrow river valley. You'll ride uphill against the current northwards. You'll carry me to a place called Tegamo. You'll find somebody there who'll know how to get this iron out of my back without me ending up dead or paralyzed. Is that the nearest village? No. Jealousy is nearer. It's in a valley about twenty miles in the opposite direction, downstream. But don't go there under any circumstances. Why? Under no circumstances, he repeated, frowning. It's not about me, it's about you. Jealousy means death for you. I, I don't understand. You don't have to. Simply trust me. You told Gisela. Forget Gisela. If you want to live, forget about all of them. Why? Stay with me. I'll keep my word, Snow Queen. I'll cover you with emeralds. I'll shower you in them. Indeed. This is a wonderful time for making jokes. It's always a good time for jokes. Hotspurn suddenly seized her, pulled her close and began to undo her blouse. Unceremoniously but unhurriedly. Siri pushed him away. Indeed she snapped. A wonderful time for that, too. It's always a good time for that. Especially for me right now. I told you. It's my spine. There may be complications tomorrow. What are you doing? Oh, damn it. This time, she pushed him away harder. Too powerfully. Hotspurn blanched, bit his lip and groaned in pain. I'm sorry, but if somebody is wounded, they ought to lie still. Being close to you makes me forget the pain. Stop that! Volker, be nice to a suffering man. You'll really suffer if you don't take your hand away this second. Quiet. The thugs are liable to hear us. Your skin is like silk. Don't wriggle. Oh, damn it, thought Siri. Let it be. In any case, what difference does it make? I'm curious. I can be curious. There's no real feeling in it. I'll treat him functionally, and that's that, and forget him unpretentiously. She yielded to his touch and the pleasure it brought. 
She turned her head away, but decided that was exaggeratedly modest and fraudulently prudish. She didn't want to be a goody-goody being seduced. She looked him straight in the eyes, but that seemed too bold and provocative. She didn't want to be like that either. So she simply closed her eyes, hugged him around the neck and helped him with the buttons because he was having difficulty with them and wasting time. The touch of fingers was joined by the touch of lips. She was close to forgetting about the entire world when Hotspurn suddenly froze stiff. For a while she lay patiently, remembering that he was wounded and the wound must be bothering him. But it went on a little too long. His saliva was cooling on her nipples. Hey, Hotspurn, are you asleep? Something oozed onto her chest and sighed. She touched it with her fingers. Blood. Hotspurn! She shoved him off her. Hotspurn! Have you died? Foolish question, she thought. I mean, I can see. I can see he's died. He died with his head on my breast. Siri turned her head away. The glow from the fireplace played red on her disfigured cheek. Perhaps there was a blush there too. Visigotha could not be certain. The only thing I felt then, she added, still turned away, was disappointment. Does that shock you? No, actually not. I understand. I'm trying not to embellish the story, not correct anything, not keep anything back, although occasionally I feel like it, especially that last part. She sniffed, rubbing a knuckle into the corner of her eye. I covered him with branches and stones, any old thing I could find, I confess. It grew dark. I had to sleep there. The bandits were still hanging around. I could hear their shouts, and I was certain they weren't ordinary bandits. I just didn't know who they were hunting, me or him. But I had to stay quiet, the whole night, until dawn, next to a corpse. <laughs> At dawn, she began again a moment later, the sound of our pursuers had long since faded away, and I could set off. I had a mount. The magical bracelet I took from Hotspurn's arm really worked. The black mare returned. Now she belonged to me. That was my present. That's the custom on the Isles of Skellige, did you know? A girl has the right to a costly gift from her first lover. So what if mine died before he managed to actually become my lover? The mare banged her front hooves on the ground neighed and turned in profile as though ordering Siri to admire her. Siri could not suppress a sigh of admiration at the sight of the dolphin-like neck, straight and slender, but powerfully muscled, the small, shapely head with its concave forehead, the high withers and her build of delightful proportions. She approached cautiously, showing the mare the bracelet on her wrist. The mare gave a long, drawn-out snort, flattened her twitching ears, but allowed herself to be caught by the bridle and stroked on her velvety nose. Kelpie, Siri said. You're as black and agile as a sea kelpie. You're as magical as a kelpie. So you'll be kelpie. And I don't care if that's pretentious or not. The mare snorted, stuck her ears up and shook her silky tail, which reached her hocks. Siri, favouring a high saddle position, shortened the stirrup leathers and felt the unusual flat saddle. It had no saddle tree or pommel. She fitted her boot to the stirrup and seized the horse by the mane. Nice and easy, Kelpie. The saddle, in spite of appearances, was quite comfortable and, for obvious reasons, much lighter than standard cavalry saddles. Now, Siri said, patting the mare on her hot neck, let's see if you're as fleet as you are beautiful. If you're a real racer or just a hack, what do you say to a twenty-mile gallop, Kelpie? Had someone quietly crept up deep in the night to the remote cottage in the midst of the swamp 
with its sunken, moss-grown thatched roof. Had they peered through the slits in the shutters, they would have seen a grey-bearded old man listening to the story told by a teenage girl with green eyes and ashen hair. They would have seen the dying glow in the fireplace come alive and glow bright as though sensing what would be told. But that was not possible. No one could have seen it. The cottage of old Visogotta was well hidden among the reeds in the swamp, in a wilderness permanently covered in mist, where no one dared to venture. The stream's valley was level and good for riding, so Kelpie ran like the wind. Of course, I wasn't riding uphill, but downstream. I remembered that curious name, Jealousy. I recalled what Hotspurn had said to Gisela at the station. I understood why he had warned me about that village. There must have been an ambush in Jealousy. When Gisela made light of the offer of the amnesty and working for the guild, Hotspurn deliberately mentioned the bounty hunter quartered in the village. He knew the rats would swallow the bait, ride there and fall into the trap. I had to get to jealousy before them, cut off their route and warn them, turn them back, all of them, or at least just missile. I conclude, Visagotta mumbled, that you didn't manage to. At that time, she said softly, I thought that a large force armed to the teeth was waiting in jealousy. In my wildest dreams it never occurred to me that the trap was a single man. She was silent, staring into the gloom. Nor did I have any idea what kind of man he was. Birka had once been a wealthy village, charming and picturesquely situated. Its yellow thatch and red tiles crowded into a valley with steep forested sides which changed colour with the seasons. In autumn especially, Birka delighted the artistic eye and sensitive heart. It was like that until the settlement changed its name. Here is what happened. A young farmer from a nearby elven colony was madly in love with the miller's daughter from Birka. The miller's prankish daughter ridiculed the elf's wooing and continued to sleep around with neighbours, friends, and even relatives. They began to mock the elf and his blind love. The elf, somewhat untypically for his race, exploded with anger and vengeance, exploded horribly. One night, with a strong wind blowing the right way, he started a fire and burned Birka down. The victims of the fire, now ruined, lost heart. Some roamed the world, and others fell into idleness and drunkenness. The money gathered for the rebuilding of the village was regularly defrauded and squandered on drink, and the settlement became a vision of misery and despair. It was a jumble of ghastly, carelessly thrown-together shacks beneath the bare and black charred slope of the valley. Before the fire, Birka had been oval-shaped with a central square, now the few solidly built houses, granaries and a distillery formed something like a long main street which was topped by the facade of the Chimera's head built by the efforts of the community and kept by the widow Gulu. And for seven years no one had used the name Birka. People said Flaming Jealousy or for short simply Jealousy. The rats rode down the main street. It was a chill, overcast, gloomy morning. People fled into their homes, hid in their sheds or their wattle and daub shacks. Those who had shutters slammed them closed. Those who had doors bolted them. Whoever still had vodka drank it to give them courage. The rats rode at a walk, ostentatiously slowly, stirrup against stirrup. An indifferent contempt was painted on their faces, but their narrowed eyes closely observed the windows, porches and alleyways. One bolt from a crossbow, Gisela warned loudly. One clang of a bowstring and there'll be a bloodbath here. And the red flame will be let slip, Iskra added in her high melodious soprano. Only earth and water will remain. Some of the villagers certainly had crossbows, but no one wanted to find out if the rat's words were empty. The rats dismounted. 
They covered the final furlong, separating them from the chimera's head on foot. Side by side, their spurs, adornments and jewellery rhythmically jangling and clinking. At the sight of them, three jealousy residents, soothing the previous day's hangover with beer, bolted from the steps of the inn. Hope he's still here, Cayley muttered. We've taken our time. There was no need for that rest. We should have come right away, even travelled at night. Fool! Iskra bared her little teeth. If we want bards to sing songs about this, it can't be done at night, in the darkness. People must see it. Morning is best when everybody's still sober. Right, Gisela? Gisela did not reply. He picked up a stone, swung and hurled it against the door of the inn. Come out, Bonart. Come out, Bonart, the rats called in unison. Come out, Bonart. Footsteps could be heard inside, slow and heavy ones. Missile felt a shiver crawling over the nape of her neck and her shoulders. Bonart stood in the doorway. The rats involuntarily took a step back. The heels of their high boots dug into the ground and their hands shot to their sword hilts. The bounty hunter held his sword under one arm. That way he had his hands free. In one, he held a peeled boiled egg and in the other a hunk of bread. He slowly walked to the balustrade and looked down on them from high up. He stood in the porch and was huge, immense, though he was as gaunt as a ghoul. He looked at them, sweeping his watery eyes over each in turn. Then he bit off a morsel of egg, and after it a piece of bread. Where's Varka? he asked indistinctly. Bits of yolk fell from his moustache and lips. Run, Kelpie, run, my beauty, fast as you can. The black mare neighed loudly, extending her neck in a headlong gallop. A hail of gravel shot out from under her hooves, though it seemed as if they were barely touching the ground. Bonhart stretched lazily, his leather jerkin creaking. He slowly pulled down and adjusted his elk hide gloves. What could this be? he grimaced. You want to kill me? And why? For Mukumorek, for starters, Kaylee answered. And for our amusement, said Iskra. And to get you off our backs, Reef threw in. Ah, Bonnard said slowly. So that's what it's about. And if I swear to leave you alone, will you leave me alone? No, you grey cur, we will not. Missile smiled charmingly. We know you. We know you won't drop it, that you'll trudge along our trail and wait for a chance to stab one of us in the back. Come down. Easy, does it? Bonnard smiled too, malevolently stretching his mouth wide beneath his grey whiskers. We can always find time to go vote around. There's no need to be hasty. First, I'll make you an offer, rats. I'll permit you to choose. What are you mumbling about, you old fool? Cayley shouted, crouching. Speak clearly. Bonnard nodded and scratched a thigh. There's a bounty on you, rats. A goodly one. And life must go on. Iskra snorted and opened her eyes wide like a wildcat. Bonnard crossed his arms on his chest, holding his sword in the crook of his arm. That goodly reward, he repeated, is for you dead, and it's a little larger for taking you alive. But to tell you the truth, it's all the same to me. I have nothing against you personally. I was thinking yesterday that I'd dispatch you all for a bit of amusement and diversion, but you've come yourselves, saving me the bother. You've won my heart by doing so. Thus I shall let you choose. How do you prefer me to take you? The playful way, 
or the painful way. The muscles on Kaylee's jaw twitched. Missal leaned over, ready to leap. Gisela caught her arm. He means to enrage us, he hissed. Let the bastard talk. Bonnart snorted. Well, he repeated, the easy way or the hard way. I advise the first, for you see, the easy way hurts much, much less. The rats drew their weapons at the same instant. Gisela made a few crosscuts and struck a sword fighter's pose. Missile spat copiously on the ground. Calm down here, skinny old man, she said apparently calmly. Come here, you blackguard. We'll kill you like a grizzled old dog. So you wish it the hard way, Bonnard said, looking somewhere above the rooftops. He slowly drew his sword, throwing down his scabbard, and unhurriedly descended from the porch, his spurs clanking. The rats swiftly spread out across the street. Cayley went furthest to the left, almost to the wall of the distillery. Beside him stood Iskra, twisting her thin lips in her usual dreadful smile. Missal, Acer and Reef went off to the right. Gisela remained in the centre, staring at the bounty hunter from under narrowed eyelids. Very well, rats. Bonnard looked from side to side, looked up at the sky, and then raised his sword and spat on the blade. If we are to cavort, let us cavort. Let the music play. They leapt at each other like wolves, like lightning, silently, with no warning. Blades wailed in the air, filling the narrow street with a plaintive clang of steel. At first, all that could be heard was the clang of sword hilts, gasps, groans, and quickened breathing. And then suddenly, and unexpectedly, the rats began to scream and die. Reef lurched out of the melee first, his back smacking against a wall, splashing blood on the dirty whitewash. Acer reeled out after him, staggering, curled over and fell on his side by turns, bending and straightening his knees. Bonnard whirled around and leapt like a mad thing, surrounded by the glint and whistle of his blade. The rats backed away from him, lunging forward, slashing and jumping aside, furiously, fiercely, pitilessly and ineffectively. Bonnard parried, struck, parried, struck and attacked, attacked relentlessly, without respite, dictating the tempo of the bout. And the rats backed away and died. Iskra, slashed in the neck, fell over in the mud, cowering like a kitten, blood gushing from an artery onto Bonnard's calves and knees as he walked past her. The bounty hunter parried the attacks of Missile and Gisela with a broad swing, then whirled and carved Cayley open with a lightning-fast blow, striking him with the very tip of his sword from collarbone to hip. Cayley released his sword but did not fall, just curled up and seized his chest and belly in both hands as blood trickled through his fingers. Bonnard once more whirled away from Gisela's thrust, parried Missile's attack and smoked Cayley again, this time turning the side of his head into scarlet pulp. The fair-haired rat fell, splashing into a puddle of blood mixed with mud. Missile and Gisela hesitated for a moment, and instead of fleeing, yelled with a single voice, savagely and furiously, and leapt at Bonnard, and found death. Siri burst into the settlement and galloped down the main street, splashes of mud spurted from beneath the mare's hooves. Bonnard shoved Gisela, who was lying by the wall, with his heel. The rat's leader gave no sign of life. Blood had stopped gushing from his shattered skull. Missile on her knees searched for her sword, groping in the mud and dung with both hands, not seeing that she was kneeling in a quickly spreading puddle of red. Bonnard walked slowly over towards her. No! The hunter raised his head. Siri leapt from her speeding horse, staggered and dropped onto one knee. Bonnard smiled. A she-rat, he said. The seventh rat. I'm glad you are here. I needed you to complete the set. 
Missal had found her sword, but was unable to lift it. She wheezed and threw herself at Bonnard's feet. Her trembling fingers dug into the legs of his boots. She opened her mouth to scream, but instead of a cry, a shining crimson stream burst forth. Bonnard kicked her hard, knocking her over in the muck. Missal, both hands now holding her mutilated belly, managed to raise herself again. No! Siri screamed. Missal! The panty hunter paid no attention to her yell. He did not even turn his head. He swung his sword and struck vigorously as though with a scythe. A powerful blow that jerked Missile up from the ground and flung her over to the wall, as limp as a cloth doll, like a rag smeared with red. A scream died in Siri's throat. Her hands trembled as she reached for her sword. Murderer, she said, astonished at the strangeness of her voice at the strangeness of her lips, which had suddenly become horrendously dry. Murderer! Bastard! Bonnard observed her curiously, tilting his head slightly. Are you going to die too? he asked. Siri walked towards him, skirting around him in a semicircle. The sword in his raised and extended hands moved around, deceiving, beguiling. The bounty hunter laughed loudly. Die, <laughs> he repeated. The she-rat wants to die. He moved around slowly, standing on the spot, not allowing himself to be lured into the trap of the semicircle. But it was all the same to Siri. She was boiling over with ferocity and hatred, trembling with a lust for murder. She wanted to strike that ghastly old man, feel her blade cut into his body. She wanted to see his blood gushing from severed arteries in the final beats of his heart. Well, little rat. Bonhart raised his bloody sword and spat on the blade. Before you die, show me what there is in you. Let the music play. Truly, no one knows how that they did not slaughter each other during the first clash, Niklar, the son of the coffin maker, said six days later. They wanted to slaughter each other, that was clear to see. She to murder him and he her. They flew at each other, came together for a split second, and there was a mighty clash of swords. They exchanged maybe two, maybe three blows each. There ain't a man that could have counted it by sight or by hearing. So swiftly did they strike, my lord, that not a man's eye nor ear could have grasped it. And how they danced and leapt around each other like two weasels. Stefan Skelen, called Tony Owl, listened attentively, playing with a knout. They leapt apart, the boy went on, but neither of them was even graced. The she-rat was as wrathful as the very devil and was hissing like a tomcat when someone wants to take his mouse away. But Mr. Bonnard was only serene. Falka, Bonnard said, smiling and grinning like a veritable ghoul. Truly can you dance and whirl a blade. You have aroused my curiosity, wench. Who are you? Tell me before you perish. Siri panted. She felt terror beginning to seize her. She understood what she was up against. Tell me who you are, and I'll spare your life. She gripped her hilt more tightly. She had to, had to get through his parries, slash him, before he closed up. She could not let him deflect her blows. She could not withstand his blows with her sword. She could not risk, even once more, the pain and paralysis which pierced and spread through her elbow and forearm when she parried. She could not waste energy dodging his blows, which were missing her by barely a hair's breadth. Get through his defence, she thought, right now, in this clash or die. You will die, Shirat, he said, moving towards her with his sword extended far out in front of him. Do you not fear? That is only because you know not what death looks like. Care, Moret, she thought as she sprang. Lambert, the comb, the somersault. 
She took three steps and performed a half pirouette, and when he attacked, she ignored his feint, threw a backward somersault, dropped into a nimble crouch and lunged at him, ducking under his blade and twisting her wrist for the cut, for a fearful blow aided by a powerful twist of her hip. Suddenly, she was seized by euphoria. She would feel the blade cutting into his body. Instead, there was the hard, moaning impact of metal on metal, and a sudden flash in her eyes, a shock and pain in her head. She felt herself falling, felt herself hitting the ground. He parried and twisted, she thought. I'm dying, she thought. Bonnart kicked her in the belly. A second kick, accurately and painfully aimed at her elbow, knocked the sword from her hand. Siri grabbed her head and felt a dull pain, but there was neither a wound nor blood beneath her fingers. He hit me with his fist, she thought to her horror. I was just punched or struck with the pommel of his sword. He didn't kill me. He thrashed me like an unruly brat. She opened her eyes. The hunter stood over her, terrible and gaunt as a skeleton, towering over her like a diseased, leafless tree, stinking of sweat and blood. He seized her by the hair, lifted her violently, forced her to stand, but at once jerked her, knocking the ground from under her feet, and dragged her, wailing like the damned, towards Missel, who was lying at the foot of the wall. So you don't fear death, do you? he snarled, bending her head downwards. Then have a look, she rat. That is death. That is how you die. Look, those are guts. That is blood. And that is shit. That's what's inside us all. Siri tensed up, bent over, still gripped by his hand, and dry wretched hoarsely. Missile was still alive, but her eyes were already misty, glazed, fish-like. Her hand, like a hawk's talons, clenched and unclenched, clawing the mud and dung. Siri smelled the acrid, penetrating odour of urine. Bonnart cackled. That is how you'll die, little rat, in your own piss. He released her hair. Siri collapsed onto all fours, racked by dry, choking sobs. Missile was right beside her. Missile's hand, slender, delicate, soft. Missile's hand. It was no longer moving. He didn't kill me. He tied my hands to the hitching post. Visagota sat motionless. He had been sitting like that for a long time. He was even holding his breath. Siri continued her tale, but her voice was becoming more and more hushed, more and more unnatural, more and more unpleasant. He ordered the people who had gathered to bring him a sack of salt and a keg of vinegar and a saw. I didn't know. Couldn't understand what he meant to do. I still didn't know what he was capable of. I was tied to the hedging post. He called some servants, ordered them to hold me by the hair and by the eyelids. He showed them how so I couldn't turn my head away or close my eyes. So I had to watch what he was doing. You have to take pains so the goods won't go off, he said, so they won't decay. Siri's voice cracked, stuck dryly in her throat. Visogota, suddenly realising what he was hearing, felt the saliva well up in his mouth like a flood wave. He cut off their heads, Siri said dully, with a sore. Gisela, Kaylee, Asa, 
brief iskra and missile. He sawed off their heads, one after the other, in front of my eyes. If someone would have quietly crept up that night to the remote cottage in the midst of the swamp with its sunken, moss-grown thatched roof, were they to have peered through the slits in the shutters in the dimly lit interior, they would have seen a grey-bearded old man in a sheepskin coat and an ashen-haired girl with her face disfigured by a scar on her cheek. They would have seen the girl, racked with sobs, choking on tears in the arms of the old man while he tried to calm her, awkwardly and mechanically stroking and patting her trembling shoulders. But it was not possible. No one could have seen it. The cottage was well concealed amidst the marshes, in a wilderness ever covered in mist, where no one dared to venture. I have often been asked what made me decide to write my memoirs. Many people seemed interested in the moment my memoirs began, namely what fact, event or incident gave rise to the writing. Formerly, I gave various explanations and often lied. But now, how be it I pay homage to the truth. For today, now that my hair has thinned and is going white, I know the truth is a precious seed, while a lie is but contemptible chaff. And the truth is thus. The event which gave rise to everything, to which I owe the first notes from which my subsequent life's work was formed, was the accidental discovery of paper and pencil among the things that my company and I stole from the Lyrian military convoys. It happened... Dandelion, Half a Century of Poetry Chapter 3 It happened on the fifth day after the September new moon, on the thirtieth day of our expedition, to be precise, reckoning from when we set out from Brokilon and six days after the battle on the bridge. Now, my dear future reader, I shall go back in time somewhat and describe the events which took place directly following the glorious battle on the bridge which was so fraught with consequences. First, though, I shall enlighten the considerable number of readers who know nothing about the battle on the bridge, either owing to their having other interests or as a result of their general ignorance. Uh, let me clarify. That battle was waged on the last day of the month of August in the year of the Great War in Angren, on the bridge connecting the two banks of the river Yaruga in the vicinity of a border post called the Red Timberport. The sides of this armed conflict were the Nilfgaardian army, a corps from Lyria commanded by Queen Maeve, and our glorious company, which consisted of myself, i.e. the undersigned, and also the Witcher, Geralt, the Vampire, Emil Regius Roelek Terzi of Godifroy, the Archer, Maria Baring, known as Milva, and Kaia Mao Difren Apkielach, a Nilfgaardian, who liked stubbornly to maintain that he was not such. It may also be unclear to you, dear reader, why Queen Mev was in Angrin, when it was believed she had perished during the Nilfgaardian incursion into Lyria, Rivia, and Adian in July, which ended in the total conquest of those lands and their occupation by the Imperial Army. However, Maeve had not perished in battle, as was thought, nor was she captured by Nilfgaard. Banding together a loyal mobile force from the surviving Lyrian army under her colours, and enlisting anyone she could, including mercenaries and common felons, the valiant Maeve took up a partisan war against Nilfgaard, and the wildness of Angren suited guerrilla warfare perfectly now striking from an ambuscade, now lurking in some undergrowth, for there was undergrowth in abundance in Angren. If truth be told, there is nothing worth mentioning in that land aside from undergrowth. The regiment of Mev, now called the White Queen by her army, swiftly grew in might and acquired such daring that it was able to cross to the Aruga's left bank in order to prowl freely and foment unrest far in the enemy's rear. Now, let us return to our sheep. 
that is, the battle on the bridge. The tactical situation was as follows. Queen Mev's partisans, having rampaged on the Aruga's left bank, wanted to flee to the Aruga's right bank, but happened upon the Nilfgaardians, who were rampaging along the Aruga's right bank and wanted to flee to the Aruga's left bank. We, from a central position, i.e. the very middle of the river Yaruga, happened upon the above and were surrounded on both sides from the left and right by armed men. Having nowhere to flee, we became heroes and covered ourselves in undying glory. The battle, incidentally, was won by the Lyrians, since they achieved what they had intended, i.e. a flight to the right bank. The Nilf guardians bolted in an unknown direction and in doing so lost the battle. I realise that this all sounds passing confusing, and I shall not omit to consult with some military theoretician on the text before publication. For the moment, I am relying on the authority of Kair Ap Kialach, the only soldier in our company, and Kair confirmed that winning battles by means of a rapid escape from the battlefield is permissible from the point of view of most military doctrines. The contribution of our company to the battle was indisputably meritorious, but also had negative consequences. Milva, who was with child, met with a tragic misadventure. The rest of us were fortunate enough not to suffer any serious injuries. But neither did anyone profit, nor even receive any thanks, the exception being Geralt the Witcher. For Geralt the Witcher, in spite of his repeated but clearly to Implicitously professed indifference and his frequently declared neutrality displayed in the battle a fervour as great as it was exaggeratedly spectacular. In other words, he fought in a truly effective way, if not to say, for effect. He was noticed, and Maeve, the Queen of Lyria, knighted him with her own hand. It quickly turned out that there was more unpleasantness than benefit from that accolade. For I must tell you, gentle reader, that Geralt the Witcher was always a modest, prudent, and composed man, with a soul as simple and uncomplicated as the shaft of a halberd. The unexpected promotion and apparent generosity of Queen Maeve changed him, however, and had I not known him better, I would have said that it made him conceited. Instead of vanishing from the scene as quickly and anonymously as possible, Geralt became mixed up in the royal retinue, enjoying his honour, took delight in the grace and favour, and relished his fame. But fame and renown were the last things we needed. I shall remind those that do not remember that the very same Geralt the Witcher, now dubbed a knight, was being sought by the intelligence services of all the four kingdoms in connection with the matter of the sorcerer's rebellion on the Isle of Thaneth. Attempts were made to charge me, an innocent person, as honest as the day is long, with the crime of espionage. To that, one ought to add Milva, who had collaborated with Dryads and Scoia'tile, and who was embroiled, as it transpired, in the infamous massacre on the borders of Brokelon Forest. To that, one ought to add Kaer Ap Kialach, an Ilfgaardian, a citizen of an enemy nation, whose presence on the wrong side of the battle would have been arduous to explain or justify. It so happened that the only member of our company whose curriculum vitae was not besmirched by political or criminal issues was the vampire. The exposure or identification of any one of us threatened us all with impalement on sharpened aspen stakes. Each day spent, initially indeed pleasantly, safely and with full bellies, in the shade of the Lyrian standards, aggrandized that risk. Geralt, when I emphatically reminded him of that, became somewhat dispirited, but put forward his arguments, of which he had two. Firstly, following her disagreeable accident, Milva still required care and attention, and there were barber surgeons in the army. Secondly, Queen Maeve's army was marching east, towards Kai Du, and our company, before it changed direction and became embroiled in the battle described above, had also been heading to Kai Du for we hoped to obtain some information from the druids dwelling there to aid our search for Siri. Patrols and lawless gangs prowling in Angren had driven us from our straight road to the aforementioned druids. Now, under the protection of the friendly Lyrian army, in the grace and favour of Queen Maeve, the way to Kaidu was wide open. Why? It seemed straightforward and safe. I warned the witcher that it only appeared so, that it was but a semblance, and that royal favours are deceptive and inconstant. The Witcher did not want to listen, but it was soon proved who was right. 
When news got out that an Ilfgaardian punitive expedition was marching towards Angren in great force from the Klamath Pass in the east, the Lyrian army wasted no time in turning back towards the Mahakam Mountains in the north. As may easily be imagined, that change of direction did not suit Geralt in the slightest. He was hurrying to the Druids, not to Mahakam. As naive as a child, he ran to Queen Maeve to obtain an exemption from the army and a royal blessing for his private business. And in that moment, queenly love and favour ended, and admiration for the hero of the Battle for the Bridge vanished like so much smoke. The knight, Sir Geralt of Rivia, was reminded in a cool, though resolute tone, of his knightly duties towards the crown. The still ailing Milver the vampire Aegis and the undersigned were instructed to join the column of fugitives and civilians moving behind the convoy. Kair Abkialach, a sturdy youth who in no way resembled a civilian, was given a white and blue sash and conscripted into a so-called free company, which meant a cavalry unit drawn from various bits of rabble picked up by the Lyrian corps on the road. In this way, our company was sundered and everything suggested that our expedition was definitively and resoundingly over. As you might imagine, dear reader, it was not the end at all. Nay, it was not even the beginning. Milva, once she had learned of this development, immediately declared herself fit and well. She was first to give the order to withdraw. Kair flung his royal livery into the bushes and bolted from the free company, and Geralt fled the opulent tents of the select knighthood. I shall not go on at length about the details, and modesty does not permit me the excessive display of my own, not insignificant, contribution to the undertaking. I merely state the fact. On the night of the 5th of September, our entire company clandestinely took leave of Queen Maeve's corps. Before parting from the Lyrian army, we stocked up liberally, without asking the quartermaster's permission for so doing. I consider the word theft, as used by Milver, to be too blunt, for we deserved some sort of payment for our involvement in the memorable Battle of the Bridge. And if not a payment, then at least compensation and reparations for the losses we incurred. Passing over Milver's tragic accident, not counting Geralt and Kaia's cuts and bruises, all our horses were killed or crippled, apart from my faithful Pegasus and the skittish Roach, the witch's mare. Thus, in lieu of compensation, we took three full-blooded cavalry steeds and one colt. We also took various bits of tackle, whatever fell into our hands. For the sake of fairness, I shall add that we subsequently had to throw half of it away. As Milver said, that can happen when you steal in the dark. The most useful things were taken away from the army stores by the vampire Rages, who can see better in the dark than by day. Rages additionally diminished the defensive capabilities of the Lyrian army by one fat, mousy grey mule, which he led from the pen so expertly that not a single beast snorted or stamped a hoof. Stories about animals smelling vampires and reacting to their smell in panicked fear cannot thus be believed, unless it refers to certain animals and certain vampires, I shall add that we kept said mousy grey mule for some time. Following the loss of the colt, which later bolted in the forests of Riverdale, alarmed by wolves, the mule carried what was left of our belongings. The mule was called Dracul. It was so named by Regis immediately after being stolen, and so it remained. Regis was clearly entertained by the name, which no doubt had some amusing significance in the culture and speech of vampires, but which he did not wish to explain to us, claiming it was an untranslatable pun. In this way, our company found itself on the road again, and the previously lengthy list of folk who did not like us grew even longer. Geralt of Rivia, an unblemished knight, had quit the ranks of the knighthood before his promotion had been confirmed by a single deed, and before the court heraldist had created a coat of arms for him. Kair Ep Kialach had already managed to fight in and desert from both armies in the great conflict between Nilfgaard and the Nordlings, earning a sentence of death in absentia in both. The rest of us were in no better a situation. After all, a noose is a noose, and the importance of why one is to hang is extremely slight. Whether for discrediting knightly honour, desertion, or christening an army mule, a dracul. Let it not then astonish you, reader, that we made truly titanic efforts to considerably increase the distance between us and Queen Maeve's corps. We rode south with all possible speed towards the Aruga, intending to cross to the left bank. 
not only in order to put the river between us and the Queen and her partisans, but because the wildernesses of Riverdale were less dangerous than war-torn Angrin. It would have been far more judicious to travel to the Druids in Kaidu along the left and not the right bank. Paradoxically so, since the left bank of the Aruga belonged to the hostile Nilfgaardian Empire. The father of the left bank conception was Geralt the Witcher, who, after leaving the fraternity of swaggering knighthood, had regained the greater part of his reason, ability to think logically, and customary caution. The future was to show that the witch's plan was fraught with consequences and determined the fate of the entire expedition, but more about that later. When we reached the Aruga, there were already plenty of Nilfgaardians there who had crossed the reconstructed bridge at the Red Timberport and were continuing the offensive against Angren, and probably further against Timeria, Mahakam, and the devil only knows where else the Nilfgaardian general staff was planning to attack. Crossing the river right away was out of the question. We had to hide and wait for the army to move on. So, for two whole days we hunkered in the riverside osiers, cultivating rheumatism and feeding the mosquitoes. To make matters worse, the weather soon declined. It drizzled, was windy as hell, and our teeth were chattering from the cold. I do not recall such a cold September among the many Septembers engraved in my memory. It was then, my dear reader, having found paper and pencil among the supplies borrowed from the Lyrian convoys to kill time and forget about our discomforts, that I began to record and immortalise some of our adventures. The foul rainy weather and enforced inactivity spoiled our mood and prompted various dark thoughts, particularly in The Witcher. Geralt had long since begun counting the days separating him from Ciri, and each day we were not on the road pushed him, in his opinion, further and further away from the girl. Now, in the wet osiers, in the cold and rain, the witcher became gloomier and more evil with each passing hour. I also noticed he was limping heavily, and when he thought no one could see or hear, he swore and hissed from the pain. For you ought to know, dear reader, that Geralt had suffered broken bones during the Sorcerer's Rebellion on the Isle of Thaneth, the fractures had knitted and been healed thanks to the magical efforts of the dryads of Brokelon Forest, but apparently had not stopped troubling him. Thus, the Witcher was suffering, so to say, from both bodily and spiritual pain. It made him absolutely livid, so we steered clear of him. And once again he was persecuted by dreams. On the morning of the 9th of September, while he was sleeping off his guard duty, he terrified us all by springing up with a cry and drawing his sword. It looked as though he were in a frenzy, but fortunately it subsided at once. He went away, but was soon to return with a gloomy demeanour. He announced, in so many words, that he was breaking up the company with immediate effect and continuing on his way alone, since awful things were occurring somewhere. Time was running out, it was becoming dangerous, and he didn't want to put anyone at risk or take responsibility for anyone. He talked and argued so tediously and unconvincingly that no one wanted to discuss it with him. Even the usually eloquent vampire dismissed him with a shrug, Milver by spitting, and Kair with the terse reminder that he was responsible for himself, and that as far as risks went, he did not carry a sword to give his belt ballast. Afterwards, however, everybody fell silent and stared knowingly at the undersigned, no doubt expecting me to avail myself of the opportunity and go back home. I probably do not have to say that they were most disappointed. The incident persuaded us, nonetheless, to discard our lethargy and drove us to a bold deed, that of crossing the Yaruga. I confess that the undertaking aroused my anxiety, for the plan was to swim across at night, to quote Milva and Kair, hanging on to the horses' tails. Even if it had been a metaphor, and I suspect it was not, I somehow could not imagine it for myself or my steed Pegasus, upon whose tail I would have to depend during the crossing. Swimming, to put it mildly, was, and is, not one of my strong points. Had Mother Nature wanted me to swim, in the act of creation and the process of evolution, she would have equipped me with webbed fingers, and the same applied to Pegasus. My fears turned out to be in vain, 
at least with regard to swimming behind a horse's tail, for we crossed using a different method. Who knows if it was not even more insane? We crossed in a truly impudent manner, beneath the reconstructed bridge at the Red Timber Port, under the very noses of the Nilfgaardian Guard and Patrols. The undertaking, it turned out, only appeared to be a demented effrontery and mortal gamble, and in reality passed off without a hitch. After the front-line units had crossed the bridge, transport after transport, vehicle after vehicle, flock after flock, wandered this way and that. There were also crowds of various kinds, including civilian flotsam and jetsam, among which our company did not stand out at all, nor were we conspicuous. Thus... On the 10th day of September, we all crossed to the left bank of the Yeruga, only once being hailed by the guard, at whom Kahir, wrinkling his brow imperiously, shouted back something menacing about imperial service, backing up his words with the classically military and ever-effective for fuck's sake. Before anyone had time to grow curious about us, we were already on the left bank of the Yeruga and deep in the Riverdale Forest, for there was only a single highway there, heading south, and neither the direction nor the profusion of Nilfgaardians hanging around it suited us. At our first camp in the forests of Riverdale, I was also visited at night by a strange dream. Unlike Geralt's, it was not about Ciri, but the sorceress Yennefer. The dream was curious, unsettling. Yennefer, in black and white as usual, was hovering in the air above a huge, grim mountain castle, and from below, other sorceresses were shaking their fists and hurling abuse at her. Yennefer swirled the long sleeves of her dress and flew away like a black albatross over the boundless sea, straight into the rising sun. From that moment, the dream transformed into a nightmare. On awaking, the details vanished from my memory, and there remained only vague, not very sensible images, but they were ghastly, of torture, screaming pain, fear and death, in a word, horror. I did not share that dream with Geralt. Not a word did I breathe of it, and rightly so, as it later turned out. She was called Yennefer, Yennefer of Engerberg, and she was a most famous sorceress. May I not live to see the dawn if I lie? Triss Merigold shuddered and turned, trying to see through the crowd and blue smoke densely filling the tavern's main chamber. She finally rose from the table, somewhat regretfully abandoning a fillet of soul in anchovy butter, a local speciality and a genuine delicacy. She was not roaming the taverns and inns of Bremervord to eat delicacies, however, but to obtain information. Apart from that, she had to watch her figure. The crowd of people she had to squeeze among was already dense and tight, in Bremervurd, people loved stories and passed up no opportunity to listen to new ones, and the sailors who visited there in great numbers never disappointed. They always had a fresh new repertoire of sea tales. Naturally, the vast majority were invented, but that didn't make the slightest difference. A tale is a tale, and has its own rules. The woman who was telling the story, and who had mentioned Yennefer, was a fisherwoman from the Isles of Skellige. Stout, broad-shouldered and with close-cropped hair and, like her four companions, dressed in a waistcoat of narwhal skin, worn to a sheen. It were the nineteenth day of the month of August, and the morning after the second night of the full moon, the islander began, raising a mug of ale to her lips. Her hand, Triss noticed, was the colour of old brick, and her exposed, knotty arm must easily have measured twenty inches in girth. Triss's waist measured twenty-two. At the crack of dawn... The fisherwoman continued, her eyes sweeping over her audience's faces. Our smack put to sea, and to the sound twixt Anne Skellig and Spigarog, to the oyster grounds, where we usually set our salmon gillnets. We made great haste, for a storm were nigh, the heavens darkening cruelly from the west. We had to pluck the salmon from the nets quick, for otherwise, as you know's your sail, when at last, after a storm, you can venture forth to sea, only rotten, chewed heads remain in the nets, and all the catch is for naught. Her audience, residents of Bremervod and Sidaris in the main, mostly living from the sea and dependent on it for their existence, nodded and murmured their understanding. Triss usually saw salmon in the form of pink slices, but also nodded and murmured because she didn't want to stand out. She was there incognito, on a secret mission. We sail into port, 
the fisherwoman went on, draining her mug and indicating that one of the listeners could buy her another. We sail in and are emptying the nets, and blow me if Gudrun, Starla's daughter, doesn't start yelling at the top of her voice and pointing to starboard. We look, and summit's flying through the air, and it ain't a bird. My heart stopped for a tick, for at once I'm thinking it's a wyvern or young gryphon. They sometimes fly over Spikerog, true enough, but generally in the winter, usually with a west wind are blowing. But meanwhile, that black thing, if it don't splash into the water, and a wave shoves it directly into our nets. It gets tangled up in the net and splashes around in the water like a seal. Then all of us, we were eight fishwives and all, catch the net and heave it on board, and do our gobs fall open. Blow me if it ain't a woman, in a black goon, as black as any crow. She's all caught up in the net, twixt two salmon of which one, as I live and breathe, must have weighed almost three stone. The fisherwoman from Skaliga blew the froth from her refilled mug and took a deep draught. None of the listeners commented or expressed any disbelief, although not even the oldest among them could remember a salmon of such impressive weight being landed. The black-haired woman in the net, the islander continued, is coughing spitting seawater and thrashing about, and Gudrun, who's expecting, is frantically yelling, It's a kelpie! A kelpie! A half through it! But any fool could see it weren't no kelpie, for a kelpie would have ripped up the net long since, and besides, what monster would let itself be lugged onto a fishing smack? And it ain't no half through her neither, for it don't have a fishy tail, and a mermaid always has one. And it fell into the sea from the sky, didn't it? And who's seen a kelpie or half through flying in the sky? But Skadi, Una's daughter, she's always hasty, so she starts yelling, Kelpie, too, and ups and grabs the gaff and aims at the net with it. And there's a blue flash from the net, and Skadi squeals. The gaff goes left, she goes right, strike me down if I'm lying. She throws three somersets and bangs Erstoon on the deck. Ha! Turns out a sorceress in a net's worse than a jellyfish, a scorpina or a numbing eel. And on top of that, the witch starts cursing something horrible. And the net starts a hissing, a stinking and a steaming as she works her magic inside. We sees it won't be no picnic. The islander drained her mug and wasted no time in reaching for the next one. Ain't no picnic, she belched loudly and wiped her nose and mouth to catch a witch in a net. We can feel as I live and breathe that the magic's making the smack roll harder. No time to hang around. Britter, Karen's doctor, presses the net with her foot and I grabs an oar and whack, whack, whack. The ale splashed high and spilled over the table and several mugs fell on the floor. The listeners wiped their cheeks and brows but none of them uttered a word of complaint or admonishment. A tale is a tale and has its own rules. The witch understood who she were up again. The fisherwoman stuck out her ample bosom and gazed around defiantly. And that you can't fool around with the fishwives of Skelliger. She said that she was surrendering to us will and like, and vowed not to cast any charms or incantations, and gave her name as Yennefer of Vengeberg. Her listeners murmured. Barely two months had passed since the events on the Isle of Thaned, and the names of the traitors bribed by Nilfgaard were remembered. The name of the celebrated Yennefer, too. We takes her, the fisherwoman continued, to Jarl Krach and Crete in Keir Trolder and Art Skellig. Never seen her after that. The Jarl was away on an expedition, but they said when he returned, he first received the witch harshly, but later treated her polite and courteous. <laughs> and I was just waiting to see what kind of surprise the sorceress would conjure up for me for whacking her with an oar. I thought she'd bad mouth me before the Jarl. But no, never said a word, never complained. I know that. Honourable witch. Afterwards, when she killed herself, I even felt sorry for her. Yennefer's dead, Triss screamed. So overwhelmed, she forgot about the importance of remaining incognito and the secrecy of her mission. Y Yennefer of Vengerberg's dead? Aye, she's dead, the fisherwoman said, finishing her beer. Dead as a doornail. Killed herself with her own charms, making magic spells. Didn't happen long since, last day of August, just for the new moon. But that's quite another story. Dandelion, you're asleep in the saddle. I'm, I'm not asleep. I'm thinking creatively.
So we rode, dear reader, through the forests of Riverdale, heading east towards Kaidu, searching for the druids who were meant to help us to find Ciri. I shall tell you how it went. Before that, though, for the sake of historical truth, I shall write a little about our company and each of its members. The vampire Regis was more than four hundred years old. If he was not lying, it meant he was the oldest of us all. Of course, it might have been Poppycock, but who could check? I preferred to suppose that our vampire was being truthful, for he had also declared that he had given up drinking people's blood irrevocably and for good. Owing to that declaration, we fell asleep more calmly in our camps. I, I noticed that in the beginning, Milver and Kair would fearfully and anxiously feel their necks after awaking, but they quickly stopped doing that. The vampire Regis was, or seemed to be, an utterly honourable vampire. If he said he would not drink their blood, then he would not. He did possess flaws, however, which did not result at all from his vampiric nature. Regis was an intellectual and liked to demonstrate it. He had the annoying habit of giving statements and truths with the tone and expression of a prophet, to which we swiftly stopped reacting, since the statements he gave were either genuine truths or sounded like the truth, or could not be proved, which in essence amounted to the same thing. But what was truly unbearable was Regis's habit of answering a question before the person asking had finished formulating it. Why, occasionally, even before the questioner had begun formulating it. I always took that seeming expression of supposed high intelligence more as an expression of boorishness and arrogance, and those qualities which suit university or courtly circles are hard to bear in a companion with whom one travels stirrup by stirrup day in day out, and who sleeps under the same blanket at night. Serious squabbles did not, however, occur owing to Milver. Unlike Geralt and Kair, whose inborn opportunism evidently allowed them to adapt to the vampire's mannerism and even led them to compete with him in that regard, the archer Milver preferred simple and unpretentious solutions. When Rages, for the third time, gave her an answer to a question as she was halfway through asking, she cursed him roundly, using words and expressions capable of making even a hoary mercenary blush in embarrassment. Surprisingly enough, it worked. The vampire lost his annoying mannerism in the blink of an eye, the conclusion thus being that the most effective defence against intellectual domination is roundly to affront the domineering intellectual. Milver, it seems to me, had been greatly affected by her tragic accident and loss. I write, it seems to me, for I am aware that being a man, I cannot imagine what such a loss means for a woman. Though I am a poet and a man of the quill, even my educated and trained imagination betrays me here, and I can do nothing. The archer swiftly regained her physical fitness, which could not be said for her mental state. It often happened that she would not utter a word throughout the whole day from dawn to dusk. She would disappear and remain isolated, which worried everyone somewhat, until finally a crisis occurred. Milver released the tension like a dryad or a she-elf, violently, impulsively, and not very comprehensibly. One morning, in front of our eyes, she drew a knife and, without a word, cut off her plait just above her shoulders. It doesn't befit me, for I'm not a maiden, she said, seeing our jaws hanging open. But nor am I a widow, she added, so that's the end of my morning. From that moment on, she was her old self. Brisk, biting, mouthy, and inclined to use unparliamentary language, from which we happily concluded that she had come through the crisis. The third, and no less curious, member of the company was the Nilf Guardian, who kept trying to prove he was not one. He was called, so he claimed, Kair Mauer Difrin Akielach. Kair Mauer Difrin, son of Kielach, Dandelion declared pointing his pencil at the Nilfgaardian. I have reconciled myself with many things which I don't like, and actually can't stand in this honourable company, but not with everything. I can't bear it when people look over my shoulder when I'm writing, and I don't intend to put up with it. The Nilfgaardian moved away from the poet, and after a moment's thought, seized his saddle, sheepskin and blanket, and dragged them over to Milver, who was dozing. I apologise, he said. Forgive my obtrusiveness, Dandelion. I glanced involuntarily out of pure curiosity, 
I thought you were creating a map or drawing up some tallies. I'm not a bookkeeper, the poet said, losing his temper and standing up. Nor am I a cartographer. But even if I were, it doesn't justify taking a sly look at my notes. I have apologised, Kaya repeated dryly, making his bed in the new place. I have reconciled myself with and become accustomed to many things in this honourable company, but I am still accustomed to apologising only once. Indeed, the witcher joined in, totally unexpectedly, for everyone, himself included, taking the side of the young Nilfgaardian. You've become devilishly touchy, Dandelion. I cannot fail to notice that it is somehow connected to the paper which you have recently begun to deface with a bit of lead while we camp. It's true, Rages agreed, putting more birch branches on the campfire. Our minstrel has become touchy, not to say secretive, discreet and loving of solitude recently. Oh, no. Having witnesses when performing his natural needs don't bother him at all, which in our situation one cannot indeed be astonished by. His shameful secrecy and oversensitivity to being watched extends solely to his scribbled notes. Is perhaps a poem being written in our presence? A rhapsody? An epic? A romance? A canzone? No, Geralt retorted, shifting towards the fire and muffling his back with a blanket. I know him. It can't be a verse because he's not cursing, mumbling or counting the syllables on his fingers. He's writing in silence, so it must be prose. Prose? The vampire flashed his pointed fangs, which he usually tried not to do. A novel, perhaps, or an essay? A morality play? Damn it, Dandelion, don't torture us so, reveal what you are writing. My memoirs. Your what? From these notes? Dandelion displayed a tube stuffed with paper. Will arise the work of my life. My memoirs, bearing the title, Fifty Years of Poetry. Nonsensical title, Kaye declared dryly. Poetry has no age. And if one concedes that it does, added the vampire, it is decidedly older than that. You don't understand. The title means that the author of the work has spent fifty years, no more and no less, in the service of Lady Poetry. In that case, it's even more nonsensical, said the witcher. You aren't even forty yet. Your writing ability was thrashed into you in the Temple Elementary School at the age of eight. Even if we allow that you were writing rhymes in school, you've not been serving lady poetry for longer than thirty years. But as I well know, for you've often told me about it, you only began seriously rhyming and composing melodies when you were nineteen, inspired by your love for Countess de Style. That makes it the nineteenth year of your service, Dandelion. So how did you come up with this titular fifty years? Is it meant to be some kind of metaphor? I the bard said, puffing up. Trace broad horizons with my thought. I describe the present, but I pass into the future. I intend to publish this mighty work in some twenty or thirty years, and then no one will be able to cast doubt on the titular reckoning. Ha! Now I get it. If anything astonishes me, it's the foresight. You aren't usually bothered about tomorrow. Tomorrow still doesn't bother me much, the poet declared with superiority. I'm thinking about posterity, about eternity. From the point of view of posterity, Rages observed, it isn't too ethical a beginning to write now in advance. On the basis of the title, posterity has the right to expect a work written from a genuine fifty-year perspective by a person with a genuine fifty-year store of knowledge and experience. A person whose experience amounts to half a century... Dandelion interrupted unceremoniously, must be, from the very nature of the case, a seventy-year-old decayed old gimmer with his brain eroded by the hag of sclerosis. Someone like that should be sitting on the veranda, breaking wind, not dictating their memoirs, for people would only laugh. I won't make that error. I'll write my biography at the height of my creative powers. Later, just before publication, I shall merely make cosmetic corrections. It does have its merits, Geralt said as he massaged and cautiously flexed his painful knee. Particularly for us, for though without doubt we appear in his work, though without doubt he has mould us, in half a century we won't be especially concerned about it. What's half a century? The vampire smiled. A moment, a fleeting instant. Ah, uh, dandelion, a minor observation. In my opinion, 
Half a century of poetry sounds better than fifty years. I don't deny it, said the troubadour, crouching over a page and scribbling on it with a pencil. Thanks, Regis. Something constructive at last. Does anyone else have any comments? I do, Milva began unexpectedly, poking her head out from her blanket. Why are you goggling at me? Because I'm unlettered. But I'm not stupid. We're on an expedition. We're going to rescue Ciri. We're travelling through enemy lands with sword in hand. This rubbish of dandelions might fall into enemy mitts. And we know the poet taster. It's no secret he's a gas bag, a sensation seeker, as well as a gossip. So let him have a care with what he's scrolling, so we don't accidentally get hung because of his scribblings. You're exaggerating, Milva, the vampire said gently. Greatly, I'd say, Dandelion continued. I'd say the same, Kaia added carelessly. I don't know what it's like with the Nordlings, but in the Empire, possession of manuscript isn't considered a crime in, nor is literary activity punishable. Geralt swept his eyes over him and snapped the stick he was playing with. But libraries are torched in cities captured by that cultured nation, he said in an unaggressive tone, but with a distinct sneer. Never mind, though. Maria, I agree that you're exaggerating. Dandelion scribblings, as usual, don't have any importance, not regarding our safety. Oh, sure, said the archer, getting hot under the collar and sitting up. I know what I know. When the royal bailiff were taking a census round our way, my stepfather took to his heels, bolted into the forest, and stayed there for a fortnight without poking his nose out. Wherever there's parchment, there's a judgment, he used to say, and whoever's name is captured in ink today is broke on the wheel tomorrow. And he was right, the rotten bastard. I hope that horse is sizzling in hell. Milva threw off her blanket, and now, quite wide awake, moved closer to the fire. It looked, Geralt observed, like another long fireside conversation was in the offing. You weren't fond of your stepfather, I deduce, Dandelion observed after a moment's silence. I weren't, Milva said, audibly grinding her teeth, for he were a rotten bastard. He made advances when Mother wasn't looking, interfered with me. He wouldn't listen, so finally I couldn't stand it no more and took a rake to him, and when he fell over I gave him a kick or two in the ribs and the privates. Two days later, he were lying and spitting blood. So, I decided to flee into the world without waiting to see if he got better. Later, I heard rumours he'd died, and mother soon after him. Oi, dandelion, are you writing that down? Don't you dare, don't you dare hear me! It was strange that Milva was trekking with us, and the fact that a vampire was accompanying us was astonishing. Nonetheless, Strangest, if not simply incomprehensible, were the motives of Kair, who had suddenly changed from an enemy into, if not a friend, then certainly an ally. The youngster had proved that at the battle on the bridge, unhesitatingly standing with sword in hand beside the witcher against his countrymen. By this deed he gained our appreciation and conclusively dispelled our suspicions. In writing our... I have in mind myself the vampire and the archer, for Geralt, though he had fought shoulder to shoulder with Kair, though they had looked death in the eye side by side, was still mistrustful of the Nilfgaardian and did not like him. He did admittedly try to hide his resentment, but he was, as I believe I have already mentioned, as simple as a spear shaft, incapable of pretending and his aversion crept out at every turn, like an eel from a rotten trap. The reason was clear. It was Siri. It had been my lot to be on the Isle of Thanath that July new moon, when the bloody battle took place between sorcerers loyal to the kings and traitors incited by Nilfgaard. The traitors were helped by the squirrels, rebellious elves, and Kair, son of Kyilach. Kair had been on Thanath, he had been sent there on a special mission. He was to have seized and abducted Siri. Siri wounded him, defending herself. Kair had a scar on his left hand, at the sight of which my mouth always went dry. It must have been hellishly painful, and he still could not bend two of his fingers. And after all that, we rescued him on the ribbon, when his own countrymen were carrying him away to cruel torture in fetters. Why? I ask. 
For what misdeeds did they want to execute him? Or was it only for the defeat on Thaneth? Caer is not garrulous, but I have a sensitive ear even for monosyllables. The lad is not yet thirty, but looks as though he were a high-ranking officer in the Nilfgaardian army. Since he speaks the common speech impeccably, which is seldom found among Nilfgaardians, I think I know what kind of army Caer served in, and why he was promoted so quickly, and why he was sent on such strange missions, including foreign ones. For Caer was the man who had tried once before to abduct Siri, almost four years before during the massacre of Sintra. The destiny guiding the girl's fate had made itself felt for the first time. By coincidence, I talked about this with Geralt on the third day after crossing the Yaruga, ten days before the equinox, as we were negotiating the forests of Riverdale. That conversation, although very short, was fraught with unpleasant and worrying overtones. And at that moment, there was writ on the face and in the eyes of the Witcher a harbinger of the horror which was to explode during the equinox, after we were joined by the fair-haired Angoulême. The Witcher wasn't looking at Dandelion. He wasn't looking ahead. He was looking at Roach's mane. Just before her death, he began, Calanthe forced an oath on several of her knights. They were not to let Ciri fall into Nilfgaardian hands. During the flight, those knights were killed, and Ciri was left alone amidst corpses and conflagration, in the web of streets of the burning city. She would not have got out alive, that is beyond doubt. But he found her. Kair. He carried her out of the pit of fire and death. He rescued her. Heroically. Nobly. Dandelion reined Pegasus back somewhat. They were riding at the rear, and Rages, Milva and Kair were about a quarter of a furlong ahead but the poet didn't want a single word of their conversation to reach the ears of their companions. The problem was, the witcher continued, that our Kair was only acting nobly by order. He was noble as a cormorant is. He did not swallow the fish because he had a ring on his throat. He was meant to take the fish to his master. He failed, so the master was angry at the cormorant. The cormorant is now out of favour. Is that why he's searching for friendship in the company of fish? What do you think, Dandelion? The troubadour ducked in the saddle to avoid an overhanging linden branch. The branch already bore completely yellow leaves. But he saved her life, you said so yourself. Thanks to him, Ciri left Sintra in one piece. And she cried out in the night, seeing him in her dreams. But he did save her. Stop dwelling on it, Geralt. Too much has changed. Why, it changes every day. Brooding achieves nothing save distress, which clearly does you no good. He rescued Ciri. That fact was, is, and will remain a fact. Geralt finally tore his gaze away from the horse's mane and raised his head. Dandelion glanced at his face and swiftly looked away. The fact remains a fact, the witcher repeated in an angry, metallic voice. Oh, yes! He yelled that fact in my face on Thaneth, and his voice stuck in his throat from terror, for he was staring at my sword edge. That fact and that cry were supposed to be the arguments which would stop me murdering him. Well, it did, and I don't think it can now be undone, which is a pity, for a chain ought to have been begun then on Thaneth. A long chain of death, a chain of revenge about which tales would still be told after a hundred years have passed, tales which people will be afraid to listen to after dark. Do you understand that, Dandelion? Not really. Then to hell with you. That conversation was hideous, and the witch's expression had been hideous too. Oh, I did not like it when he was in a mood such as that and went off on such attack. I must, though, confess that the vivid comparison with the cormorant had played its role. I began to worry. The fish in its beak, taken to be clubbed, gutted and fried. A truly nice analogy. Joyful prospects. However, good sense belied such fears. After all, if we were to continue with the fishy metaphors, then who were we? Small fry? 
small, bony fry? In exchange for such a meagre haul, the cormorant Kair could not count on imperial grace. In any case, he was far from the pike he wanted to be thought of as. He was small fry just like us. When the war was raking both the earth and people's fates like an iron harrow, who was paying the slightest attention to small fry? I am certain that no one in Nilfgaard remembers Kair now. Vatier de Rido, chief of the Nilfgaardian military intelligence, listened to the imperial reprimand. So, Emir Var Emris continued scathingly, an institution which devours three times as much of the state budget as education, culture and the arts taken together is incapable of finding one man. This man simply disappears, goes into hiding, although I spend astronomical sums on an institution from which nothing has any right to remain concealed. One man, guilty of treason, blatantly mocks an institution to which I have given so many privileges and funds as would give even innocent men sleepless nights. Oh, trust me, Vatier, when the council next speaks of trimming the funds for clandestine services, I shall prick up my ears. You may trust that. Your imperial majesty, Vatier de Rido croaked, will make, I have no doubt, the right decision after weighing up all the pros and cons, both the failures and the successes of the intelligence service. Your majesty may also be certain that the traitor Kair Ep Kialach will not escape punishment. I have taken steps. I do not pay for your undertakings, but for results. And those are miserable, Vatier, miserable. What about Vilgevortz? Where the hell is Cyrilla? What are you mumbling now? Louder! I think your highness ought to wed the girl we are holding in Dan Rowan. We need that marriage. We need the legality of Sintra's foreign fiefdom to subdue the Isles of Skellige and the rebels in Atre, Strept, Magturga and the Slopes. We need a general amnesty, peace at the rear and along supply lines. We need the neutrality of Esterad Tyson of Kofir. I know, but the girl from Don Rowan is not Siri. I cannot wed her. May your imperial majesty forgive me, but does it matter if she is not authentic? The political situation requires your nuptials, urgently. The bride will be in a veil, and when we finally find the genuine Cyrilla, the girls will simply be exchanged. Have you taken leave of your senses, Vati? The fake one was only shown briefly at court. No one has seen the real girl in Sintra for four years, and rumor has it she spent more time in Skellige than in Sintra. I guarantee that no one will see through the deceit. No! Your imperial... No! Vatie. Find the real, Siri. Pull your finger out. Find, Siri. Find Kaia and Vilgefortz. Vilgefortz in particular. For he has Siri, I'm certain of it. Your Imperial Highness. Go on, Vatier, speak. At one time, I suspected the so-called Vilgefortz case was nothing but a provocation, and that the sorcerer had been murdered or is being imprisoned, and the spectacular and clamorous hunt allows Dijkstra to slander us and to justify his brutal repression. I've had similar suspicions. Ah, you have? This was not made public in Rodania, but my agents informed me that Dijkstra found one of Vilgefortz's hideouts, and within it, evidence of the sorcerer's bestial experiments on people, to be precise, on human fetuses and women with child. If Vilgefortz had Cyrilla, I fear that continued searches for her. Silence, damn it! On the other hand, Vatier de Rido quickly added, looking at the Emperor's furious face, all of that may be disinformation intended to denigrate the sorcerer. Uh, that would be Dijkstra's style. You're paid to find Vilgefortz and take Siri from him, for God's sake, not to digress and make conjectures. Where is Tony Owl? Still in Giso? Why? He allegedly left no stone unturned and looked into every hole in the ground. Allegedly, the girl is not there and never was. 
Apparently, the astrologer was either mistaken or is lying. Those are all quotations from his reports. What is he still doing there? Coronel Skellen, I dare observe, undertakes none too transparent measures. He is recruiting for his unit, the one your highness ordered him to set up in Fort Rokain, Mecht, where he has established his base. That unit, I take the liberty to add, is an extremely doubtful bunch. But it is odd that, towards the end of August, Lord Skellen hired a notorious assassin. What? He engaged a hired thug with instructions to eliminate a criminal gang marauding around Giso. A commendable act, but is it a task for the imperial coroner? Is Invidia speaking through you, Vati, by any chance? And does it not give your reports color and fervor? I merely state the facts, your highness. I want... The emperor stood up abruptly. To see the facts. I'm tired of hearing about them. It was an extremely hard day. Vatier de Rideau was weary. In his schedule for that day, he had planned an hour or two of paperwork, intended to protect him from drowning in pending documents, but the thought of it made him shudder. No, he thought. Easy does it. It can wait. I'm going home. No, not yet. My wife can wait. I'll go to Cantarella, to my gorgeous Cantarella, with whom I can relax so pleasantly. He quickly made up his mind. He simply rose, took his cloak and left, a gesture full of disgust holding off his secretary, who was trying to force a leather portfolio of urgent documents onto him. Tomorrow, tomorrow is another day. He left the palace by the rear exit, which opened onto the gardens, and walked along a path lined with cypresses. He passed an ornamental pond where a carp, introduced by Emperor Torres, was approaching the venerable age of 132 years, as testified by a golden commemorative medal attached to the gills of the immense fish. Good evening, Viscount. Vatier released the dagger concealed in his sleeve with a short movement of his forearm. The hilt slid into his hand by itself. Very risky, Ryons, he said coldly. Very risky, showing your burned countenance in Nilfgaard, even as a magical teleprojection. You noticed. And Vilgefortz assured me that if you didn't touch me, you wouldn't guess it was an illusion. Vatier put the dagger away. He had not guessed it was an illusion at all, but now he knew. You are too great a coward, Ryons, he said, to show yourself here in person. You know what would befall you if you did. Is the Emperor still so determined to seize me, and my master, Vilgefortz? Your insolence is disarming. Go to hell, Vatier. We're still on your side, Vilgefortz and I. Well, I admit we tricked you with the counterfeit Cyrilla, but it was done in good faith. In good faith, may I be drowned if I lie. Vilgefortz believed that since the real one had vanished, a fake one was better than none at all. We reckoned it was all the same to you. Your insolence has stopped being disarming and has begun to be insulting. I have no intention of wasting time talking to an insulting mirage. When I finally get my hands on you, we shall have a conversation, a long conversation. So until that time, apage, Rions. What's come over you, Vati? In the past, if even the devil himself appeared to you, you wouldn't forget to investigate, before the exorcism, if you couldn't by any chance profit in some way. Vatier did not grace the illusion with a glance. Instead, he watched the algae-covered carp idly churning up the sludge in the pond. Profit in some way, he repeated slowly, pouting his lips contemptuously. From you? And what could you give me? The real Cyrilla, perhaps? Perhaps your patron, Vilgefortz? Perhaps Kair ap Kialach? Hold hard. Ryons raised an illusory hand. You mentioned him. Who? Kair. We shall bring you Kair's head, I and my master, Vilgefortz. Have mercy, Ryons, Vatier snorted. Reverse the order. As you wish. 
Vilgefortz, with my humble help, will give you the head of Kair, son of Kialach. We know where he is, and can pluck him out like a lobster from a pot, if you wish. So, you have such capabilities. Well, well. Such good stool pigeons in Queen Maeve's army. Are you testing me? Ryan scrimmaged. You really don't know. Must be the latter. Kair, my dear Viscount, is... <laughs> we know where he is. We know where he's headed, and in what company. You want his head? You shall have it. A head, Vatier smiled, which won't be able to tell anyone what really happened on Thanet. That's probably for the best, said Ryan cynically. Why give Kair the chance to talk? Our task is to ease, not exacerbate, the animosity between Vilgefortz and the Emperor. I shall bring you the mute head of Kair ap Kialach. We'll do it in such a way that it looks like your, and only your, achievement. Delivery in the next three weeks? The ancient carp in the fish pond fanned the water with its pectoral fins. That beast, thought Vatier, must be very wise. But why does it need that wisdom? It's still the same sludge in the same water lilies. Your price, Ryons? A trifle. Where is Stefan Schelen, and what is he plotting? I told him what he wanted to know. Vatier de Rido stretched out on the pillows, playing with a ringlet of Katia van Kantin's golden hair. You see, my sweet, one has to approach some matters wisely, and to approach them wisely means to conform. If one behaves differently, one won't get anything, just the putrid water and foul-smelling sludge in the fish pond. And so what if the pond is made of marble and is three paces from the palace? Aren't I right, my sweet? Cathia van Kanten, known by the pet name of Cantarella, did not answer. Vatje in no way expected an answer. The girl was eighteen and, uh, to put it mildly, no genius. Her interests, at least for the moment, were limited to making love with, at least for the moment, Vatier. Cantarella was a natural talent in sexual matters, combining enthusiasm and wholeheartedness with technique and artistry. That was not the most important thing about her, though. Cantarella spoke little and seldom, while listening willingly and splendidly. With Cantarella, one could unload oneself, relax, spiritually unwind, and psychologically regenerate oneself. A man in this service can expect nothing but reprimands, Vatier said bitterly, just because he hasn't found some Cyril or other. And is the fact that, thanks to the work of my men, the army is achieving successes unimportant? Does the fact that the general staff knows the enemy's every move mean nothing? And how many strongholds have my agents opened for the imperial forces, which would have taken weeks to storm? But no, there is no praise for that. Only some Cyrilla or other is important. Puffing up angrily, Vatier de Rido took a glass of excellent Est Est of Toussaint from Cantarella's hands a wine with a vintage that remembered the days when Emperor Emeva Emrys was a cruelly damaged little boy, devoid of any rights to the throne, and Vatier de Rido was a young officer of the intelligence service, insignificant in the hierarchy. It had been a good year for wine. Vatier sipped it, played with Cantarella's shapely breasts, and went on. Cantarella listened splendidly. Stefan Skelen, my sweet muttered the chief of the Imperial Intelligence Service, is a wheeler, dealer, and a conspirator. But I shall know what he's up to before Ryons gets there. I already have an agent there. Very close to Skelen. Very close. Cantarella untied the sash, fastening Vatier's dressing gown, and leaned forward. Vatier felt her breath and moaned in anticipation of the pleasure. That's talent, he thought. And then the soft, hot touch of velvety lips drove all thoughts from his head. Cartier van Kanten slowly 
deftly and skillfully, supplied Vatier de Rideau, the chief of the Imperial Intelligence Service, with sexual bliss. That wasn't Cartier's only talent, but Vatier de Rideau had no idea about her others. He didn't know that, despite appearances, Cartier van Canten possessed a splendid memory and intelligence as lively as Quicksilver. Everything Vatier told her, every piece of information, every word he uttered, Katia passed on to the sorceress Azire var Anahid the next day. Yes, I would stake my head that everyone in Nilfgaard forgot about Kaia long ago, including his betrothed, if he had one. But more about that later. For now, we return to the day and place the Yoruga was crossed. We rode quite briskly eastwards, meaning to reach the region of the Black Forest known in the Elder Speech as Kaidu. For there dwelt the Druids, who were capable of divining where Ciri was residing, or foretelling her location from the weird dreams that were vexing Geralt. We rode through Upper Riverdale, also known as Left Bank, a wild and deserted land situated between the Yaruga and the slopes set at the foot of the Amel Mountains, delineated to the east by the Dol Angra Valley, and to the west by a boggy lakeland whose name has slipped my mind. No one laid any specific claim to that land, and so it was never rightly known to whom it actually belonged or who governed it. In that respect, it seems, the successive monarchs of Temeria, Sodden, Sintra and Rivia, who, with varying results, treated Left Bank as a fiefdom of their kingdoms and occasionally tried to drive home their arguments using fire and sword, had some say, and, subsequently, the Nilfgaardian army arrived from beyond the Amel Mountains and no one had anything more to say, or any doubts about issues of fiefdom or territorial rights. Everything south of the Yaruga belonged to the Empire. As I write these words, plenty of lands to the north also belong to the Empire. Owing to a lack of precise information, I do not know how many or how far to the north. Uh, going back to Riverdale, permit me, dear reader, a digression concerning historical processes. The history of a given territory is often created and formed by accident, as a side effect of the conflicts between external forces. A given land's history is very often created by foreigners. Foreigners are the cause, but the effects are always invariably borne by the local people. That rule fully applied to Riverdale. Riverdale had its own folk, indigenous Riverdellers. The unceasing years of scrambles and struggles had transformed them into beggars and forced them to migrate. Their villages and settlements had gone up in smoke, and the ruins of homesteads and fields were transformed into fallow land and swallowed up by the wilderness. Trade fell into decline, and caravans avoided the neglected roads and tracks. The few Riverdellers who remained turned into coarse boors. They mainly differed from wolverines and bears by the fact that they wore breeches. At least some of them did. I mean, some of them wore breeches, and some of them differed from the beasts. They were, generally speaking, an unobliging, crude, and boorish nation, and utterly devoid of a sense of humour. The dark-haired daughter of the forest beekeeper tossed her plait over her shoulder and resumed turning the quern with furious vigour. Dandelion's efforts were in vain, the poet's words seemed not to register with their audience. Dandelion winked at the rest of the company, pretending to sigh and raise his eyes to the ceiling. But he did not quit. Let me, he repeated, grinning, let me grind while you fetch some ale from the cellar. There must be a hidden cellar somewhere around here and a keg in the vault. Am I right, fair one? You might leave the witch alone, my lord, the forest beekeeper's wife. A tall, willowy woman of astonishing beauty said crossly as she busied herself around the kitchen. I already told thee, there ain't no ale here. You been told near a dozen times, my lord, the forest beekeeper said, backing up his wife, breaking off from his conversation with the witcher and the vampire. I shall make you pancakes with honey and then you'll eat, but leave the wench in peace to grind the corn for meal, for without meal even a sorcerer cannot make a pancake. Let her be, let her grind in peace. Did you hear that, dandelion? called the witcher 
Leave the girl alone and go and do something useful. All right, your memoirs. I fancy a drink. I fancy a drink before eating. I have some herbs. I'll brew myself an infusion. Granny, would there be any hot water in this cottage? Hot water, I'm asking. Would there be any? An old woman, the forest beekeeper's mother, sitting on the stove bench, raised her head from the sock she was darning. There would, Pat, oh, there would, she muttered. Only it'd be cold, but no. Dandelion groaned and sat down, resigned at the table, where the company was chatting with the beekeeper, whom they had happened upon in the forest early that morning. The beekeeper was short, thick-set, swarthy and terribly hairy. No wonder, then, that he had given the company a scare when he loomed out of the undergrowth unexpectedly. They had taken him for a lycanthrope. To make it funnier still, the first to yell, Werewolf! Werewolf! had been the vampire Rages. There was something of a commotion, but the matter was quickly cleared up, and the beekeeper, though at first sight surly, turned out to be hospitable and courteous. The company accepted the invitation to his homestead. His homestead, called in forest beekeeping jargon a shanty, stood in a cleared glade where the beekeeper, his mother, his wife, and their daughter lived. The latter two were women of exceptional, though somewhat curious, looks, clearly indicating that there was a dryad or hammer dryad among their forebears. During the conversations that ensued, the forest beekeeper at first gave the impression one could talk to him solely about bees. Beehives carved into trees, hollows, rope harnesses, bear fences, beeswax, honey and honey gathering. But that was just a semblance. With politics, and what should be happening with it? Same as usual. We have to pay more and more duty. Three urns of honey and an entire length of wax. I can barely supply it. I sit in my ropes from dawn to dusk, gouging out hollows. Who do I pay the duty to? To whoever calls. How am I to know who's in power now? Sometimes since, you know, they've been speaking Nilfgaardian. I hear we're now an imperial provenance or something like that. They pay for the honey, if I sell any, an imperial coin with the emperor's head stuck on it. His mush is more comely, though cruel. You'll know him right away, if you get my drift. Two dogs, one black and the other ruddy, sat facing the vampire, raised their heads and started to howl. The beekeeper's hammer-dryad wife turned back from the hearth and hit them with her broom. That'd be an evil sign, the beekeeper said, when hounds howl in broad daylight. Kind of thing... What was I supposed to be talking about? About the druids of Kaidu. Eh? So you wasn't jesting, my lord. You rightly mean about the druids? Sick of life, are you? That way is death. He who dares to venture into the mistletower's clearings is seized, shifted to a wicker doll and roasted over a slow flame. Geralt looked at Regis, and Regis winked at him. They both knew the popular rumours about the druids, and every last one was fabricated. Milva and Dandelion, though, began listening with greater curiosity than before, and evident alarm. There's some as say, the forest beekeeper continued, that the mistletowers are getting their own back, for the Nilfgaardians vexed them first by entering their holy oak groves down in Dol Angra, and by walloping the druids for no reason. Others say the druids started it, capturing and tormenting a couple of imperial men to death, and now Nilfgaard are getting their revenge. Now it rightly is, no one knows. But one thing brooks no doubt. The druids catch people, puts them in the wicker woman and burns them. To venture among them is certain death. We are not afraid, Geralt said calmly. Certainly. The forest beekeeper eyed the witcher, Milva and Kair up and down. Kair was just entering the cottage, having groomed the horses. It is evident you're fearless folk, valorous and armed. Eh? Wouldn't be no fear journeying with the likes of you, you know. But the mistletowers ain't in the Black Grove presently. Your toils and travels would be in vain. Nilfgaard pressed them, drove them from Kaidu. They ain't there presently. How so? Thus it is. The mistletowers have fled. Fled where? The forest beekeeper glanced at his hammer-dryad wife and said nothing for a moment. Fled where? The witcher repeated. The beekeeper's tabby cat sat down before the vampire and meowed frightfully. The hammer dryad hit it with her broom. It be an evil sign when a tomcat mews in broad daylight, the beekeeper mumbled, strangely embarrassed. But 
the Druids, you know, well, they fled for the slopes. Right enough, uh, I speak the truth, to the slopes. A good sixty miles south, Dandelion estimated, in quite a casual, even cheerful voice. But he fell silent when he saw the witch's expression. Only the ominous meowing of the cat, promptly driven outside, could be heard in the silence that fell. Well, the vampire began, what difference does it make to us? The next morning brought more surprises, and riddles which were quickly solved. A pox on it, said Milva, who was the first to scramble out of the hay barrack, awoken by the commotion. Well, I'll be blowed. Look at that, Geralt. The clearing was full of people. At first glance, it could be seen that five or six forest beekeeping families were gathered there. The witcher's trained eye also picked out several fur trappers and at least one tar maker. Taken together, there were twelve men, ten women, ten adolescents of both sexes, and the same number of little children. The gathering was equipped with six wagons, twelve oxen, ten cows and four goats, a fair number of sheep, and also plenty of dogs and cats, whose barking and meowing could definitely be considered a bad omen in such circumstances. I wonder, Kair said, rubbing his eyes, what this means. Trouble, Dandelion replied, shaking the hay from his hair. Rages said nothing, but wore a curious expression. Please, break your fast, noble lords, said their friend, the forest beekeeper, approaching the rick, accompanied by a broad-shouldered man. Breakfast is ready, milky porridge and honey. And if I may introduce Jan Cronin, head man of us forest beekeepers. Pleased to meet you, the witcher lied, without returning the bow, partly because his knee was paining him intensely. And this crowd, how did they get here? type of thing. The beekeeper scratched the back of his head. As you see, winter's coming. The trees have bare fences. The hollows have been gouged out. Time we return to the slopes and read Bruno. Store away the honey for winter, you know. But it is perilous to be in the forests uh, alone. The headman cleared his throat. The beekeeper glanced at Geralt's face and seemed to shrink a little. You were mounted and armed, he grunted. Valorous and bold, anyone can see it. Wouldn't be no fear travelling with the likes of you, and it would be commodious for you. We know every path, every track, every copse and hole, and we can feed you. And the druids, Gaia said coldly, have left Kaidu and headed for the slopes where you want to go. What a remarkable coincidence. Geralt walked slowly over to the forest beekeeper and grabbed him by the front of his coat, but a moment later thought better of it, released him and smoothed down his garments. He said nothing and asked nothing, but in any case the beekeeper hurried to explain. I spoke the truth, I, I swear. May the earth swallow me up if I lie. The mistletoers have gone from Kaidu. They ain't there. And they're in the slops, are they? Geralt growled. Where you are headed, you and this rabble of yours, and you want to travel with an armed escort? Speak, fellow, but take heed. The earth is indeed liable to cleave open. The beekeeper lowered his eyes and looked down apprehensively at the ground beneath his feet. Geralt kept meaningfully silent. Milva, finally understanding what it was all about, cursed foully. Gaia snorted contemptuously. Well, the witch urged. Where were the druids making for? Who knows, my lord, the beekeeper finally mumbled. But they may be in the slopes, just as well as they might be anywhere else. There's a plenitude of mighty oak groves in the slopes, and druids are fond of oaks. Aside from Headman Cronin, both Hamadryads, mother and daughter, were now standing behind the beekeeper. It's fortunate the daughter takes after her mother and not her father, the witcher thought, for the beekeeper suits his wife as well as a wild boar suits a mare. He noticed that several more women were standing behind the hammerdryads. They were much less comely, but were looking at him just as pleadingly. 
He glanced at Regis, not knowing whether to laugh or curse. The vampire shrugged. Let me start by saying, he said, that the forest beekeeper is right, Geralt. It is quite probable that the druids have gone to the slopes. It is perfectly fitting terrain for them. Is that probability? The witch's gaze was very, very cold. Sufficiently great, in your view, to prompt us to abruptly change our course and head off blindly with these folk here. Regis shrugged again. What difference does it make? Think it over. The druids are not in Kaidu, so we ought to eliminate that direction of travel. Neither can a return to the Yaruga, I adventure, be an option. And so all remaining directions are equally good. Really? The temperature of the witch's voice now equaled his gaze. And which of those that remain, in your view, would be most advisable? The one with the forest beekeepers, or a quite different one? Will you, in your infinite wisdom, undertake to stipulate that? The vampire turned slowly towards the forest beekeeper. The forest beekeeper, headman, the hammer dryads, and the other women. What is it, he asked gravely, you fear so much, good folk, that you seek an escort? What arouses this fear in you? Speak plainly. Oh, my lord, Jan Cronin whined, and the most genuine horror appeared in his eyes. I'm glad you asked. Our way goes through the dank wilderness, and it's ghastly there, my lord. There are, my lord, brocolacs, vampirodes, endirags, gryphoons, and all kind of monstrosities. Why, barely two Sundays since, a leshy snatched my son-in-law. He only managed to rasp, and that was him, dead. Do you not wonder that we're afeard to go that way with our women and bairns, eh? The vampire glanced at the witcher, and his face was very grave. My boundless wisdom, he said suggests I stipulate that the most advisable direction is whichever is most advisable for the witcher. We set off northwards, towards the slopes, a land lying at the foot of the Amel Mountains. We set off in a great procession which contained everything, young women, forest beekeepers, fur trappers, women, children, young women... Domestic livestock, household paraphernalia, and young women. And a hell of a lot of honey. Everything was sticky from the honey. Even the girls. The train moved at walking and wagon speed, but the pace of the march did not falter, for we did not stray, but marched with ease. The beekeepers knew the tracks, paths, and causeways between the lakes. But that knowledge came in useful. Oh! How it did, for it began to drizzle, and suddenly the whole of bloody Riverdale was plunged into a fog as thick as cream. Without the beekeepers, we would surely have lost our way or sunk somewhere in the mire. Neither did we have to waste time or energy organising and preparing victuals. We were fed thrice a day, amply, if simply, and were permitted to laze around for some time after each repast. In short, it was wonderful. Even the witcher, that old sourpuss and boar, began to smile and enjoy life more, for he reckoned we were covering fifteen miles a day, which we had never once managed since leaving Brokilon. The witcher had no work, for though the dank wilderness was so dank it would have been difficult to imagine anything danker, we did not encounter any monsters. Sure, at night, spectres howled a little, Forest weepers moaned and will-o'-the-wisps capered on the bogs, but nothing remarkable. It was a tiny bit worrying, in truth, that once again we were travelling in quite an accidentally chosen direction, and once again without a precisely defined destination. But, as the vampire rage is articulated, it is better to go forward without an aim than loiter without an aim, and with surety, much better than to retreat without an aim. Dandelion, strap that tube of yours on securely. It would be a shame for half a century of poetry to break free and get lost in the ferns. No fear, I shan't lose it, be certain of it, nor let anyone take it from me. 
Anyone wanting this tube will have to wrest it from my cooling corpse. Might one know, Geralt, what provokes your peals of laughter? Let me hazard a guess. Congenital imbecility? It so happened that a team of archaeologists from the University of Castel Grappion, conducting excavations in Beauclair, dug through a layer of charcoal, indicating a great fire, to an even older layer, estimated to date from the 13th century. In that layer, a cavern formed by the remains of walls and sealed by clay and lime was excavated, and in it, to the great excitement of the scholars, were two perfectly preserved human skeletons, those of a woman and a man. Beside the skeletons, apart from weapons and countless small artefacts, was a tube made of hardened leather and measuring two and a half feet long. A coat of arms with faded colours depicting lions and lozenges was embossed on the leather. Professor Schliemann, a distinguished specialist in the sigillography of the Dark Ages, who was leading the team, identified the coat of arms as the emblem of Rivia, an ancient kingdom of unconfirmed location. The archaeologists' excitement reached its peak, since manuscripts were kept in similar tubes in the Dark Ages, when the container's weight permitted the supposition that there was plenty of paper or parchment preserved inside. The tube's excellent condition offered hope that the documents would be legible and throw light on the shadowy past. The centuries were about to speak. It was an exceptional surprise, a victory of science which could not be squandered. Linguists and scholars of extinct languages were prudently summoned from Castel Grappion, along with specialists capable of opening the tube without the risk of even the slightest damage to the valuable contents. Meanwhile, rumours of treasure had spread through Professor Schliemann's team. It so happens that those words reached the ears of three characters known as Zdaib, Billy Goat and Camille Ronstetter, who'd been hired to dig out the clay. Convinced that the tube was literally stuffed full of gold and valuables, the three aforementioned diggers, under cover of darkness, swiped the priceless artifact and fled with it to the forest. Once there, they lit a small fire and sat down around it. What are you waiting for? Billy Goat said to Zdaib. Open up that pipe. Won't give, Zdaib complained to Billy Goat. It's as tight as a whole, son. Stone born a sodium bitch, Camel Ronstetter advised. The hasp of the priceless find gave way under Zdaib's heel, and the contents fell out onto the ground. Bargain a sodding bitch, Billy Goat yelled in astonishment. What is it? The question was foolish, for at first sight it could be seen they were sheets of paper, for which reason Zdaib, rather than answer, took one of the sheets and brought it up to his nose. He examined the curious-looking signs for a long while. It's writing! he finally stated authoritatively. They're letters. Letters, Camille Ronstetter roared, paling in horror. Written letters? What a bitch. Writing meaning spells, Billy Goat jabbered, his teeth chattering in terror. Letters meaning witchery. Don't touch it, son of a sodded bitch. You might catch something from it. Zedaib didn't need telling twice throwing the page onto the fire and nervously wiping his trembling hands on his breeches. Camille Ronstetter kicked the rest of the papers into the campfire. After all, children might chance upon that foul stuff. Then the three hurried away from that dangerous place. The priceless writing from the Dark Ages burned with a tall, bright flame. For a few short moments, the centuries spoke with a soft whisper of paper blackening in the fire. And then the flame went out and darkness covered the earth. Huvenagel, Dominic Bombastus, born 1239, became rich in Ebbing, conducting trade on a great scale, and settled in Nilfgaard. Respected by previous emperors, he was appointed Burgrave and Director of Mines in Venendal by Emperor Jan Calvit, and, as reward for services rendered, was given the office of Mayor of Navoigen. A faithful imperial advisor, Huvenagel had the emperor's favour and also participated in many public affairs. Died 1301. While still in Ebbing, Huvenagel was engaged in numerous charitable works, supported the needy and impoverished, and founded orphanages, hospitals and nurseries, putting up plentiful sums for them. A great enthusiast of the fine arts and sport, he founded a comedic theatre and stadium in the capital, 
both of which bore his name. He was regarded as a model of probity, honesty, and mercantile decency. Effenberg and Talbot, Encyclopedia Maxima Mundi, Volume 7 Chapter 4 Witnesses, surname, and given name. Selborne Kenner. Uh, beg pardon, I, I meant Joanna. Profession? Provider of diverse services. Is the witness jesting? May the witness be reminded that she stands before the Imperial Tribunal in a trial of high treason? The lives of many people depend on the witness's testimony, since the penalty for treason is death. May the witness be reminded that she stands before the tribunal by no means as a free agent, but having been brought from a place of isolation in the citadel, and whether the witness returns there or is discharged depends inter alia on her testimony. The tribunal has taken the liberty of this lengthy lecture in order to show the witness how highly improper buffoonery and facetiae are in this chamber. They are not merely unpalatable, but also threaten very grave consequences. The witness has a half-minute to ponder this matter, after which the tribunal shall pose the question once again. Very well, illustrious judge. Address us as your honour. Witnesses profession. I'm a psionic, your honour. But mainly in the service of the imperial intelligence. I mean, please keep your answers brief and to the point. Should the court be desirous of further explanations, we shall ask for them. The court is aware of the collaboration between the witness and the Empire's secret service. Uh, for the record, what is the meaning of the term psionic which the witness used when giving her profession? I've got pure HSP, which means first category psi, without the gift of PK. Uh, to be precise, I can hear other people's thoughts and speak remotely with a sorcerer, elf or other psionic, and I can give orders using thought. I mean, make someone do what I want them to. I can also do precog, but only when I'm under. Please enter in the proceedings that the witness, Johanna Selborn, is a psionic with the gift of hypersensory perception. She is a telepath and tele-empath, able to carry out precognition under hypnosis, but without the ability of psychokinesis. The witness is admonished that the use of magic and extrasensory powers in this chamber is strictly prohibited. We shall continue the hearing. When, where, and in what circumstances did the witness encounter the matter of the person passing herself off as Cyrilla, Princess of Sintra? I, I only found out about some Cyrilla or other when I was in the clink. I mean, in a place of isolation, illustrious tribunal. While being investigated, I was made aware it was the same person as had been called Falker or the Sintron in my hearing. And the circumstances were such that I must state the order of events. F for clarity, I mean. It was like this. I was accosted in a tavern in Etolia by Dacre Silifan, him who was sitting over there. Make note that the witness, Johanna Selborne, has indicated the accused Silifant without being prompted. Please continue. Dacre, illustrious tribunal, recruited a Hansa, uh, I mean an armed troop, valiant to a man and woman. Dufitzi Creel, Niratin Zaker, Chloe Stitz, Andres Vierney, Tilly Crada. Well, they're all dead, Your Honour. And of the ones what survived, most of them are sitting here, under guard. Please state precisely when the meeting of the witness and the accused Silifant took place. It was last year, in the month of August, somewhere near the end, I don't recall exactly. Well, not in September in any case, for that September huh, is well embedded in my memory. Dacre who'd learned about me from somewhere, said the Hansa needed a psionic, one that wasn't afraid of magic because we'd be dealing with sorcerers. The work, he said, was for the Emperor and the Empire, well paid, furthermore, and the Hansa would be commanded by none other than Tawny Owl himself. When they say Tawny Owl, does the witness have in mind Stefan Skellen, the Imperial Coroner? Yes, I do. Indeed I do. Please enter that in the proceedings. When, 
And where did the witness encounter Coroner Skellen? It was in September, on the 14th, in Fort Rocaine. Uh, Rocaine, illustrious tribunal, is a border watchtower which guards the trade route from Mecht to Ebbing, Giso and Metiner. Uh, our Hanser, numbering some 15 horse, was brought there by Dacre Silifan. So, taken together, there were 22 of us, as the others were already standing by in Rocaine, under the command of Ola Harsheim and Bert Brigden. The wooden floor boomed beneath heavy boots. Spurs jingled and metal buckles clinked. Greetings, Sir Stefan. Tawny Owl not only did not stand up, he didn't even take his feet from the table. He just waved a hand in a very lordly gesture. At last, he said curtly, you've kept me waiting a long time, Sillifant. A long time? Dacre Silifan laughed. That's rich, Sir Stefan. You gave me four Sundays to gather and bring here a good dozen of the best blades the Empire and its dominions have produced. A year would be too little for the assembling of such a Hansa, but I tossed it off in twenty-two days. That deserves praise, eh? Let's refrain from praise, Skellen said coolly, until I've seen this Hansa of yours. Why not now? Here am I, and now you're, Sir Stefan, lieutenants. Nerat and Saker and Dufitzi Creel. Hail, hail. Tawny Owl finally decided to stand up, and his adjutants also rose. Let me introduce you, gentlemen. Bert Brigden, Ola Harsheim. We know each other well. Dacre Silifant grasped Ola Harsheim's right hand firmly. We put down the rebellion in Nazair under old Braben. That was comical, eh, Ola? Eh, comical. The horses were hocked deep in blood. And Mr. Brigden, if I'm not mistaken, from Gamera? From the pacifiers? Ah, there'll be comrades in the squad. I've got a few pacifiers there. I'm getting impatient to see them, Tawny Owl interjected. May we go? A, a moment, Dacre said. Naratin, go and array the company so they look their best before the Honourable Coroner. Is it a he or a she, that Naratin Tsheka? Tawny Owl squinted, watching the officer leave. A woman or a man? Mr. Skellen? Dacre Silifant cleared his throat, but when he spoke, his voice was steady and his eyes cold. I do not know exactly. He would appear to be a man, but I'm not certain. As to what kind of officer Narat and Saker is, I'm certain. What you have deigned to ask me about would be significant were I to ask him, or her, for his or her hand. But that I do not intend. Neither do you, I expect. You are right, Skellen conceded after a moment's thought. So, there's nothing to say. Let's go and scrutinize your gang, Silifant. Niratin Seker, the individual of uncertain gender, had not wasted time. When Skellen and the officers went out into the fort's courtyard, the squad was standing in tidy array, aligned so that not a horse's muzzle extended further than a span. Tawny Owl gave a slight cough, content. A decent band, he thought. Ah, well, were it not for official policy. Ah, oh, to assemble a Hansa like that and head for the marches, to plunder, rape, murder and burn, a man would feel young again. Pshaw, oh, if it weren't for politics. Well, Sir Stefan? Dacre Silifant asked, flushing with barely concealed excitement. How do you find them, these splendid sparrowhawks of mine? Tawny Owl's eyes travelled from face to face, from figure to figure. He knew some of them personally, for better or worse. Others whose acquaintance he was now making he had heard of, by reputation. Till Echrada, a fair-haired elf, a scout of the Jamerian pacifiers. Rispat Lapointe, a sergeant from the same unit. Next, a Jamerian, Cyprian Fripp the Younger. Skelan had been present at the execution of Fripp the Older. Both brothers had been famous for their sadistic proclivities. Further away, leaning back easily in the saddle of a piebald mare, was Chloe Stitz, thief, occasionally hired and utilised by the Secret Service. Tawny Owl's eyes swiftly darted away from her insolent gaze and nasty smile. Andres Vieni, a nordling from Redania, a vicious killer. Stigward, a pirate, a renegade from Skellige. Didi Vargas, an assassin by profession, the devil only knew where he was from. Cabernic Turant, a murderer by vocation. And others, much the same. 
They're all akin, Skelen thought. A guild, a fraternity, where after killing the first five people, they all become the same. The same movements, the same gestures, the same manner of speech, of movement and dress. The same eyes, impassive and cool, flat and immobile like the eyes of a snake, whose expression, nothing, not even the most monstrous atrocity, was capable of changing. Well, Sir Stefan? Not bad. A decent Hansa, Silifant. Dacre blushed even more and saluted in the Jamerian fashion, fist pressed against his calpac. I especially requested, Skelen reminded him, several people who were no strangers to magic, who fear neither spells nor sorcerers. I remembered. Why? There's Tillicrada. And apart from him, see that tall maiden on that splendid chestnut, the one beside Chloe Stitz. Bring her to me later. Tawny Owl leaned on the balustrade and rapped on it with the metal-tipped handle of his knout. Hail, company! Hail, Lord Coroner! Many of you, Skelen began, when the echo of the gang's combined roar had died away, have worked with me before, know me and my requirements. Let them explain to those who don't know me what I expect from my subordinates and what I do not tolerate from them. Then I shan't waste my breath needlessly. This very day, some of you will receive your assignments and will ride out at dawn to execute them. In Ebbing. I remind you that Ebbing is an autonomous kingdom, and we have no formal jurisdiction there, so I order you to act prudently and discreetly. You remain in the imperial service, but I forbid you from flaunting it, boasting about it, or treating the local rulers arrogantly. You shall behave so as not to attract attention. Is that clear? Yes, sir, Lord Coroner. Here in Rocaine, you are guests and are to behave like guests. I forbid you from leaving your assigned quarters without an essential need. I forbid you from making contact with the fort's garrison. The officers will think up something so that boredom doesn't drive you to fury. Mr. Harsheim, Mr. Brigden, please show the troop their quarters. I'd barely managed to get off my mare, Your Honor, than Dacre grabs me by the sleeve. Lord Skellen, he says, wants a word with you, Kenner. What to do? Off I go. Tawny Owl's sitting behind a table, feet up, whacking his knout against his bootleg, and, without beating about the bush, asks me if I'm the Joanna Selborne who was mixed up in the disappearance of the ship, the Southern Star. I tells him nothing was ever proved. He bursts out laughing. I like people you can't pin anything on, he says. Then he asks if my HSP, hypersensory perception, I mean, is innate. When I says I, his mood darkens and he says, I thought that talent of yours would come in useful with sorcerers, but first you have to deal with another mysterious personage. Is the witness certain Coroner Skelen used those exact words? Oh, I am. I'm a psionic, ain't I? Please continue. Our conversation was interrupted by a messenger, Dusty from the road. He clearly hadn't spared his horse. He had urgent tidings for Tawny Owl, and Dacre Silliphant says, as we were heading to our quarters, that he felt in his water that the messenger's tidings would shove us in the saddle before evening came. And he was right, Your Honour. Even before anyone had thought of dinner, half the hands were saddled up. I got off that time. They took Tillicrada, the elf. I was content, for after those few days on the road, my arse ached like buggery. And to make matters worse, my monthly had just started. Will the witness please refrain from picturesque descriptions of her intimate complaints and keep to the subject? When did the witness learn the identity of the mysterious personage Corona Skelen mentioned? I'll tell you directly, but there has to be some order, don't there? For everything's getting so mixed up, we won't ever untangle it. The ones who'd saddled their mounts in such haste before dinner raced from Rockane to Malhoun and brought back some teenage lad. Nicolar was angry with himself. So angry, he felt like weeping. If only he'd heeded the warnings given him by prudent folk. If only he'd remembered his proverbs, or at least the fable about the rook that couldn't keep its trap shut. If only he'd done what was to be done and returned home to jealousy. But, oh no, excited by the adventure, proud to be in possession of a fine steed, feeling the pleasant weight of coins in his purse, Nikla couldn't resist showing off. 
Rather than going straight home to jealousy, he rode to Malhoon, where he had loads of pals, including several maids to whom he made advances. In Malhoon, he strutted around like a gander in spring, kicked up a rumpus, cavorted, showed his horse off around the courtyard, and stood rounds in the inn, tossing money on the counter with a look and bearing of, if not a prince by blood, then at least a count. And talked. Talked about what had happened four days ago in jealousy. He talked, constantly offering new versions, adding new information, confabulating, and ultimately lying through his teeth, which didn't bother his audience in the least. The inn's regulars, both locals and travellers, listened eagerly, and Nikla went on, pretending to be well-informed, and placing himself ever oftener at the centre of the confabulated events. On the third evening, his own tongue landed him in trouble. A deathly hush fell at the sight of the people entering the inn, and in that hush, the clank of spurs, the rattle of metal buckles and the scraping of scabbards sounded like a foreboding bell tolling misfortune from the top of a belfry. Nikla was not even given the chance to try playing the hero. He was seized and escorted from the inn so fast he only managed to touch the floor with his heels about three times. His pals, who only the previous day, when he was paying for their drinks, had declared their undying friendship, were now practically sticking their heads under the tables, as though incredible marvels were occurring or naked women were dancing there. Even the deputy Shire Reeve, who was present in the inn, turned to face the wall and didn't breathe a word. Nikla didn't breathe a word either, not asking who, what or why. Terror turned his tongue into a stiff, dry board. They put him on his horse and ordered him to ride. For several hours. Then there was a fort with a palisade and a tower. The courtyard was full of noisy, swaggering, well-armed mercenaries. And a chamber. And in the chamber were three men. A commander and two subordinates, it was immediately obvious. The commander, short with blackish hair and richly attired, was sober in his speech and admirably courteous. Nikla listened with mouth agape as the commander apologised to him for the trouble and inconvenience and assured him he would suffer no harm. But he was not to be deceived. The men reminded him too much of Bonhart. That observation turned out to be astonishingly accurate, for they were interested in Bonhart. Nikla should have expected that, for, after all, it was his wagging tongue that had landed him in this quandary. When prompted, he began to talk. He was warned to speak the truth and not embellish it. He was warned courteously, but sternly and emphatically, and the one doing the warning, the richly attired one, played all the while with a metal-tipped knout, and his eyes were dark and evil. Nikla, the son of the coffin-maker from Jealousy, told the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, about how on the morning of the 9th of September in the village of Jealousy, Bonhart, a bounty hunter, had wiped out the gang of rats, sparing the life of only one bandit, the youngest, the one they called Falker. He told them how the whole of jealousy had gathered to watch Bonhart torment and thrash his captive, but the folk were sorely disappointed, for Bonhart, astonishingly, did not kill or even torture Falker. He did no more than what a normal fellow does to his wife on returning home from the tavern on Saturday evening just gave her a kicking, slapped her a few times and nothing more. The richly attired gentleman with the knout said nothing, and Nikla told them how Bonnart had sawn the heads off the slaughtered rats before Falker's eyes and plucked the golden earrings set with gemstones from those heads like raisins from a bun. How Falker, tied to the hitching post, screamed and puked on seeing it. He told how afterwards Bonnart had buckled a collar around Falker's neck, like you would a bitch dog, and dragged her by it to the Chimera's head in. And then... And then, said the lad, constantly licking his lips, the general and Bonhart called for ale, for he was sweating something awful, and his throat was dry. And after that, he cried that he had a fancy to give someone a good horse, and a whole five florins. That's what he said. Those were his very words. So I came forward at once, not waiting for anyone else to be quicker, for I wanted awful to have a horse and a little coin of my own. The old man gives me nothing, for he drinks whatever he makes on the coffins. So I comes forward and asks which horse, no doubt one of the rats, can I take? 
and his lordship Bonhart looks at me till shivers ran through me and says, don't he, that the only thing I can take is a kick up the backside, for other things have to be earned. What to do? Don't look a gift horse in the mouth, says the proverb. Well, the rats as horses were standing at the etching post, in particular that black mare of Fulkers, a horse of rare beauty. So, I bows and asks what must I do to earn the gift. And Mr Bonhart says that I must ride to Claremont, stopping off in Fano on the way, on the horse of my choosing. He must have known I had my eye on the black mare, for he forbade me from taking her. So I takes a chestnut with a white patch, less about horses' coats, Stefan Skellen reprimanded dryly, and more hard facts. Tell us what Bonhart charged you to do. His lordship Bonhart wrote some missives and ordered me to hide them secure. He charged me to ride to Fano and Claremont, and there to hand over the letters to the indicated persons. Letters? What was in them? How should I know, gentle lord? Reading don't come easy to me, and the letters were sealed with Mr. Bonhart's signet. But for whom were the letters, do you recall? Oh, indeed I do. Mr. Bonhart ordered me to repeat it ten times, so I wouldn't forget. I got where I was to go without airing and handed over the missives as instructed. They praised me for an able lad, and that honourable merchant even gave me a dinar. To whom did you deliver the letters? Speak plainly. The first missive was for Master Esterhazy, a swordsmith and armourer from Fano, and the second was for the Honourable Uvenagel, a merchant from Claremont. Did they open the letters in your presence? Perhaps one of them said something as he read. Rack your brains, lad. I cannot recall. I didn't mark it then, and now I can't seem to remember. Man? Ola? Skelen nodded at the adjutants without raising his voice at all. Take the lad into the courtyard, drop his breeches, and give him thirty solid lashes with a nut. I remember, the boy yelled. He's come back to me. Nothing works on the memory, Tony Owl grinned, like nuts and honey, or a nut hovering over the ass. Talk. When Hoovenagel read the missive in Claremont, there was another gentleman there, a little chap, a veritable halfling. Mr. Hoovenagel said to him, um, he said they'd written that soon there might be sport in the flea pit, the like of which the world had never seen. That's what he said. You aren't making this up. I swear on my mother's grave. Don't have them flog me, gentle lord. Have mercy. Well, well, get up. Don't dribble on my boots. Here's a dinar. A thousand thanks. M my lord, I said, don't dribble on my boots. Ola, man, do you understand anything of this? What does a flea pit have in common with bear pit? Boreas Mun suddenly said. Not flea pit, bear pit. Aye, the boy yelled. That's what he said, just as though you'd been there, gentle lord. A bear pit and sport. Ola Harsheim hit one fist against the other. It's an agreed code, nothing too elaborate. It's easy. Sport, bear baiting, is a warning about a pursuit or a manhunt. Bonart was warning them to flee. But from whom? From us? Who knows? said Tony Owl pensively. Who knows? We shall have to send men to Claremont, and to Fano also. You take care of that, Ola. Give the squads their orders. Now... Listen, my lad. Uh, yes, sir, gentle lord. When you left jealousy with Bonnard's letters, he was still there, I understand. And making ready to leave? Was he in haste? Did he say, perhaps, whither he was headed? He did not, and neither could he make ready. He'd had his raiment, which was awful blood-spattered, cleaned and laundered, so he was only in a blouse and hose, but girt with a sword, though I think he was hastening to leave. Why? He had thrashed the rats and sawed them's heads off for the bounty, so he needs must ride and claim it. And why he'd captured that falker too to deliver her a lie to someone. Why, that's his profession, ain't it? This falker? Did you have a good look at her? Why are you cackling, you ass? Oh, gentle lord, have a good look at her. I'll say I did every detail. This rob. Bonhart repeated, and there was something in his voice that made Siri cringe involuntarily, but defiance immediately got the better of her. No! She didn't see the fist. She didn't even catch sight of its movement. 
She saw stars, the ground swayed, then shot from under her feet and suddenly thumped painfully against her hip. Her cheek and ear burned like fire. She realized she had not been punched, but struck with an open palm. He stood over her and brought his clenched fist towards her face. She saw the heavy, skull-shaped signet, which a moment earlier had stung her face like a hornet. You owe me one front tooth, he said icily. So, the next time I hear the word no from you, I'll knock two out right away. Get undressed. She stood up unsteadily and began to unfasten buckles and buttons with shaking hands. The villagers present in the chimera's head murmured, coughed, and goggled. The widow Gulu, the alewife, bent down behind the counter, pretending to be looking for something. Strip off everything to the last rag. They aren't here, she thought, undressing and staring blankly at the floor. There's no one here, and I'm not here either. Legs apart. I'm not here at all. What is about to happen won't touch me at all. Not at all, not a bit. Bonhart laughed. You flatter yourself, I think. I must dispel those illusions. I'm undressing you, little idiot, to check you haven't concealed any magical talismans, charms, or amulets about your person, not to enjoy your wretched nakedness. Don't start imagining the devil knows what. You're a skinny kid, as flat as a pancake and as ugly as the seven sins. Even if the urge was strong, I'd sooner top a turkey. He walked over, spread her clothing around with the tip of his boot, and sized it up. I said everything. Earrings, rings, necklace, bracelet. He gathered up her jewellery meticulously. He kicked a tunic with a blue fox fur collar, gloves, coloured scarves and belt with silver chains into the corner. You won't parade around like a parrot or a half-elf from a whorehouse now. You can put on the rest of those rags. And what are you lot staring at? Gulu, bring some provender. I'm hungry. And you, fatso, see how my vestments are coming on. I am the elder man here. How convenient, Bonhart drawled and the elder man of jealousy seemed to grow slimmer under his gaze. If anything has been damaged in the laundry, I shall take measures against you as a public servant. Off to the wash house. The rest of you, get out. And you, pipsqueak, why are you still standing here? You have the letters, the horses saddled, so smartly to the highway and be gone. And remember, should you fail, lose the letters or mix up the addresses, I shall find you, and cut you up so fine your own mother wouldn't recognize you. I'm flying, my lord, I'm flying. That day, Siri pursed her lips. He beat me twice more, once with his fist and once with a knout. Then he lost the urge. He just sat and stared at me without a word. His eyes were somehow like those of a fish, without eyebrows, without eyelashes, somehow like watery orbs with a black core sunk into each one. He stared hard at me and said nothing. That terrified me more than being beaten. I didn't know what he was plotting. Visigotta remained silent. Mice scampered around the chamber. He kept asking me who I was, but I said nothing. Just like when the trappers caught me in Korath Desert, this time too I fled deep into myself, inside, if you know what I mean. The trappers said I was a doll then, and I was. A wooden doll, insensitive and lifeless. I was somehow looking down from above at everything that was being done to that doll. So what if they were hitting me? So what if they were kicking me, putting a collar on me like a dog? For it wasn't me. It wasn't me at all. Do you understand? I do. Visigotta nodded. I do understand, Siri.
Then, Your Honour, it was our turn. The turn of our group, Naratid Saker, took command over us, and they also assigned Boreas Mun a tracker to us. Boreas Mun, illustrious tribunal, could track a fish in water, they say. That's how good he was. One time, they say, Boreas Mun, the witness will refrain from digressions. Beg pardon? Uh, oh, yes, I, I get it. I, I mean, they ordered us to ride to Fano at all speed. It was the morning of the 16th of September. Niratin Seika and Boreas Mun rode at the head, and behind them, side by side, Cabernic Turon and Cyprian Fripp the Younger, then Kenna Selborne and Chloe Stitz, and finally Andres Vierni and Didi Vargas. The latter two were singing a new and popular soldier song, sponsored and endorsed by the Ministry of War, even among soldier songs, it stood out by the horrifying paucity of its rhymes and alarming lack of respect for grammatical rules. It was entitled At War, since all the verses, and there were over forty of them, began with those words. At war, things can get quite rough. Someone gets their head chopped off. You come back from a drinking bout to see a cove with his guts hanging out. Kenner softly whistled along. She was pleased to be among companions she had come to know well on the long journey from Etolia to Rocaine. After her conversation with Tornial, she had expected a random assignment, to be tagged onto a squad made up of Brigden and Harsheim's men. Till Ekrada had been assigned to a squad like that, but the elf knew most of his new comrades, and they knew him. They rode at a walk, though Dacre Siliphant had ordered them to race at full speed, but they were professionals. They had galloped, kicking up dust, while they could still be seen from the fort. Then they'd slowed down. Tiring horses out and reckless gallops were good for tyros and amateurs, and haste, of course, only comes in useful for catching fleas. Chloe Stitz, the professional thief from Imlac, told Kenner about her erstwhile work with coroner Stefan Skellen. Cabernet Turon and Fripp the Younger reined in their horses and listened, often looking back. I know him well. I've served under him several times. Chloe stammered a little, aware of the suggestive nature of her words, but immediately laughed freely and carelessly. I've also served under his command, she snorted. No, Kenna, don't worry. None of those demands from Tony Al. He didn't force himself on me. I looked for the opportunity and found it. But to be clear, I'll say this. You won't gain his protection by doing that. I'm not planning anything of the kind. Kenna pouted, looking provocatively at the lewd smiles of Turon and Fripp. I won't be looking for an opportunity, but I'm not worried either. I'm not alarmed by any old thing, and certainly not by a cock. Now it's all you talk about, Boreas Munn said, reining back his dun stallion and waiting for Kenna and Chloe to catch up with him. We aren't riding off to fight with our cocks, ladies, he added, continuing to ride beside the young women. Bonnar, let me tell you, has few equals with the sword. I'll be glad if it turns out there's no squabble or vendetta between him and Mr. Skellen, and that everything blows over. But I don't get it, Andres Vierney admitted from the rear. Apparently, we were to track down some sorcerer. That's why they gave us a psionic, this here Kenna, wasn't it? Now, though, there's talk about some Bonnard and a girl. Bonnard, the bounty hunter, Boreas Munn said, had a compact with Mr. Skellen and let him down. Though he promised Mr. Skellane he'd kill that girl, he let her live. No doubt someone's paying more for her alive than Tony Owl would for her dead. Chloe Stitz shrugged. That's what bounty hunters are like. Don't go looking for honour among them. Bonnard is different, Fripp the Younger, looking back, retorted. Bonnard never breaks his word, making it all the stranger that he suddenly started. And why? Kenner asked. Is that last so prized? The one that was to be killed, but wasn't. What business is he of ours? Boreas Munn grimaced. We have our orders, and Mr. Skellane has the right to demand his due. Bonnard was meant to have stuck Falca and didn't. Mr. Skellane has the right to demand that he accounts for it. This Bonnard, Chloe Stitz repeated with conviction, means to get more money for her alive than dead. There's your whole mystery. The Lord Coroner, Boreas Munn said. Thought the same at first, that Bonnard had promised to supply Falker alive for the sake of amusement and slow torture to a baron from Giso who was determined to punish the rat's gang. But it turned out not to be true. No one knows who Bonnard is keeping Falker alive for, but he certainly ain't that baron.
Mr. Bonar? The fat yelderman of jealousy lumbered into the tavern, puffing and panting. Mr. Bonar, there are armed men in the village, riding horses. What a sensation. Bonard wiped his plate with some bread. Now, if they were riding monkeys, that would be remarkable. How many? Four. And where are my vestments? Barely laundered. They haven't dried. A pox on you. I'll have to greet our guests in my halls. But in truth, the quality of such a greeting suits that of the guests. He adjusted the belt and sword fastened over his hose, tucked the straps of his hose into his boot tops, and tugged the chain attached to Siri's collar. On your feet, little rat. When he led her out onto the porch, the four horsemen were already nearing the tavern. It was clear that they had ridden long over trackless terrain and through bad weather. Their clothing, harnesses and horses were flecked with crusted on dust and mud. There were four of them, but they were leading a riderless horse. At the sight of it, Siri felt herself suddenly growing hot, though the day was very cool. It was her own, still bearing her trappings and saddle, and a brow band, a gift from Missile. The horsemen were among those who had killed Hotspurn. They stopped outside the tavern. One, probably the leader, rode up and raised his marten fur calpac to Bonnard. He was swarthy and had a thin black moustache on his upper lip, like a line drawn in charcoal. His upper lip, Siri noticed, curled every now and then. The tick meant he looked enraged the whole time. Perhaps he really was furious. Greetings, Mr. Bonnard. Greetings, Mr. Imbra. Greetings, gentlemen. Bonnard unhurriedly fastened Siri's chain onto a hook on a post. Excuse my unmentionables, but I wasn't expecting you. A long road behind you, my, my. You've come all the way to Ebbing from Giso. And how is the honorable baron? In good health? Fit as a fiddle, the swarthy man replied indifferently, wrinkling his upper lip again. But there's no time to spend on idle chatter. We're in a hurry. I? Bonnard hauled up his belt and hose. I'm not holding you back. News has reached us that you slaughtered the rats. That is true. And in accordance with your promise to the baron, the swarthy man continued to pretend he could not see Siri on the porch. You took Falca alive. I'd say that that is also true. You were lucky where we were not. The swarthy man glanced at their own. Very well. We'll take the wench and head homeward. Rupert, Stavro, take her. Not so fast, Imbra. Bonnard raised a hand. You aren't taking anyone. And for the simple reason that I won't give her to you. I've changed my mind. I'm keeping the girl. The swarthy man called Imbra leaned over in the saddle, hawked and spat impressively far, almost to the steps of the porch. But you promised his lordship the baron. I did, but I've changed my mind. What? Do my ears deceive me? The state of your ears, Imbra, is not my concern. You stayed three days at the castle. You guzzled and gorged for three days on the promises given to his lordship. The best wine from his cellar, roast peacock, venison, forcemeat, carp in cream. You slept like a king in a feather bed for three nights, and now you've changed your mind? Bonnard said nothing, maintaining an expression of indifference and boredom. Imbra clenched his teeth in order to suppress the twitching of his lips. You know, Bonnard, that we can not take her from you by force. Bonnard's face, until that moment, bored and amused, hardened instantly. Just try. There are four of you and one of me, and me in my hose at that. But I don't have to don breeches to deal with scoundrels like you. Imbra spat again, jerked his reins, and turned his horse around. The devil take it, Bonnard. What's happened to you? You've always been renowned as a reliable, honest professional. Once given, you keep your word unfailingly, and now it turns out your word isn't worth shit. And since a man is judged by his words, then it turns out that you're a... If the talk is of words... Bonnard interrupted coldly, resting his hands on his belt buckle. Then take heed, Imbra, that you don't let too coarse a word slip out by accident. For it might hurt when I shove it back down your throat. You are bold against four. 
that will your boldness suffice against fourteen, for the Baron of Cassaday will not let this insult slide. I tell you what I'll do with your Baron, but the crowd forms, and in it are women and children. So I shall merely tell you that in some ten days I shall stop in Claremont. Whomsoever wishes to pursue a right, avenge an insult, or take Falca from me, let them come to Claremont. I shall be there. I shall be waiting. Now, be off with you. They feared him. They feared him terribly. I could feel the fear seeping from them. Kelpie whinnied loudly, jerking her head. There were four of them, armed to the teeth, and one of him in darned long johns and a ragged old blouse with two short sleeves. He would have been ridiculous were he... were he not so terrible. Visigotha remained silent, narrowing his eyes, which were watering from the wind. They were standing on a knoll, rising above the Periplut marshes, not far from the spot where two weeks earlier the old man had found Siri. The wind flattened the reeds and ruffled the water on the marshes. One of the four, Siri continued, letting her mare enter the water and drink, had a small crossbow by his saddle, and his hand stretched out towards that crossbow. I could almost hear his thoughts and feel his terror. Will I manage to cock it and loose it, and what will happen if I miss? Bonhart also saw that crossbow on that hand. He heard the same thoughts, I'm sure and I'm sure the horseman wouldn't have been quick enough. Kelpie raised her head, snorted and jingled the rings of her curb bit. I was understanding better and better into whose hands I'd fallen. But I still couldn't understand his motives. I'd heard their conversation and remembered what Hotspurn had said before, that the Baron of Cassidy wanted me alive and Bonhart had promised him that. And then he changed his mind. Why? Did he want to hand me over to somebody else who would pay more? Had he worked out who I really was and meant to turn me over to the Nilf Guardians? We set off from the village before nightfall. He let me ride, Kelpie, but he tied my hands and held me by the chain fixed to the collar the whole time. The whole time. And we rode almost without stopping a whole night and day. I thought I'd die of exhaustion, but he showed no tiredness at all. He isn't a man. He's the devil incarnate. Where did he take you? To a little town called Fano. When we entered Fano, illustrious tribunal, it, it was already gloomy. Murky as you please. Only the 16th of September in truth. But the day was overcast and cold as hell. You'd have said it was November. We didn't have to search long for the armourer's workshop, for it was the largest farmstead in the entire town. And what's more, the, the ringing of hammers forging iron relentlessly sounded from it. Naratin Saker, at mass describe, you write his name in vain, for I don't recall if I said, but Naratin is dead now, killed in a village called Unicorn. Uh, please do not instruct the clock. Continue with your testimony. Naratin knocked at the gate. He politely said who we were and what was our business and asked politely to be heard. We were admitted. The swordsmith's workshop was a fine building, virtually a stronghold, with a palisade of pine timbers, towers of oaken planks, and inside, plain larch on the walls. The court is not interested in architectural details. Let the witness get to the point. Prior to that, however, please repeat the swordsmith's name for the records. Esther Harsey, illustrious tribunal. Esther Harsey of Fano. The swordsmith, Esterhazy, looked long at Boreo's man, unhurriedly answering the question posed to him. Perhaps Bonnard was here, he finally said, fiddling with the bone whistle hanging around his neck. And perhaps he wasn't. Who knows? This gentlefolk is a workshop where we forge swords. We shall answer any questions concerning swords eagerly, swiftly, elegantly, and at length. But I see no reason to answer questions concerning our guests or customers. Kenna pulled a kerchief from her sleeve and pretended to wipe her nose. A reason can be found, said Naratid Seker. You may find one, Mr. Estahazi, or I may. Would you choose? In spite of the semblance of effeminacy, 
Neratin's face could become hard and his voice menacing. But the swordsmith only snorted, continuing to toy with the whistle. Choose between a bribe and a threat? I would not. I consider the former and the latter worth only of being spat on. Just one tiny piece of information, Boreas Munn said, clearing his throat. Is that so much? We've known each other long, Mr. Esterhazy, and Coroner Skellen's name is known to you. It is, the swordsmith cut in. It is indeed. The misdemeanours and exploits with which that name is associated are also known to us. But we are in Ebbing, an autonomous and self-governing kingdom, only seemingly, perhaps, but nonetheless. Thus we shall tell you nothing. Continue on your way. As a consolation, we'll pledge to you that if in a week or a month someone asks about you, they will hear just as little. Well, Mr. Esterhazy, must I make it clearer? Prithee, get out of here. Chloe Stitz hissed furiously. Fripp and Vargas's hands crept towards their hilts, and Andres Vieni laid his fist on the warhammer hanging at his thigh. Nuratin Seca did not move, and his face did not even quiver. Kenner saw that his eye never left the bone whistle. Before they entered, Boreas Munn had warned them that the sound of the whistle was the signal for bodyguards, consummate men-at-arms, called quality controllers, who were waiting concealed in the swordsmith's workshop. But having foreseen everything, Neratin and Boreas had planned their next move. They had a trump up their sleeves. Kenner Selborne, psionic. Kenner had already probed the swordsmith's mind, had gently pricked him with impulses and cautiously pervaded the tangle of his thoughts. Now she was ready. Pressing a kerchief to her nose, there always existed the danger of a nosebleed, she forced her way into his brain with a throbbing and a command. Esterhazy began to choke, flushed, and grasped the table he was sitting behind with both hands, as though he feared it would float away to distant lands, along with the sheaf of invoices, the inkwell and the paperweight, depicting a nereid cavorting with two tritons at once. Keep calm, Kenna commanded. It's nothing. Nothing's the matter. You would simply like to tell us what we wish to know, for you know what interests us, and the words are positively bursting forth from you. So, go on, begin. You will see that you only need speak, and the humming in your head, the roaring in your temples, and the stabbing in your ears will cease, and the spasm in your jaw will also subside. Why not? Esterhazy said hoarsely, opening his mouth more often than would be expected from the syllabic articulation. Was it four days ago, on the 12th of September? He had a wench with him he called Falker. I was expecting his visit for two days earlier. A letter from him had been delivered. A trickle of blood seeped from his left nostril. Speak, Kenner ordered. Speak, tell us everything. You can see what a relief it will be. The swordsmith Esterhazy scrutinized Siri with curiosity, without getting up from the oaken table. It's for her, he guessed, tapping a penholder against the paperweight depicting the weird group. The sword you requested in the letter, right, Barnard? Well, let's examine it then. Let's see if it agrees with what you wrote. Five feet nine inches in height? And such she is. One hundred and twelve pounds in weight? Well, we'd have given her less than a hundred and twelve, but that's a minor detail. A hand, you wrote, which a number five glove would fit. Show me your hand, honourable maiden. Well, and that agrees too. With me, everything always agrees, Bonnard said dryly. Do you have any decent iron for her? In my firm, Esterhazy answered proudly, no other iron than decent is manufactured or offered. I understood it was to be a sword for combat, not for gala decoration. Ah, uh, yes, you wrote that. Naturally, a weapon will be found for this maid without any difficulty. Swords of thirty-eight inches suit such a height and weight standard manufacture, with that light build and small hand, she needs a mini bastard with a hilt lengthened to nine inches and a pommel. We could also suggest an elven Taldaga or Zeracanian Sabre, or alternatively a light Viroladanian. Show me the wares, Esterhazy. 
hot-tempered, are we? Well, come this way, come this way. Hey, Bonnard, what the devil is this? Why are you pulling her on a leash? Keep your snotty nose out of this, Esther Harzi. Don't stick it where it doesn't belong, for you're liable to get it caught somewhere. Esther Harzi, toying with the whistle hanging around his neck, looked at the hunter without fear or respect, though he had to crane his neck a good deal. Bonnard twisted his moustache and cleared his throat. I, he said, a little more quietly, though still malevolently, don't meddle in your business or affairs. Does it surprise you that I demand reciprocity? Bonnard? The swordsmith did not even flicker an eyelid. When you leave my home and courtyard, when you close my gate behind you, then I shall respect your privacy, the secrecy of your affairs, the specifics of your profession, and I shall not meddle in them, be certain. But in my home, I shall not allow you to abuse human dignity. Do you understand me? Outside my gate, you may drag the wench behind a horse if you wish. In my home, you will remove that collar, forthwith. Bonnard reached for the collar and unfastened it, unable to resist a tug which almost brought Siri to her knees. Esterhazy, pretending he hadn't seen it, let the whistle slip from his fingers. That's better, he said dryly. Let's go. They crossed a small passage into another slightly smaller courtyard, adjoining the rear of the smithy, with one side opening out onto an orchard. There was a long table there, beneath a canopy resting on carved posts, where servants were just finishing laying out some swords. Esterhazy gestured for Bonnart and Siri to walk up to the array. This is what I offer. They approached. Here, Esterhazy pointed to a long row of swords on the table. We have my wares. All the blades were forged here. You can see the horseshoe, my punch mark. Prices fall in the range of five to nine florins, since they're standard. These, though, lying here, are only assembled and finished by us. The blades are generally imported. Their origin can be told from the punches. The ones from Mahakam have crossed hammers stamped on them. Those from Povis, a crown or a horse's head. And those from Viraleda, a sun and the famous workshop's inscription. Prices start at ten florins. And where do they end? That varies. Oh, this one, for example, is an exquisite Viraleidanian. Esterhazy took up a sword from the table, gave a salute with it, and then moved to a fencing position, dexterously twisting his hand and forearm in a complicated sequence called an angelica. Uh, this one is fifteen. Antique workmanship, a collector's blade, clearly made to order. The motif chiselled on the ricasso shows the weapon was intended for a woman. He turned the sword over, hand held in tierce, pointing the blade flat at them. As on all Viraleda blades, the traditional inscription, Draw me not without reason, sheathe me not without honour. Ha! They still chisel such inscriptions in Viraleda. Throughout the wide world, these blades have been drawn by blackguards and elves. Throughout the wide world, honour has gone way down in price, for it's an unprofitable commodity. Don't talk so much, Esterhazy. Give her that sword. Let her try it for size. Take the blade, girl. Siri grasped the sword lightly, feeling the lizard skin hilt cling firmly to her palm and the weight of the blade urging her arm to wield and thrust. It's a mini bastard, Esterhazy reminded her needlessly. She knew how to use the long hilt with three fingers on the pommel. Bonnart took two steps backward into the courtyard. He drew his sword from the scabbard and whirled it around until it hissed. Have at me, he said to Siri. Kill me. You have a sword and you have the opportunity. You have the chance. Make use of it, for I shan't soon give you a second. Have you lost your mind? Quiet, Esterhazy. She beguiled him with a glance to one side and a deceptive twitch of her shoulder and struck like lightning with a flat sinistra. The blade clanged so powerfully against the parry that Siri staggered and had to leap to one side, banging her hip against the table with the swords. She involuntarily loosened her grip on the weapon, trying to regain her balance, knowing that at that moment he could have killed her without the slightest difficulty, had he so wished. You have lost your minds, Esterhazy said. His voice raised. The whistle was in his hand again. The servants and craftsmen looked on in stupefaction. Put the iron aside. Bonnard did not take his eyes off Siri, utterly ignoring the swordsmith. Aside, I said, or I'll hack off your hand. 
She obeyed after a moment's hesitation. Bonnard smiled ghoulishly. I know who you are, you viper, but I'll make you reveal it yourself. By word or deed, I'll make you reveal who you are, and then I'll kill you. Esterhazy hissed as though wounded. That sword, Bonnard didn't even glance at him, was too hefty for you, and because of it you were too slow. You were as slow as a pregnant snail. Esterhazy, what you gave her was too heavy by at least four ounces. The swordsmith was pale. His eyes ran from her to him, from him to her, and his face was strangely altered. At last he beckoned a servant and issued an order in hushed tones. I've something, he said slowly, which ought to satisfy you, Bonnard. Why then didn't you show it to me at once, snarled the hunter. I wrote that I wanted something extraordinary. Perhaps you thought I can't afford a better sword. I know what you can afford, Esterhazy said with emphasis. I've known that for no little time. But why didn't I show you this one right away? I had no way of knowing who you would bring here, on a leash with a collar around her neck. I couldn't guess who the sword was meant for and what it was to serve. Now I do. The servant had returned, bearing an oblong box. Come closer, girl, Esterhazy said softly. Look. Siri approached and looked and sighed audibly. She unsheathed the sword with a deft movement. The fire from the hearth flared blindingly on the blade's wavily outlined edge, glowed red in the openwork of the ricasso. This is it, said Siri. As you've probably guessed, Hold it if you wish, but beware, it's sharper than a razor. You feel how the hilt sticks to your hand? It's made from the skin of a flatfish, which has a venomous spine on its tail. A, a ray? I guess. That fish has tiny teeth in its skin, so the hilt doesn't slide in the hand, even when it sweats. Look what's etched on the blade. Visagotta leaned over and examined it, squinting. An elven mandala, he said soon after, raising his head. The so-called Blathan Kirm, or Garland of Destiny. Stylized oak blossom, bridewort, and broom flowers. A tower being struck by lightning, a symbol of chaos and destruction for the old races. And above the tower, a swallow, Siri completed. Zirail, my name. Indeed, a fine thing, said Bonnard finally. Gnomish had the work, that's clear at once. Only the gnomes forged such dark iron. Only the gnomes used undulating blades, and only they open-worked their blades to reduce the weight. Come clean, Esterhazy. Is it a replica? No, the swordsmith snapped. It's original, a genuine gnomish guire. The blade is more than two hundred years old. The finishing, naturally, is much more recent, but I wouldn't call it a replica. The gnomes of Tir Tocher made it to my order, following ancient techniques, methods, and patterns. Damn it, it may be too dear for me after all. How much do you wish for this blade? Esterhazy was silent for some time. His face was inscrutable. I shall give it to her for nothing, Bonnard, he finally said in a hushed voice as a gift, so that what is to come about will come about. Thank you, said Bonnard, visibly astonished. Thank you, Estazi. A kingly gift, kingly indeed. I accept, I accept. I am indebted to you. You are not. The sword is for her, not for you. Come here, girl with a collar on her neck. Examine the marks etched into the blade. You don't understand them, naturally, but I shall explain them to you. Look, the line delineated by destiny is winding, but leads to this tower. Towards annihilation. Towards the destruction of established values of the established order. But there, above the tower, do you see? A swallow, the symbol of hope. Take this sword. 
and may what is to come about, come about. Siri cautiously extended a hand and gently stroked the dark blade, its edge gleaming like a mirror. Take it, Esterhazy said slowly, looking at Siri with eyes wide open. Take it. Hold it, girl. Take it. No, Bonnard suddenly barked, leaping up, seizing Siri by the arm and shoving her suddenly and forcefully. Away! Siri fell onto her knees, the gravel of the courtyard painfully pricking her hands, which she had to spread to keep her balance. Bonnard slammed the box shut. Not yet, he snarled. Not today. The time is not yet come. Most evidently. Esterhazy nodded calmly, looking him in the eyes. Aye, it most evidently hasn't come yet. Pity. It was of little avail, illustrious tribunal, reading that swordsmith's thoughts. We were there on the 16th of September, three days before the full moon. And while we were returning from Fano to Rockane, a patrol caught us up. Ola Harsheim and seven horse. Mr. Harsheim ordered us to race as fast as we could to reach the rest of the unit. For the day before, the 15th of September, there had been a massacre in Clermont. I suppose I don't need to tell you. The illustrious tribunal doubtlessly knows about the massacre in Clermont. Please testify without worrying what the tribunal knows. Bonnart was a day ahead of us. He brought Falca to Clermont on the 15th of September. Clermont? Visegotta nodded. I know that town. Where did he take you? To a large house in the town square, with arcades and columns at the entrance. It was obvious at once that a wealthy man lived there. The chamber's walls were draped with sumptuous tapestries and splendid wall hangings depicting religious and hunting scenes and idyls featuring disrobed women. The furniture gleamed with inlays and brass fittings, and one sunk ankle-deep into the carpets. Siri had no time to note the details, though, for Bonnart walked swiftly, dragging her by the chain. Greetings, Hovenhagel. Lit by the spectrum of colours cast by a stained-glass window, his back to a hunting tapestry stood a man of impressive corpulence, attired in a caftan dripping with gold and a fur-lined coat trimmed with caracul pelts. Although in the prime of his manhood, he had a bald pate and pendulous jowls like those of a great bulldog. Greetings, Leo, he said. And you, lady? That's no lady. Bonnard showed him the chain and collar. No need to welcome her. Politeness costs nothing. Nothing but time. Bonnard tugged the chain, walked up and unceremoniously patted the fat man's belly. You've put on a good deal, he remarked. By my troth, Hovenagel, were you to stand in the way, it would be easier to jump over you than walk around. Prosperity, Hovenagel explained jovially, shaking his cheeks. Greetings to you, greetings, Leo. It is wonderful to host you, for I am most inordinate joyful today. My business affairs are going so admirably well that I feel like touching wood. The tills are ringing. Only today, may this serve as an example, a captain in the Nilfgaardian Reserve Horse, the quartermaster responsible for supplying gear to the front, flogged me six thousand military bows, which I shall retail with a tenfold profit to hunters, poachers, brigands, elves, and divers other freedom fighters. I also bought a castle from a local marquis. Why the hell do you need a castle? I must live regally. Getting back to my business affairs, one deal is quite simply thanks to you, Leo. The seemingly hopeless debtor paid me back, quite literally a moment ago. His hands were shaking as he paid me. The fellow saw you and thought, I know what he thought. Did you receive my letter? I did. Hoovenogel flopped down heavily, knocking the table with his belly and making the carafes and goblets on it ring. And I've prepared everything. Haven't you seen the handbills? The rabble must have torn them down. Folk are already heading for the theatre. 
The tills are ringing. Sit you down, Leo. Less time. Let's talk. Enjoy some wine. I don't want your wine. It's army issue, no doubt, stolen from Nilfgaardian transports. You must be jesting. It's Est Est from Toussaint. The grapes picked when our gracious emperor, Emir, was a mere nipper, sitting in his cradle. It was a good year for wine. Cheers, Lear. Bonnard silently raised a toasting goblet. Huvenagel smacked his lips, examining Siri extremely critically. So, this is the doe-eyed nymph he said at last. Who is to guarantee the sport promised in your epistle? I know that Windsor Imbra is already nearing the town and has with him several decent cutthroats, and a few local swordsmen have seen the bills. Have you ever been disappointed by my wares, Huvenagel? Never, tis true, but neither have I had anything from you for a good while. I work more seldom than in the past. I'm thinking about retiring entirely. Capital is needed for that, from which to support oneself. I might have a way. Will you listen? Only for want of other amusement. Bonnard pulled a chair closer with his foot and made Siri sit down. Have you ever thought of heading north, to Sintra, to the slopes, or across the Yaruga? Do you know that anyone who moves there and chooses to settle on captured territory is guaranteed a plot of eight ox gangs by the Empire and freedom from tax for a decade? I, replied the hunter calmly, am not cut out to be a farmer. I couldn't till the soil or breed cattle. I'm too sensitive. The sight of dung or worms makes me want to puke. Me too! Hoovenagel shook his jowls. The only thing I can tolerate in the whole of agriculture is distilling spirits. The rest is repugnant. They say agriculture is the basis of economics and guarantees prosperity. I consider it, however, contemptible and humiliating that something stinking of manure should determine my prosperity. I've taken some steps in that regard. One need not till the soil, Bonnard. One need not raise cattle on it. It's sufficient to own it. If one has enough of it, one can extract decent profits from it. One can, believe me, live a life of ease. Yes, I've taken certain steps in that regard. Hence, indeed, my question about a trip northwards. For you see, Barnard, I would have work for you there. A permanent, well-paid, undemanding and just right for a sensitive fellow like you. No dung, no worms. I'm prepared to listen, without committing to anything, naturally. From the plots which the Emperor guarantees the settlers, one can, with a bit of enterprise and a little seed capital, put together quite a decent latifundium. I understand. The hunter chewed his moustache. I understand what you're getting at. I already see what steps you're taking regarding your own prosperity. Do you see no difficulties? Oh, I do. Of two kinds. Firstly, one has to find hired hands who, pretending to be settlers, will travel north to receive the land from the distributing officers and take over the plots. Formally for themselves, but in practice for me. But I shall set about finding them. The second of the difficulties concerns you. I'm all ears. Some of the hired hands will take over the land and then be disinclined to give it up. They will forget about the agreement and the money they have taken. We wouldn't believe, Bonhart, how deeply fraud, wickedness, and low motives are ingrained in human nature. I would. I will need someone to convince the dishonest that dishonesty doesn't pay, that it's punishable. And you could take care of that. It sounds excellent. It is. I have experience. I have already conducted rackets of this kind. Following the formal inclusion of ebbing into the empire when plots were distributed, and later when the Enclosure Act came into force, owing to that, Claremont, this charming little town, is on my land, and thus belongs to me. The entire area belongs to me. Far Far away to the mist-shrouded horizon. It's all mine.
Three hundred ox gangs, all told. That's over six thousand acres. Imperial acres, not peasant ones. Twenty-four thousand roods. Oh, lawless empire close to downfall, Bonhart recited scornfully. An empire where everybody who steals has to fall. Its weakness lies in self-interest and self-seeking. Its power and strength lie in it. Uvenagel shook his cheeks. You, Bonhart, confuse thievery with private enterprise. Only too often, admitted the bounty hunter detachedly. What do you say to this partnership, then? Isn't it too early to be dividing up that land in the north? Perhaps, to be certain, we should wait until Nilfgaard wins the war. To be certain? Don't jest. The result of the war is a foregone conclusion. Wars are won with money. The Empire has it, and the Nordlings don't. Bonhart cleared his throat meaningfully. While we are on the subject of money... Ah, yes. Huvenagel rummaged in the documents lying on the table. Here's a bank check for a hundred florins. Here is the deed of contract for the transfer of obligations, on the strength of which I shall receive the reward for the bandits' heads from the Van Hagens of Giso. Sign here. Thank you. Uh, you are also owed a percentage of the takings from the extravaganza, uh, but the accounts have not yet been closed. Uh, the tills still are ringing. Uh, there is great interest, Leo. Great indeed. People in my town are awfully troubled by boredom and despondency. He broke off and looked at Siri. I, I sincerely hope you aren't mistaken with regard to this person, that she will furnish us with wholesome amusement and be willing to cooperate for the sake of our joint profit. There won't be any profit for her. Bonnard eyed up Siri indifferently. She knows that. Huvenagel grimaced and snorted. It's no good, no bloody good that she knows. She ought not to know. What's the matter with you, Leo? And if she's not willing to be sporting, if she turns out to be spitefully uncompliant, what then? The expression on Bonnard's face didn't change. Then, he said, we'll unleash your mastiffs into the arena. They've always been compliant where sport's concerned, as I recall. Siri was silent for a long time, rubbing her disfigured cheek. I was beginning to understand, she finally said. I was beginning to realize what they wanted to do with me. I gathered myself. I was determined to escape at the first opportunity. I was prepared for any risk but they didn't give me the chance. They were guarding me too well. Risugota said nothing. They dragged me downstairs. The guests of that fat Huvenargal were waiting there. More eccentrics. Where do all these grotesque, odd fish come from, Visigota? They breed natural selection. The first of the men was short and chubby, more resembling a halfling than a human, and was even dressed like a halfling, modestly, pleasantly, neatly, and in pastel colours. The second man, though no longer young, had the outfit and bearing of a soldier and a sword at his side. Silver embroidery depicting a dragon with bat-like wings sparkled on the shoulder of his black jerkin. The woman was fair-haired and skinny, with a slightly hooked nose and thin lips. Her pistachio-coloured gown had a plunging neckline, which wasn't very well advised. There wasn't much cleavage to show, apart from wrinkled and parchment-dry skin covered in a thick layer of rouge and white lead powder. Her noble ladyship, the Marchioness de Neminth Oivar, Huvenagel said, Lord Declan Ross F. Melchlan, captain in the Nilfgaardian reserve horse of his mighty emperorship of Nilfgaard, Lord Pennycook, Mayor of Claremont, and this is Mr. Leo Bonnard, my relative and former comrade. Bonnard bowed stiffly. So, this is the little brigand who is to amuse us today, said the skinny marchioness, staring intently at Siri with her pale blue eyes. Years of drinking could be heard in her husky, seductive voice. Not too bad, I'd say, but nicely built. 
Quite a pleasant little bodykin. Siri jerked, pushing off an obtrusive hand, paled with fury and hissed like a serpent. Please don't touch, Bonnard said coldly. Don't feed it. Don't tease it. I take no responsibility. A little bodykin. The marchioness licked her lips, paying no attention to him. Can always be tied to a bed to make it more amenable. Perhaps you'd sell her to me, Mr. Bonnard, sir. My Marquise and I like little bodykins like that. And Mr. Hovenagel is so reproachful when we see local goose girls and peasant children. In any case, the Marquise can't hunt children any longer. He can't run because of those cankers and warts which have opened up in his crotch. Enough, enough, Matilda, Hovenagel said softly but quickly seeing the expression of growing disgust on Bonnard's face. We must leave for the theatre. Mr. Mayor has just been informed that Windsor Imbra has reached the town with a squad of the Baron of Cassidy's infantry, which means it's time. Bonnard removed the flacon from his belt pouch, wiped the onyx tabletop with his sleeve, and tipped out a small mound of white powder. He pulled on the chain, drawing Siri closer. Do you know how to use it? Siri clenched her teeth. Sniff it up, or lick a finger and rub it into your gums. No. Bonnard didn't even turn his head. You'll do it yourself, he said softly. Or I'll do it, only in a way that will supply everybody here with a bit of entertainment. You don't just have mucous membranes in your mouth and nose, little rat, but in a few other amusing places. I'll call for servants, have you stripped naked and restrained, and I'll take advantage of those amusing places. The Marchioness de Nement Oiva laughed gutturally, watching Siri reaching for the narcotic with a trembling hand. Amusing places, she repeated and licked her lips. What a fascinating idea. Worth trying one day. Hey, girl, have a care. Don't waste a good fish stick. Leave some for me. The narcotic was much more powerful than the one she'd tried with the rats. A little while after taking it, Siri was overcome by a dazzling euphoria. Contours were sharpened. Light and colours pricked her eyes. Smells irritated her nose. Sounds became unbearably loud. And everything around her became unreal as ephemeral as a dream. There were the steps. There were the tapestries, stinking of thick dust. There was the husky laughter of the Marchioness de Nementh Oiva. There was the courtyard, raindrops falling quickly on her face and the jerking of the collar she still had around her neck. There was an immense building with a wooden tower and a large, repulsively tawdry painting on the frontage. The painting depicted dogs baiting a monster, neither a dragon, a griffin, nor a wyvern. There were people outside the entrance to the building. One was shouting and gesticulating. It's revolting, revolting and sinful, Mr. Hoover to be utilising a building which was once a place of worship for such an immoral, inhuman and disgusting practice. Animals also feel, Mr. Hoover they also have their dignity. It's a crime to set animal against animal for the amusement of the common folk in the name of profit. Calm yourself, you pious fellow, and didn't meddle in my private enterprise. In any case, no animal shall be baited today, not a single one, exclusively people. Oh, then I do beg your pardon. Inside, the building was full of people sitting on rows of benches, forming an amphitheatre. A pit had been dug in the centre, a circular depression measuring about ten yards across, shored up by hefty posts and topped with a balustrade. The stench and uproar were overwhelming. Again, Siri felt a tug on the collar, and somebody seized her under the arms. Somebody shoved her. She suddenly found herself at the bottom of the pit, on firmly packed down sand, in the arena. The first rush had subsided, and now the narcotic was just stimulating her, sharpening her senses. Siri pressed her hands over her ears. The crowd occupying the amphitheater's benches roared, booed and whistled. The noise was unbearable. She noticed that her right wrist and forearm were tightly bound by a leather bracer. She couldn't recall it being fastened to her. 
She heard the familiar hoarse voice, saw the skinny, pistachio-coloured marchioness, the Nilfgaardian cavalry captain, the pastel-toned mare, Hoovenagel and Bonnard, occupying a box perched above the arena. Her hands went to her ears again as someone suddenly struck a copper gong. Look, good people, in the pit today there's no wolf, no goblin, no Endrega. In the arena today is the murderous Falker from the Rats Gang. The ticket desk by the entrance is taking bets. Don't stint a penny, good people. You can't eat this amusement, you can't drink it. But if you skimp on it, you'll not profit, you'll lose out. The crowd roared and applauded. The narcotic was working. Siri trembled with euphoria. Her vision and hearing were registering everything, every detail. She could hear Hoovenagel's cackle, the marchioness's husky laugh, the mare's grave voice, Bonnard's cold bass, the yelling of the animal-loving priest, the squealing of women and the crying of a child. She could see dark patches of blood on the posts encircling the arena and a stinking grill-covered hole gaping in it. And brutishly contorted faces, glistening with sweat above the balustrade. A sudden commotion raised voices, curses. Armed men jostled the crowd, but ground to a halt, stopped by a wall of guards clutching partisans. She'd seen one of the men before. She remembered the swarthy face and the black moustache, like a line drawn in charcoal on his upper lip, which quivered in a tick. Mr. Windsor Imbra? It was Hoovenagel's voice. Of Giso, seneschal of his noble lordship, the Baron of Cassaday. Greetings, greetings to our foreign guests. Take your places, the spectacle is about to begin. Uh, but don't forget, please, to pay at the entrance. I'm not here for the sport, Mr. Hoovenagel. I'm here on matters of service. Barnard knows of what I speak. Indeed, Leo. Do you know of what the Seneschal speaks? Do not jest. There are fifteen of us here. We've come for Falka. Hand her over, or things will turn ill. I don't understand your excitation, Imbra, Hoovenagel frowned. But I observe that this is not Giso, nor is it within the lands of that mandarin your baron. Should you make a fuss and incommode us, I shall have you driven away with knouts. I wish to cause no offence, Mr. Hoovenagel, Windsor Imbra appealed. But the law is on our side. Bonnard, here present, promised Falker to his grace, Baron of Cassaday. He gave his bond, and now he must keep it. Leo, Hoovenagel said, jowls shaking. Do you know what he's talking about? I do, and I admit he's right. Bonnard stood up, carelessly waving a hand. I shan't protest or cause any difficulties. The girl is here, as everybody sees. Whoever wishes to may take her. Windsor Imbra was dumbfounded. His lip trembled intensely. How is that? The girl, Bonnard repeated, winking at Hoovenagel, belongs to the man who wishes to take her from the arena, alive or dead, as your taste dictates. How is that? Damn it, I'm gradually losing my patience. Bonnard skillfully feigned anger. Nothing but how is that, bloody parrot? How? However you wish. It's up to you. Poison some meat and throw it to her as you would a she-wolf. But I can't guarantee she will devour it. She doesn't look stupid, does she? No, Imbra. Whoever wants her must take the trouble of going down to her. Down there, into the pit. You want Falka? Then claim her. You wave Falka under my nose like a frog on a rod before a catfish, Windsor Imbra growled. I don't trust you, Bonnard. I can smell the iron hook hidden in that bait. I congratulate you on your sensitive nose. Bonnard stood up, took the sword acquired in Farno from under the bench, drew it from the scabbard, and threw it into the arena so dexterously that the blade stuck vertically in the sand two paces in front of Siri. There's your iron, out in the open, not concealed at all. I don't care for the wench. 
and whomsoever wants to may take her, if they are able. The Marchioness de Nement Oiva laughed nervously. If they are able, she repeated in her husky contralto, for now the Bodikin has a sword. Bravo, Mr. Bonner. It seemed despicable to leave the Bodikin defenseless and at the mercy of these good-for-nothings. Mr. Hoovenagel, Windsor Imbra said with arms akimbo, not gracing the skinny aristocrat with even a glance. This spectacle is being held under your patronage, for it's your theatre after all. Just tell me one thing. By whose rules and principles are we to play? Yours or Bonart's? By the theatrical ones, Hoovenagel cackled, shaking his belly and bulldog-like jowls. For though it's true that it's my theatre, the customer is always right, as he who pays the piper calls the tune. The customer sets the rules, whilst we merchants must act according to those rules. Whatever the customer demands, we must give him. Customer? You mean these folk? Windsor Imbra gestured sweepingly across the packed auditorium. All these folk who have paid to marvel at these marvels. Business is business, Uvenagel replied. If there is a demand for something, why not sell it? Do folk pay for a wolf fight? For Endrega and Aardvark fights? For baiting a badger and a barrel or a wyvern? Why are you so astonished, Imbra? Folk need circuses and spectacles as they do bread. Why, more than bread. Many of those here had it taken from their mouths. Now look at them, how their eyes shine. They can't wait for the games to begin. But at games, Bonnard added, smiling spitefully, the appearances of sport must at least be observed. The brock before the curs drag him from the barrel, may nip with its teeth, that's only sporting. And the girl has a blade. Let it also be sporting here. Well, good people, am I right? The good people confirmed in an incoherent, though thunderous and joyful chorus that Bonnard was absolutely right. The Baron of Cassaday, Windsor Imbra said slowly, will not be pleased, Mr. Hoovenagel. I tell you, he'll not be pleased. I don't know if it's worth your while picking a fight with him. Business is business, Hoovenagel repeated and jiggled his cheeks. The Baron of Cassidy knows that very well. He has borrowed a deal of money from me at low interest, and when the time comes to borrow more, then we shall somehow smooth over our squabbles. But some foreign lord isn't going to interfere in my private enterprise. Wages have been laid, people have paid to enter. Blood must soak into that sand in that arena. Must? Windsor Imbra yelled. Bollocks! I'm itching to show you that it doesn't need to at all, for I shall leave here and ride away without looking back. Then you can spill your own blood. The very thought of supplying this rabble with amusement sickens me. Let him go. A character with a very low hairline in a horsehide jerkin emerged from the crowd. If it sickens him, let him go. It doesn't sicken me. They said, whoever does for the she-rat takes the reward. I volunteer to enter the arena. Not likely. One of Imbra's soldiers, a short but wiry and well-built man, suddenly yelled. He had thick, unkempt and matted hair. We was first, wasn't we, boys? Yeah chimed in a second, a scrawny one with a pointed beard. We have priority, and don't let your sense of honour get the better of you, Windsor. What of it, if the rabble is watching? Falkers in the pit suffice to hold that hand and take her, and let the peasantry goggle, we don't give a damn. And we're ready to get something out of it too, snickered a third, dressed in a doublet of vivid amaranth. Let's make sport of it, am I right, Mr. Hoovenagel? Let's make a contest of it, as long as the reward's on offer. Hoovenagel grinned and nodded, proudly and majestically jiggling his pendulous cheeks. Well then, asked the one with the goatee curiously, are there any wages? As of now, the merchant laughed, no one has wagered on the result. As of now, it's three to one, since none of you dares enter the enclosure. Huh? Horsard yelled. 
I dare. I'm minded. Out of the way, I said. Matted hair roared back. We was first, and we have first crack. Come on, what are we waiting for? How many can go in at one time? Amaranth tightened his belt. Or is only one at a time allowed? You horsens! Quite unexpectedly, the pastel mare suddenly roared in a powerful voice, utterly incongruent with his build. Perhaps ten of you want to take on the one of her. On horseback, perhaps. Riding chariots, perhaps. Perhaps you want to borrow a catapult from the armory in order to hurl boulders at the wench from afar, eh? Very well, very well, Bonnart interrupted, after swiftly consulting with Hoovenagel. Let it be sport, but let there be entertainment too. We'll say two at a time. You may enter in pairs. Uh, but the reward, Hoovenagel warned, will not be doubled. If it's two, you'll have to share. In pairs? Two at a time? Matted hair flung his cape from his shoulders. Are you ashamed, boys? She's just a wench. He spat on the ground. Stand back. I'll go myself and take her down. Big deal. I want Falker alive, protested Windsor Imbra. A pox on your fights and duels. I won't go along with Bonart Circus. I want the wench alive. You two go in, you and Stavro, and haul her out of there. As for me... Stavro, the one with the goatee, said, it's an insult for two of us to take on that scrawny thing. The Baron's Florins will make that insult more palatable, but only if she's alive. The Baron's a miser, Hoovenagel cackled, wobbling his belly and bulldog's jowls. He doesn't have an ounce of sporting spirit in him, nor the desire to reward that spirit in others. I, though, champion sport, and hereby increase the reward. Whomsoever enters the arena alone and leaves it on his own two feet will be paid by this very hand from this very coffer, not twenty, but thirty florins. So, what are we waiting for? yelled Stavro. I'm going first. Uh, not so fast, the short mare roared once again. The wench has but thin linen on her back, so cast off that brigandine, soldier. This is sport. Ah, pox on you. Stavro stripped off the studded caftan, then pulled his shirt off over his head, revealing a scrawny chest and arms as hairy as a baboon. A pox on you, my lords, and your sodding sport. I'll go in a buff. Shall I take off my breeches, too? And your braes, the Marchioness de Nement Oivar croaked seductively. Then we'll see if you're only manly and worth. Rewarded by thunderous applause and naked to the waist, Stavro drew his weapon and threw one leg over the barrier, watching Siri intently. Siri folded her arms over her chest. She didn't even take a step towards the sword, plunged into the sand. Stavro hesitated. Don't do it, said Siri very softly. Don't make me. I won't let you touch me. Don't begrudge me, wench. Stavro clambered over the barrier. I've nothing against you, but business is... He didn't complete the sentence, for Siri was already on him, was already holding Swallow, as she had named the gnomish Guaya. She used a very simple, downright childish attack and feint called Three Little Steps, but Stavro was taken in by it. He took a step backwards and raised his sword involuntarily, and was then at her mercy. After stepping back, he was leaning against a post, and Swallow's blade was an inch from the tip of his nose. That move, Bonnet explained to the Marchioness, shouting over the roaring and applause, is called three little steps, a feint and a lunge in tears. A cheap trick. I'd expected something more refined from the wench, though one must admit, if she'd wanted it, the fellow would already be dead. Kill him! Kill him! The spectators bellowed, and Hoovenagel and Mayor Pennycook pointed their thumbs downwards. The blood had drained from Stavro's face, and the pimples and pockmarks on his cheeks were repugnantly visible. I told you not to make me, Siri hissed. I don't want to kill you, but I won't let anyone touch me. Go back where you came from. She moved back, turned around, put down her sword, and looked up towards the box. Are you toying with me? She cried, voice breaking. Do you mean to force me to fight? To kill? You can't do it. I won't fight. 
Hear that, Imbra? Bonnard's sneering voice resounded in the silence. Clear profit and no risk. She won't fight. Thus, you can take her from the arena and deliver her alive to the Baron of Cassidy, so he can freely amuse himself with her. You can take her without any danger, with your bare hands. Windsor, Imbra, spat. Stavro, still standing with his back pressed against the post, panted, gripping his sword. Bonnard laughed. But I, Imbra, bet a diamond to a walnut that you can't. Stavro took a deep breath. The girl, standing with her back to him, appeared distracted, preoccupied. He was seething with rage, shame and hatred. He couldn't control himself. He attacked swiftly and treacherously. The audience didn't notice the swerve or reverse thrust. All they saw was the rushing Stavro making a truly balletic leap, after which, less balletically, he fell belly and face down in the sand. Sand which was immediately stained red with blood. Instinct takes the upper hand, Bonnard shouted over the crowd. Reflexes come into play. Hey, Uvenagel, what did I say? You'll see, the Mastiffs won't be needed. What a splendid and profitable spectacle, Uvenagel said, closing his eyes in bliss. Stavro raised himself on trembling arms jerked his head, cried out, croaked, puked blood, and slumped down on the sand. What's that blue gold, Mr. Bonnard, sir? The Marchioness de Nemeth Oiva asked huskily and sensuously, rubbing her knees together. That was improvised. The teeth of the bounty hunter, who didn't even look at the Marchioness, flashed from beneath his lips. An exquisite, inspired, and I'd say visceral improvisation. I've heard of a place where they teach that kind of improvised butchery. I'll wager our maiden knows it well. Now I know who she is. Don't make me, Siri screamed, a truly ghastly note trembling in her voice. I don't want to understand. I don't want to. You hellish slut. Amaranth nimbly vaulted the barrier, circling the arena to distract Ciri from matted hair, who was entering from the opposite side. Horsehide cleared the barrier behind matted hair. That's fighting dirty, roared the halfling-sized mare, Pennycook, who was sensitive to fair play, and the crowd yelled with him. Three against one, that's unfair. Bonnard laughed. The marchioness licked her lips and began to wriggle her legs more urgently. The threesome's plan was simple. Pin the retreating girl against the posts. Then two would block and the third one kill. Nothing came of it for a simple reason. The girl didn't retreat but attacked. She slipped between them with a balletic pirouette so lightly she almost didn't touch the sand. She struck matted hair in passing precisely where he ought to be struck, in the carotid artery. The blow was so subtle it didn't jar her rhythm. She ducked away in a reverse feint, so swiftly that not a single drop of the blood gushing from matted hair's neck in a two-yard stream fell on her. Amaranth, behind her, aimed to slash across the back of her neck, but his treacherous blow clanged against a lightning-fast parry of her blade, held up behind her. Ciri unwound like a spring, slashing with both hands, amplifying the blow's power with a jerk of her hips. The dark, gnomish blade was like a razor and cut his abdomen open with a hiss and a squelch. Amaranth howled and flopped forward onto the sand, curling up into a ball. Horsehide leapt at Ciri and thrust towards her throat, but she dodged, spun fluidly, and struck from close quarters with the middle of the blade, mutilating his eye, nose, mouth, and chin. The spectators yelled, whistled, stamped their feet and bayed for more. The Marchioness de Nemeth Oivar thrust both hands between her clenched thighs, licked her shining lips, and laughed in her nervous drinker's contralto. The captain of the Nilfgaardian reserve horse was as wan as vellum. A woman tried to cover the eyes of her child as he wriggled free. A grizzled old man in the front row vomited loudly and spasmodically, and hung his head between his knees. Horsehide sobbed, holding his face, as blood mixed with snot and spit poured through his fingers. Amaranth rolled around, squealing like a stuck hog. 
Matted hair stopped scrabbling against a post, slippery with blood, spurting from him in the rhythm of his heartbeat. Help me, Amaranth howled, tightly clutching his innards, spilling out of his belly. Comrades, help me. Horsehide spat and snorted blood. Finish him off! Finish him off! chanted the audience, stamping their feet to the rhythm. The puking old man was shoved from the bench and kicked towards the gallery. A diamond to a walnut, Bonnot's sneering bass resounded amongst the racket, that none will now dare enter the arena. A diamond to a walnut, Imbra. <laughs> what am I saying? even to an empty walnut shell. Kill him! A roaring, thumping of feet and clapping. Kill him! Noble maiden! Windsor Imbra shouted, gesturing his subordinates to go forward. Let them remove the wounded. Let them enter the arena and take them before they bleed to death. Have a heart, noble maiden. A heart? Siri repeated with effort only then feeling the adrenaline strike her. She got herself quickly under control with a series of well-drilled breaths. Come in and take them, she said. But come in unarmed. Have a heart as well. Just this once. No, the crowd roared and chanted. We want blood. We want blood. You rotten bastards. Siri turned around gracefully, sweeping her gaze over the stands and benches. You despicable swine! You scoundrels! You lousy horsons! You want blood? Come here. Come down, taste it and smell it. Lick it up before it clots. Bastards! Vampires! The marchioness groaned, trembled, fluttered her eyelashes and softly nestled up to Bonhart without taking her hands from between her thighs. Bonhart grimaced and shoved her away from him, not bothering to be gentle. The crowd howled. Someone threw a half-chewed sausage into the arena, someone else a boot, and yet another chucked a gherkin aimed at Siri. She sliced the gherkin in two with a flourish of her sword, provoking an even louder roar. Windsor Imbra and his men picked up Amaranth and Horsehide. When Amaranth was touched, he howled, while Horsehide fainted. Matted hair and Stavro no longer showed any signs of life. Siri moved back to stand as far away as the arena permitted. Imbra's men also did their best to stay away from her. Windsor Imbra stood motionless. He waited until they had heaved out the dead and wounded. He looked at Siri through narrowed eyes, his hand on the hilt of his sword, which, despite his promise, he had not removed on entering the arena. No! she warned, barely moving her lips. Don't make me, please. Imbra was pale. The crowd stamped their feet, roared and howled. Don't listen to her, Bonhart shouted over the racket again. Draw your sword. Otherwise, it'll get out that you're a coward and a turd. From the Alba to the Aruga, everyone will be talking about how Windsor Imbra ran from a slip of a girl with his tail between his legs. Imbra's blade slid an inch from the scabbard. Don't, said Siri. The blade went back in. Coward, roared someone from the crowd. Shithead, chicken heart. His face impassive, Imbra walked to the edge of the arena before seizing the hands of his comrades reaching down from above, he turned back one last time. You probably know what you're in for, wench, he said softly. You probably already know what Leo Bonhart is. You probably already know what Leo Bonhart's capable of, what excites him. You'll be shoved out into the arena to kill for the amusement of the swine and scum in here, and even worse than them. And when the fact that you can kill stops amusing them, when Bonart tires of doing violence to you, then they'll kill you too. They'll send so many to face you, you won't be able to watch your back, or they'll set dogs on you. And the dogs will tear you apart, and the rabble in the stands will sniff blood and applaud. 
you'll expire on this blood-stained sand, like the men you slaughtered today. You'll remember my words. Oddly, it was only then that she noticed the small escutcheon on his enamel gorget, a silver unicorn rampant on a black field. A unicorn. Siri lowered her head. She looked at her sword's openwork ricasso. Everything suddenly went quiet. By the great sun, Declan Ross Ape Mechlad, the captain of the Nilfgaardian Reserve Horse, abruptly began. No, don't do that, girl. Not even kes luneth. Siri slowly turned Swallow around in her hand and rested the pommel on the sand. She went down on one knee, holding the blade with her right hand. She aimed the point with her left towards her breastbone. The blade cut through her clothing and pricked her at once. Just don't cry, thought Siri, pushing harder and harder down on the sword. Just don't cry, there's nothing to cry over. One quick thrust and it will all be over. It will all be over. You won't do it. Bonnard's voice resounded in the complete silence. You won't do it, witcher girl. In Caer Moren, you were taught how to kill, so you kill like a machine, instinctively. To kill yourself, you need character, strength, determination, and courage. And they couldn't teach you that. He was right, Siri said with effort. I couldn't. Visogotta remained silent. He was holding a koipu pelt, motionless. Had been for a long time. He had almost forgotten about the pelt as he listened. I chickened out. I was a coward. And I paid for it. As every coward pays for it. In pain, dishonour, and hideous humiliation. And an absolute revulsion towards myself. Visogotta said nothing. Had someone crept up to the cottage with the sunken thatched roof that night? Had they peered through the slits in the shutters? They would have seen in the dimly lit interior a grey-bearded old man and an ashen-haired girl sitting by the fireplace. They would have noticed that the two of them were staring silently into the glowing ruby coals. But no one could have seen it, for the cottage with the sunken moss-grown thatched roof was well hidden among the fog and the mist, in a boundless swamp in the periplut marshes, where no one dared to venture. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis chapter 9 verse 6 Verily, great self-righteousness and great blindness are needed to call the gore pouring from the scaffold justice. Visugotta of Corvo Chapter 5 what seeks the witcher on my territory? Fulke Alteverde, the prefect of Riedbrunne, repeated the question, now clearly impatient with the lengthening silence. Whence is the witcher coming? And whither is he headed? With what purpose? That's what comes of playing at good deeds, thought Geralt, looking at the prefect's face, which was marked with thickened scars. That's what comes of playing the noble witcher out of compassion for a bunch of shabby forest folk. That's what comes of the desire for luxury and sleeping in taverns where there's always a narc. That's what comes of travelling with a loud-mouthed poetaster. Here I sit in a room like a windowless cell and a hard interrogation chair bolted to the floor and on the chair's back, it's impossible not to notice, are cuffs and leather straps for binding the arms and restraining the neck. They haven't been used yet, but they're there. How the bloody hell do I get myself out of this pickle now? After five days of trekking with the Riverdellian forest beekeepers, they finally emerged from the wilderness onto a boggy reed bed. It stopped raining. The wind dispersed the mists and clammy fog. 
The sun broke through the clouds, and mountain peaks sparkled snow white in the glare. If a short while ago the river Yaruga had signified to them a clear dividing line, a border, the crossing of which represented an evident passage to the next more serious stage of the expedition, it was even more so now. The sense that they were approaching a limit, a barrier, a place which could only be turned back from. They all felt it, Geralt above all. It could only be thus, since from dawn to dusk they had been faced with a mighty, jagged range of mountains barring their way, rising up in front of them to the south, and gleaming with snow and glaciers. The Amel Mountains. And rising even above the sore-toothed Amel was the forbiddingly majestic obelisk of Mount Gorgon, Devil Mountain, as angular as the blade of a misericord. They did not talk about it, didn't discuss it, but Geralt felt what everybody was thinking. For when he looked at the Amel Range and Gorgon, the thought of continuing the journey southwards seemed sheer insanity. Fortunately, it suddenly turned out there would be no need to head south. This news was brought to them by the shaggy forest beekeeper, owing to whom they had acted as the train's armed escort for the previous five days. The husband and father of the comely Hamadryads, next to whom he looked like a wild boar beside two mares. He, who had tried to deceive them by saying the druids of Kaidu had gone to the slopes. It was the day after their arrival in Uridbrunne, a town teeming like an anthill, and the destination of the forest beekeepers and trappers from Riverdale. It was the day after parting with the forest beekeepers for whom the witcher was no longer needed. He hadn't expected to see any of them again. His astonishment was thus all the greater. For the forest beekeeper began with effusive expressions of gratitude and the handing to Geralt of a full pouch of mainly small change, his witcher's fee. He accepted it, feeling on him the somewhat mocking gaze of Rages and Kair, to whom he had occasionally moaned during the trek about human ingratitude and stressed the pointlessness and stupidity of selfless altruism. And then the excited beekeeper literally shouted out the news. The, you know, mistletoes? I, I mean the druids are camped, dear Master Witcher, in the oak groves by Loch Monduian, a, a lake, get my drift, 35 miles from here in a westerly direction. The beekeeper had heard these tidings at a honey and beeswax trade market from a relative living in Riedebrunner, while the relative had been given the information from a diamond prospector, acquaintance of his. When the beekeeper learned about the druids, he ran as quickly as he could to tell the witcher, and now he was glowing with happiness, pride and a sense of importance, like every liar when his lies accidentally turn out to be true. At first, Geralt had intended to make for Loch Monduian without a moment's delay, but the company protested vehemently. Being in possession of the money from the beekeepers, declared Rages and Kair, and being in a town where anything could be bought, they ought to stock up on victuals and supplies. And buy extra arrows, added Milva, because they were always demanding game from her, and she weren't going to shoot whittle sticks. And spend at least one night in a bed in an inn, added Dandelion, and retired to that bed bathed and pleasantly tipsy on ale. The druids, they chorused, won't run away. Utter coincidence, though it may be, added the vampire Rages with a curious smile. Our company is on exactly the right road and heading in exactly the right direction, for since we are clearly and absolutely destined to encounter the druids, a day or two's delay makes no difference. And as regards haste, he added philosophically, the impression that time is quickly running out is customarily a warning signal enjoining one to reduce the pace and proceed slowly and with due prudence. Geralt didn't protest or argue with the vampire's philosophy, although the weird nightmares he was being haunted by still inclined him towards haste, despite his being unable to recollect them after waking. It was the 17th of September, and a full moon. Six days remained until the autumn equinox. Milva, Rages, and Kair took upon themselves the task of making purchases and acquiring the necessary equipment. Geralt and Dandelion, however, were to reconnoitre and gather information in the town of Riedebrunne. Situated in a bend in the River Navy, Riedebrunne was a small town, if one only took into consideration the densely grouped brick and wooden buildings inside the ring of earthen embankments bristling with a palisade. But the serried buildings inside the embankments were currently merely the centre of the town, and no more than a tenth of the population could live there. 
nine-tenths resided in the noisy ocean of ramshackle huts, shacks, cabins, sheds, tents and wagons, serving as dwellings which surrounded the embankments. The witcher and the poet were served by Cicerone in the form of the beekeeper's relative. Young, artful and arrogant, a typical specimen of an urban layabout, who'd been born in the gutter and was no stranger to bathing nor slaking his thirst there. This stripling was like a trout in a crystal-clear mountain stream in the urban hubbub, throng, grime and stench, and the chance to show someone around his repugnant town clearly delighted him. Unconcerned that nobody was asking him any questions, the gutter snipe gave enthusiastic explanations. He explained that Riedbrunner was an important stage for Nilfgaardian settlers, travelling northwards after the endowment pledged by the emperor. Six ox gangs, or roughly 120 acres, and on top of that, a ten-year tax moratorium. For Reed Brunner lay at the mouth of the Dol Navy Valley, which cuts through the Amel Mountains via the Theodula Pass, linking the slopes and Riverdale with Magturga, Giso, Matina and Mecht, all countries for many years subordinate to the Northgardian Empire. The town of Reed Brunner, explained the gutter snipe, was the last place where the settlers could depend on something else and not just themselves, their womenfolk and what they had in their wagons, which is why most of the settlers remained camped outside the town for quite some time, gathering their strength before the last push to the banks of the Yeruga and beyond. And many of them, he added, with the pride of a slum patriot, settled in the town permanently, because the town was, why, culture, not some yokelish dump stinking of dung. In truth, the town of Riedbrunner's stench drew on many smells, dung included. Geralt had been there years before, but couldn't recognise it. Too much had changed. Previously, there hadn't been so many cavalrymen in black armour and cloaks with silver emblems on their spaulders. Previously, the Nilfgaardian tongue had not been heard on all sides. Previously, there hadn't been a quarry outside the town, where now, ragged, dirty, haggard and bloodied people split boulders into ashlars and rubble, whipped by black uniformed overseers. A large force of Nilfgaardian soldiers are stationed here, explained the gutter snipe, but not permanently only during breaks in marches and searches for the partisans of the Free Slopes organisation. They'll be setting up a powerful Nilfgaardian garrison here when a great stone stronghold is constructed on the site of the old castle. A stronghold built of stone hard won from the quarry. The people splitting the stone are prisoners of war, from Lyria, from Adian, and lately from Sodden, Brugge and Angren, and Temeria. Four hundred prisoners are employed here in Riedbrunner. A good 500 work in the ore quarries, underground and open-cast mines, in the vicinity of Belhaven, and over a thousand are building bridges and levelling roads in the Theodula Pass. There had also been a scaffold in the town square when Geralt had visited, but a much more modest one. There hadn't been so many devices arousing hideous associations on it, and there hadn't been so many revolting and putrid decorations hanging from the gallows, stakes, forks and poles. That's thanks to Mr. Fulco Artivelde the prefect recently installed by the military authorities, explained the gutter snipe, looking at the scaffold and the fragments of human anatomy gracing it. Mr. Fulco had given the hangman business again. There's no fooling around with Mr. Fulco, he added. He's a stern master. The diamond prospector, the gutter snipe's mate, who they found in the tavern, didn't make a good impression on Geralt, for he happened to be in that tremblingly pale, half-sober, half-drunk, half-real, almost nightmarish state which drinking for several nights and days without stopping puts a fellow into. The witch's heart sank. It looked as though the sensational news about the druids might have originated in simple delirium tremens. The drink-sodden prospector answered their questions astutely, however, and with good sense. He wittily retorted to Dandelion's accusation that he didn't look like a diamond prospector by saying that he would if he ever found a diamond. He described the dwelling place of the druids by Loch Monduin explicitly and precisely, without exaggerated embellishment or an overinflated fantasizing manner. He took the liberty of asking what his interlocutors wanted from the druids and, when treated to a contemptuous silence, warned them that entering the druidic oak groves meant certain death, since the druids were wont to grab intruders, shove them into a basket called the Wicker Woman and burn them alive to the accompaniment of prayers, chants and incantations. The groundless rumour and foolish superstition, it turned out, had dogged the druids, resolutely keeping up, never lagging more than two furlongs behind. Further conversation was interrupted by nine soldiers in black uniforms with the sign of the sun on their spaulders, armed with guizam. Would you be? asked the sergeant, 
commanding the soldiers, tapping his calf with an oaken truncheon. The Witcher Geralt? Yes, Geralt answered after a moment's reflection. I would. You'll be coming along with me then. How can you be sure I will? Am I under arrest? The soldier looked at him in a seemingly endless silence, but somehow strangely without respect. No doubt his eight-man escort gave him the nerve to look in that manner. No, he said at last. You aren't under arrest. I received no order to arrest you. If I'd received an order, my question would have been different, sir. Very different. Geralt adjusted his sword belt rather ostentatiously. And my answer, he said icily, would have been different too. Now, now, gentlemen, Dandelion decided to step in, putting on an expression which, in his opinion, was the smile of a seasoned diplomat. Why that tone? We are honest men. We needn't fear the powers that be. Why, we're willing to help them, whenever the opportunity arises. But by virtue of that, we deserve something from authority, don't we, officer? If only something as tiny as an explanation of why our civic freedoms are being curtailed. There's a war on, sir, the soldier replied, not in the least bit disconcerted by the torrent of words. Freedom, as the name suggests, is a matter for peacetime. Any reasons will be elucidated by his lordship the prefect. I carry out orders, so don't get into discussions with me. Fair enough, the witcher conceded, and gave the troubadour a slight wink. Then lead us to the prefecture, good soldier. Dandelion, go back to the others and tell them what's happened. Do the necessary. Regis will know what to do. What's a witcher doing in the slops? What do you seek? The person asking the questions was a broad-shouldered, dark-haired man with a face rutted with scars and a leather patch over his left eye. In a dark alleyway, the sight of that cyclopean face was capable of wresting a moan of terror from many a breast. But how unjust when it was the face of Mr. Fulco Artevelde, prefect of Riedbrunner, the highest-ranking custodian of law and order in the entire region. What does a witcher seek in the slopes? repeated the highest-ranking custodian of law and order in the entire region. Geralt sighed and shrugged, feigning indifference. You'll know, of course, the answer to your question, Prefect. You could only have gleaned the fact that I'm a witcher from the Riverdale Forest Beekeepers, who hired me to protect them on their march. And, being a witcher in the slopes or anywhere else, I'm generally in search of the chance to work. So I'm journeying in the direction suggested by the patrons who hired me. Logical, Fulco Artevelde nodded. On the face of it, at least. You parted company with the beekeepers two days ago, but you intend to continue your travels southwards in somewhat peculiar company. With what aim? Geralt didn't lower his eyes, but steadily returned the burning gaze of the prefect's only eye. Am I under arrest? No, not for the time being. Then the purpose and direction of my travel is my private business. I suggest frankness and openness, nonetheless, if only in order to prove you don't feel in any way guilty and don't fear either the law or any authority guarding it. I'll repeat the question. What is behind your expedition, Witcher? Geralt pondered this briefly. I'm trying to reach the druids who were abiding in Angren, but have probably moved into these parts. It would have been easy to learn that from the beekeepers I was escorting. Who hired you to deal with the druids? The guardians of nature haven't burned one too many people in the Vic of Woman, have they? Fairy tales, rumours, superstitions. Strange for an enlightened person like yourself. I want information from the druids, not their blood. But really, Prefect, it seems to me I've been too frank in order to prove I don't feel guilty. It's not about your guilt. At least, not just about it. I'd like, nevertheless, a tone of mutual congeniality to prevail in our talk. For in spite of appearances, the aim of this talk is, among others, to save you and your companions' lives. You have provoked my sincere curiosity, my lord prefect, answered Geralt after some time. Among other things, I shall hear out your explanations with truly rapt attention. I don't doubt it. We'll get to those explanations, but gradually, in stages. 
Have you ever heard, Master Witcher, of the tradition of turning imperial evidence? Do you know what that is? I do. Weaseling out of one's responsibilities by fingering one's comrades. A gross simplification, Fulco Artevelde said without smiling. Typical, actually, for a Nordling. You often disguise gaps in your education with sarcastic or exaggerated simplifications which you consider witty. Imperial law operates here in the slopes, Master Witcher. More precisely, imperial law is going to operate here when rank lawlessness has been utterly extirpated. The best way to fight lawlessness and criminality is the scaffold, which you surely saw in the town square. But occasionally, the offer to turn imperial evidence also works. He made a dramatic pause. Geralt didn't interrupt. Quite recently, the prefect continued, we managed to lure a gang of juvenile criminals into an ambush. The brigands offered resistance and were killed. But not all of them, right? Geralt conjectured bluntly, becoming a little bored by all this oratory. One was taken alive. They were promised a reprieve if they turned imperial evidence. I mean, if they started grassing. And they grassed me up. Why such a deduction? Have you had any contact with the local criminal underworld? Now or in the past? No, I haven't. Not now or in the past. So forgive me, Lord Prefect, but the whole matter is either a complete misunderstanding or humbug, or a trap directed against me. In the latter case, I would suggest we don't waste any more time and proceed to the nub of the matter. It appears that the thought of a trap troubles you, the prefect observed, furrowing his scarred brow. Could you perhaps, in spite of your assurances, have some reason to fear the law? No. I'm beginning, though, to fear that the fight against crime is being conducted horridly, wholesale, and not meticulously enough, without painstaking inquiries to determine guilt or innocence. But, well, perhaps that's just an exaggerated simplification, typical of a dull Nordling. And this Nordling continues not to understand in what way the prefect of Ridbruna is saving his life. Fulco Artivelde observed him in silence for a moment, then clapped his hands. Bring her in, he ordered the soldiers, who'd appeared at his signal. Geralt calmed himself with several breaths, for suddenly a certain thought made his heart race and his adrenaline flow. A moment later, he had to take several more breaths and even, astonishingly, had to make a sign with his hand out of sight beneath the table. And the effect astonishingly, was none. He felt hot and cold. For the guards had shoved Siri into the room. Well, I never, said Siri, right after she'd been sat down in a chair and had her hands handcuffed behind the backrest. Look what the cat's dragged in. Artivelde made a brief gesture. One of the guards, a huge fellow with the face of a slow-witted child, drew his arm back in an unhurried swing and struck Siri in the face so hard it made the chair rock. Forgive her, your lordship, said the guard apologetically and astonishingly mildly. She is young and foolish, skittish. Engulem, Artevelde said slowly and emphatically. I promised you I'd hear you out. But I meant I'd listen to your answers to my questions, not to your badinage. You will be rebuked for your lack of respect. Understand? Sure, Nuncle. The gesture. The slap. The chair rocked. Young, mumbled the guard, rubbing his hand on his hip. Skittish. From the young woman's snub nose, Geralt could see now that it wasn't Siri and was astonished at his mistake. Trickled a thin stream of blood. The young woman sniffed hard and smiled predatorily. Angulem, the prefect repeated. Do you understand me? Yes, sir, Mr. Fulco. Who's this, Angulem? The girl sniffed again, inclined her head and fixed Geralt with her huge eyes. Hazel, not green. Then she shook her untidy mane of flaxen hair, causing it to fall onto her forehead in unruly locks. Never seen him before. She licked the blood which dripped onto her lip but I know who he is. Anyway, I already told you that, Mr. Fulco. 
Now you know I wasn't lying. His name's Geralt. He's a witcher. He crossed the Yaruga about ten days ago and he's heading for Tucson. Right, my white-haired uncle? She's young, skittish, said the guard quickly, looking somewhat anxiously at the prefect. But Fulco Artevelde just grimaced and shook his head. You'll still be fooling about on the scaffold, Angoulême. Very well, let's go on. With whom, according to you, was Geralt the Vitra travelling? I've already told you that, too. With a comely fellow called Dandelion, who's a troubadour and carries a lute, and a young woman who has dark, blonde, chin-length hair. I don't know her name. And another man without a description. His name wasn't mentioned either. Four of them in all. Geralt rested his chin on his knuckles, observing the girl with interest. Angoulême didn't lower her gaze. What eyes you have, she said. Creepy peepers. Continue, Angoulême, continue, Mr. Fulco urged, scowling. Who else belonged to this vitreous cohort? No one. I said there were four of them. Not been listening, uncle. The gesture, the slap, the trickle. The guard needed his hip, but refrained from any more comments about the skittishness of youth. You lie, Angoulême, said the prefect. How many of them are there? I ask for the second time. Whatever you say, Mr. Fulco, whatever you say, as you wish. There's two hundred of them, three hundred, six hundred. Lord Prefect. Geralt forestalled the order to strike. Let's leave it, if we may. What she said is precise enough to show she's not lying, at most lacking in information. But where did she get her facts? She declared she's never seen me before. It's the first time I've seen her too, I give my word. Thank you. Artevelde frowned at him. For your help with the investigation, how valuable. Then I start interrogating you. I count on your being equally eloquent. Angoulême, did you hear what the gentleman said? Speak, and don't make me encourage you. It was said, replied the girl, as she licked the blood dripping from her nose, that if the authorities were informed about a planned crime, if it was revealed who was planning villainy, there'd be clemency. So I'm telling you, ain't I? I know about a crime being prepared, and I want to forestall the evil deed. Listen to what I say. Nightingale and his Hanser are waiting in Belhaven for this here witcher, and are planning to club him to death there. A half-elf gave them the contract. A stranger. No one knows where the hell he is from. No one knows him. The half-elf said it all. Who he is, what he looks like, where he's from, when he'll arrive, in what company. He warned that the witch has no mug but an old hand, so not to play the hero, but stab him in the back, down him with a crossbow, or better yet, poison him, if he eats or drinks somewhere in Belhaven. The half-elf gave Nightingale some money, a lot of money, and promised to be more after the job's done. After it's done? Fulco Artevelde remarked. So, the half-elf is still in Belhaven, with Nightingale's gang? Perhaps, I don't know. It's over a fortnight since I escaped from Nightingale's hands. So would that be the reason you're grassing the mob? The witcher smiled. Settle in scores. The young woman's eyes narrowed, and her swollen mouth twisted. Leave my sodding scores out of this, nuncle. And me grassing is saving your life, right? Some thanks would be in order. Thank you. Geralt again prevented the beating. I only meant to remark that of your settling scores, it diminishes your credibility to turn imperial evidence. People grass to save their skin and their life, but they lie when they want revenge. Our Angoulême has no chance of saving her life, Fulco Artevelde interjected. But she wants naturally to save her skin. To me, that's an absolutely credible motive. Well, Angoulême? You do want to save your skin, don't you? The girl pursed her lips and visibly blanched. The boldness of a criminal, said the prefect contemptuously, and of a snot-nosed kid at the same time. Swoop down in numbers, rob the weak, kill the defenseless, oh yes. Look death in the eye, not so easy. That's beyond you. We shall see, she snarled. We shall, nodded Fulco gravely and we shall hear. You'll bellow your lungs out on the scaffold, Angoulême. You promised me clemency. And I shall keep my promise, if what you have testified proves to be the truth. Angoulême jerked on the chair, 
pointing at Geralt with a movement seemingly of her whole slim body. And that? she yelled. What's that? Isn't that the truth? Let him deny he's a witcher and he's Geralt. Let him say I'm not credible. Let him ride to Belhaven and you'll have better proof that I'm not lying. You'll find his corpse in some gutter in the morning. But then you'll say I didn't prevent a crime, so the clemency will still come to nothing. That right? You're fucking swindlers. Nothing but swindlers. Don't, Hitta, said Geralt. Please. There was something in his voice that checked the raised hands of the prefect and the guard. Angulen sniffed, looking at him piercingly. Thanks, Nuncle, she said. But beating's nothing much. If they won't, let him carry on. I've been beaten since a child. I'm used to it. If you want to be kind, confirm I'm telling the truth. Let them keep their word. Let them sodding hang me. Take her away, Fulke ordered, quietening Geralt, who was about to protest with a gesture. She is of no use to us, he explained once they were alone. I know everything, and you shall have your explanations, and then I shall ask for reciprocity. First of all, the witch's voice was cold. Explain what that noisy exit was all about, ending with that curious request to be hanged. If she's turned imperial evidence, the girl's done her work, hasn't she? Not yet. How is that? Homer Stragan, nicknamed Nightingale, is an exceptionally dangerous scoundrel. Cruel and brazen, cunning and clever, and a lucky rogue. His impunity emboldens others. I must put an end to it, which is why I made a deal with Angoulême. I promised her that if, as a result of her testimony, Nightingale is captured and his gang broken up, she will hang. I beg your pardon. The witch's astonishment was genuine. Is that what you call turning imperial evidence here? The notes in exchange for collaboration with the authorities. And what for refusing to collaborate? Impalement, preceded by gouging out the eyes and tearing the bosom with red-hot pincers. The witcher didn't say a word. It is called exemplary terror, Fulco Artevelde continued. Absolutely imperative in the fight against crime. Why do you clench your fists so hard I can almost hear your knuckles grinding? Perhaps you favor humane killing? You can afford that luxury. You mainly fight creatures which, however ridiculous it sounds, also kill humanely. I cannot afford it. I've seen merchants' convoys and homes pillaged by Nightingale and his like. I've seen what's done to people to make them reveal hiding places or magical passwords to jewel cases and strong boxes. I've seen the women Nightingale has taken a knife to just to check they weren't concealing valuables. I've seen worse things done to people simply for the sake of wanton amusement. Angoulême, whose faith moves you so, took part in such merriment. That is certain. She was in the gang long enough, and were it not for sheer accident and the fact she fled the gang, no one would have found out about the ambush in Belhaven, and you would have learned of it some other way. Perhaps she'd have shot you in the back with a crossbow. I don't like speculation. Do you know why she fled the gang? Her evidence in that regard was vague, and she didn't want to divulge it to my men. But it's no secret that Nightingale is one of those men who restrict women to a, a, let us say, primitively natural role. If he can't do it any other way, he forces that role on women. Certainly, generational conflicts contributed to it. Nightingale is a mature man, while Angoulême's last gang were urchins like her. But those are speculations. In actual fact, it interests me not. And why, may I ask, do you care? Why has Angoulême evoked such interest from the moment you saw her? Strange question. The girl informs me about an attempt on my life being planned by her former comrades on the orders of some half-elf. A sensational matter in itself, since I have no long-standing feuds with any half-elves. The girl knows only too well what company I ride with, including such details as the troubadour being called Dandelion, and that the woman has cut off her plait. That plat, particularly, makes me suspect lies or a trap in this. It wouldn't have been hard to seize and question one of the forest beekeepers I've been journeying with for the last week. And swiftly stage, that will do. Artivelde slammed his fist on the table. You race too far ahead, sir. You're accusing me of engineering something here. To what end? To deceive or ensnare you? And who are you that you so fear provocation and ensnarement? Only the thief. Fears the truth, my lord Witcher. Only the thief. Give me another explanation. No, 
You give me one, sir. Regrettably, I have none. I might say something. The prefect smiled maliciously. But for what? Let's be clear. I'm not interested in who wants to see you dead or why. I don't care where that person came by such interesting information about you, including your comrade's hair color and length. I shall go further. I might have not informed you at all about the plot on your life, Fitcher. I could simply have treated your company as utterly ignorant bait for Nightingale. Lurked, waited until the Nightingale swallowed the hook, line and sinker, and then seized him as my own. For it's him I'm interested in. Him I want. And if you met your maker, huh, a necessary evil, incidental. He fell silent. Geralt made no comment. No, you, Master Vitcher, the prefect continued after a pause, that I swore to myself that the law would rule on my turf, at any cost, and using any methods, per fas et nifas. For the law is not jurisprudence, not a weighty tome full of articles, not philosophical treatises, not peevish nonsense about justice, not hackneyed platitudes about morality and ethics. The law means safe paths and highways. It means back streets one can walk along, even after sundown. It means inns and taverns one can leave to visit the privy, leaving one's purse on the table and one's wife beside it. The law is the sleep of people certain they'd be woken by the crowing of the rooster, and not the crashing of burning roof timbers. And for those who break the law, the noose, the axe, the stake, and the red-hot iron. Punishments which deter others. Those that break the law should be caught and punished, using all available means and methods. Eh, Vitra? Is the disapproval written on your countenance a reaction to the intention or the methods? The methods, I think. For it's easy to criticize methods. But we would all prefer to live in a safe world, wouldn't we? Go on, answer. There's nothing to say. Oh, I believe there is. Mr. Fulco, Geralt said calmly, the world you envision quite pleases me. Indeed? Your expression suggests otherwise. The world you envision is made for a witcher. A witcher would never be short of work in it. Instead of codes, articles and peevish platitudes about justice, your idea creates lawlessness, anarchy, the license and self-serving of princelings and mandarins, the officiousness of careerists wanting to endear themselves to their superiors, the blind vindictiveness of fanatics, the cruelty of assassins, retribution and sadistic vengeance. Your vision is a world where people are afraid to venture out after dark, not for fear of cutthroats, but of the guardians of public order. For, after all, the result of all great crackdowns on miscreants is always that the miscreants enter the ranks of the guardians of public order en masse. Your vision is a world of bribery, blackmail and entrapment, a world of turning imperial evidence and false witnesses, a world of snoopers and coerced confessions, informing and the fear of being informed upon. And inevitably, the day will come in your world when the flesh of the wrong person will be torn with pincers, when an innocent person is hanged or impaled. And then... It will be a world of crime. In short, he finished, a world where a witcher would be in his element. Well, well, Fulco Artevelde said after a moment's silence, rubbing his eye socket through the leather patch. An idealist, a witcher, a professional, a hired killer, but an idealist nonetheless, and a moralist. That's dangerous in your profession, witcher a sign you begin to outgrow your profession. One day you'll hesitate to dispatch a trigger. For what if it's innocent? What if it's blind vengeance and blind fanaticism? I don't wish it on you. But what if one day? I don't wish this on you either, though it is possible. What if someone close to you is harmed in a cruel and sadistic way? Then I'd willingly return to this conversation, to the issue of the punishment fitting the crime. Who knows if we would then differ so greatly in our views. But today, here, now, that is not the subject of our consideration or discussion. Today we shall talk about hard facts, and you're a hard fact. Geralt raised an eyebrow slightly. Though you were scornful about my methods and my vision of a world of law, you shall aid me, my dear Witcher, in the fulfilling of that vision. I repeat, 
I swore to myself that those who break the law will get their just desserts, all of them. From the minor felon who cheats with dishonest scales at the market to he who swipes a cargo of bows and arrows meant for the army on the highway. Highwaymen, cut purses, thieves, robbers, terrorists from the Free Slopes organization who grandly call themselves freedom fighters. And Nightingale, above all, Nightingale. A fitting punishment must befall Nightingale. The method is inconsequential, as long as it's quick, before an amnesty is declared and he weasels out. Richard, I've been waiting months for something that'll let me get one step ahead of him, that'll let me nudge him, make him trip up and make the decisive error which will be his undoing. Shall I continue, or do you follow? I do, but go on. The mysterious half-elf, seemingly the initiator and instigator of the attempt, warned Nightingale about a vitra, advocated caution, advised against a cavalier attitude or swaggering arrogance and bravado. I know he had his reasons. The warning will come to nothing, though. Nightingale will make a mistake. He will attack a vitra who has been forewarned and is prepared to defend himself. A vitra who is waiting to be attacked, and it'll be the end of the robber Nightingale. I wish to strike a bargain with you, Gerhard. You shall be my informer. But don't interrupt. It's a simple agreement. Each side will meet their obligations. You put paid to Nightingale, while in exchange I... He was silent for a while, smiling slyly. I shan't ask you who you are, where you're from, or where and why you journey. I shan't ask why one of you speaks with a barely detectable Nilfgaardian accent, and why sometimes dogs and horses bristle at your party's approach. I shan't order the roll of papers to be taken from the troubadour dandelion, nor shall I check what they say. And I shall only inform Imperial Counterintelligence about you when Nightingale is dead or in my dungeon. Or even later. Why, Harry? I'll give you time and a chance. A chance to do what? To reach Toussaint? That ridiculous fairy tale duchy whose borders even an Elfgardian counterintelligence don't dare violate. And then much may change. There'll be an amnesty. There may be a truce on the far side of the Yoruga. Maybe even lasting peace. The witcher was silent for a long time. The prefect's disfigured face was unmoving. His eye shone. Agreed, Geralt finally said. Without haggling? Without conditions? I have two. How could it be otherwise? Go on. I must first ride west for a few days, to Loch Monduian, to the Druids, since... Are you making an ass of me? Fulke Artevelde interrupted abruptly. Do you mean to gull me? West. Everyone knows where your road takes you, including Nightingale, who is right now laying an ambush on your road. To the south, in Belhaven, at a spot where the Navy Valley cuts the Sans Retour Valley, leading to Tucson. Does that mean that the Druids aren't by Loch Monduirn? No nor have they been for almost a month. They headed down the Sans Retour Valley to Toussaint under the protective wings of Duchess Anarietta of Beauclair, who has a weakness for freaks, loonies and oddballs, who gladly gives asylum to such in her little fairy-tale land. You know that as well as I do, Witcher. Don't try to dupe me. I won't try, Geralt said slowly. I give you my word that I won't. I set out for Belhaven tomorrow. Haven't you forgotten something? No, I haven't forgotten. My second condition. I want Angulem. You'll rush through her amnesty and release her from the dungeon. This witcher informer needs your informer. Quickly, do you agree or not? I do. Fulco Artevelde replied almost at once. I have no choice. Angulem is yours, for I know you're only cooperating for her sake. The vampire riding at Geralt's side listened attentively and didn't interrupt. The witcher wasn't disappointed by his perspicacity. There are five of us, not four, he concluded, as soon as Geralt had finished his account. We've been travelling in a group of five since the end of August. The five of us crossed the Aruga, and Milva only cut off her plat in Riverdale about a week ago. Your fair-haired protégé knows about Milva's plat, but said four, not five. Bizarre. 
Is that the strangest part of this bizarre story? Far from it. The strangest thing is Bellhaven, the town where the ambush has reputedly been laid for us, a town set deep in the mountains on the path through the Navy Valley and the Theodrilla Pass. And we never planned to go there, the Witcher finished, spurring on Roach, who was beginning to fall behind. Three weeks ago, when that highwayman Nightingale took the job to kill me from some half-elf, we were in Angren, heading to Kaid Du, fearful of the Isgath bogs. We didn't even know we'd have to cross the Aruga. Damn it, we didn't know that this morning. We did, the vampire interrupted. We knew we were looking for the druids. We knew that just as clearly this morning as three weeks ago. That mysterious half-elf is preparing an ambush on the road leading to the druids. Certain we'll take that road. He simply has a better idea than us which way that road leads. It was the witch's turn to interrupt. How does he? We shall have to ask, which is precisely why you took the prefect's offer, isn't it? Naturally. I'm counting on being able to have a chat with Mr. Harfelf. Geralt smiled hideously. Before that happens, doesn't any explanation suggest itself to you, or simply come to mind? The vampire observed him in silence for some time. I don't like what you're saying, Geralt, he said at last. I don't like what you're thinking. I consider it an inopportune thought, taken hurriedly without reflection, resulting from prejudice and resentment. How else can one explain any way? Regis interrupted him with a tone Geralt had never heard from him. Any way but like that. Don't you think, for example, there's a possibility your fair-haired protégé is lying? Hey there, nuncle called Angoulême, riding behind them on the mule called Drahul. Don't accuse me of lying if you can't prove it. I'm not your uncle, dear child, and I'm not your dear child, uncle. Angoulême. The witcher turned around in the saddle. Be quiet. If you say so. Angoulême calmed down immediately. You're allowed to give me orders. You got me out of that hole, wrested me from Mr. Folko's talents. I obey you. You're now the leader. The head of the Hansa. Be quiet, please. Angoulême muttered under her breath, stopped urging Dracul on and remained at the rear, particularly since Regis and Geralt had put on speed to catch up with Dandelion, Gaier and Milva, who were riding in the vanguard. They were heading towards the mountains along the bank of the River Navy, whose waters, turbid and yellowish-brown following the last rains, rolled swiftly over rocks and shelves. They weren't alone. They frequently passed or overtook troops of Nilfgaardian cavalry, lone horsemen, settlers' wagons or merchants' caravans. The Amel Mountains rose up to the south, closer and closer and more and more menacing, and the pointed needle of Gorgon, Devil Mountain, was enveloped in the clouds, which quickly covered the whole sky. When are you going to tell them? the vampire asked, indicating with a glance the threesome riding ahead of them. When we make camp... Dandelion was the first to speak when Geralt had finished his account. Correct me if I'm wrong, he said, but that girl, Angoulême, whom you have so cheerfully and carelessly added to our company, is a criminal. To save her from her well-deserved penalty, you've agreed to collaborate with the Nilfgaardians. You've hired yourself out. Why, not just yourself, you've hired us all out. We are all to assist the Nilfgaardians capture or kill somebody, some local brigand. In short... You, Geralt, have become an Ilfgaardian mercenary, a bounty hunter, a hired assassin, and we've been promoted to the rank of your acolytes, or perhaps your family. You have an incredible talent for oversimplification, Dandelion, Gaia muttered. Have you really not understood what this is about, or are you just talking for talking's sake? Silence, Nilfgaardian. Geralt? Let me begin by saying... The Witcher threw a stick he'd been playing with for some time onto the fire that no one's forced to help me with my plans. I can handle it by myself, without acolytes or family. You're audacious, uncle, Angoulême began. But Nightingale's Hansa numbers 24 stout blades. They won't take fright at a witcher. And where it concerns swordsmanship, even if it were true what they say about witches, no witch could deal with two dozen by himself. You saved my life, so I'll repay you likewise, with a warning and with help. What the bloody hell is a Hansa? In Hans, Kair explained. In our tongue, it's an armed gang, but one linked by bonds of friendship. 
Our company? Precisely. I see the word has entered the local slang here. A hansa's a hansa, Angulem interrupted. In our lingo, a gang or hasser. What are we on about here? That was a serious warning. One man has no chance against the entire hansa. To make matters worse, one who knows neither Nightingale nor anyone in Belhaven or the surroundings, neither foes, friends nor allies, who knows not the roads leading to the town, and there are various. I say the Witcher won't cope. I don't know what customs prevail among you, but I won't leave the Witcher alone. As Nuncle Dandelion said, he cheerfully and carelessly took me into your company, even though I'm a criminal. My hair still stinks of the cell. There was no way of washing it. The Witcher and no other got me out of that cell and into the daylight. I'm grateful to him for that, which is why I won't leave him alone. I'll lead him to Belhaven, to Nightingale and that half-elf. I'm going with him. Me too, Kaya said at once. And me and all, Milva barked. Dandelion pressed to his chest the tube with the manuscripts, which lately he wouldn't be parted from for a single moment. He lowered his head. He was evidently struggling with his thoughts, and the thoughts were winning. Stop meditating, poet, Rages said kindly, for there's nothing to be ashamed of. You're even less cut out to participate in a bloody sword fight than I am. We weren't taught to carve up our neighbours with a blade. Furthermore, furthermore, I'm... He raised his shining eyes towards the Witcher and Milver. I'm a coward, he confessed curtly. If it's not necessary, I don't want to go through what we had on the ferry and the bridge again. Never. For which reason, I request to be left out of the fighting team heading to Belhaven. You locked me from that ferry and that bridge on your back, Milva began softly, when infirmity robbed me of my legs. If there'd been a coward there instead of you, he'd have left me and fled. There was no coward, though. Only you, Regis. Well said, Auntie, said Angulem with conviction. I have no clue what you're on about, but well said. I'm no aunt of yours. Milva's eyes flashed ominously. Have a care, miss. If you call me that again, you'll see. What will I see? Quiet, the witcher barked harshly. That's enough, Angulem. I need to take all of you to task, I see. The time of lurching blindly towards the horizon is over. For now, there might be something just over the horizon. The time for decisive action has arrived. Time for throats to be cut. For at last there's someone to attack. Those who haven't understood till now, let them understand. We finally have a clear-cut enemy within reach. The half-elf who wants us dead is an agent of forces hostile to us. Thanks to Angulem, we've been forewarned. And forewarned is forearmed, as the proverb has it. I have to get my hands on that half-elf and wring from him whose orders he's acting on. Do you finally understand, Dandelion? I'd say, the poet began calmly, that I understand more and better than you. Without any attacking or ringing needed, I surmise that the mysterious half-elf is acting on Dykstra's orders, the same Dykstra you lamed on Thanev by smashing his ankle. Following Marshal Visigurd's report, Dykstra doubtless considers us Nilfgaardian spies. And, following our flight from the core of Lyrian partisans, Queen Maeve has assuredly added a few points to the list of our crimes. You're mistaken, Dandelion, Rages softly interjected. It's not Dykstra, or Visigurd, or Maeve. Then who? Any judgment or conclusion now would be premature. Agreed. The Witcher drawled icily, which is why the matter needs to be examined in situ and conclusions drawn first hand. And I, Dandelion said, not giving up, still judge it a stupid and risky idea. It's good we've been warned about the ambush, that we know about it. Now that we know, let's give it a wide berth. Let that elf, or, or half-elf, wait for us as long as he wishes, and we'll hurry along our own road. No, the Witcher interrupted. That's the end of the discussion, my little chicks. The end of anarchy. The time has come for our Hansa to have a ringleader. Everyone, not excluding Angoulême, looked at him in expectant silence. Angoulême, Milver and I, he said, will make for Belhaven. Kair, Regis and Dandelion will ride into the Sans Retour Valley and go to Toussaint. Uh, no, Dandelion said quickly, gripping his tube more tightly, not a chance. I, I can't. Shut up. This isn't a debate. It was an order from the Hansa's leader. 
You're going to Tucson with Regis and Kair. You'll wait for us there. Tucson means death for me, the troubadour declared emphatically. If I'm recognised in Beauclair, at the castle, I'm dead. I have to tell you, no, you don't, the witcher interrupted bluntly. It's too late. You could have turned back, but you didn't want to. You remained in the company in order to rescue Siri. am I right? You are? So, you'll ride with Regis and Kaye down the San Zretour Valley. You'll wait for us in the mountains without crossing the Tucson border for now. But if, if the necessity arises, you'll have to cross it. For the druids, the ones from Kai Du, Regis's acquaintances are allegedly in Tucson. So, if the necessity arises, you'll get information about Siri from the druids and set off to get her. Alone. What do you mean alone? Do you anticipate... I'm not anticipating. I'm bearing in mind the possibility. Just in case, so to speak. As a last resort, if you prefer. Perhaps it'll all go well and we won't have to show up in Tucson. But in the event... Well, then it's important that a Nilfgaardian force doesn't follow you to Tucson. Well, it won't, Angulem cut in. It's strange, but Nilfgaard respects Tucson's marches. I've hidden from pursuers there before, but the knights there are no better than the black cloaks. Refined and courteous in their speech, but quick to seize the sword or lance, and they patrol the marches ceaselessly. They're called knights errant. They ride alone or in twos or threes, and they persecute the rabble, which means us. Witcher, one detail needs changing in your plans. What? If we are to make for Belhaven and cross swords with Nightingale, you and Sakair should go with me and let Auntie go with them. Why so? Geralt calmed Milva with a gesture. You need men for that job. Why are you raging, Auntie? I know what I'm talking about. When the time comes, it may be necessary to act with menace rather than force itself. And none of Nightingale's hands are, will be scared of a band of three, where there are two women to one man. Milva rides with us. Geralt clenched his fingers around the archer's forearm, who was genuinely infuriated. Milva, not Kair. I don't want to ride with Kair. Why's that? Angulem and Kair asked almost at the same time. Precisely, Rages said slowly. Why? Because I don't trust him the witcher said bluntly. The silence which fell was unpleasant, weighty, almost tangible. From the forest, near which a merchant's caravan and a group of other travellers had made camp, came raised voices, shouts and singing. Explain, Kaya said at last. Somebody has betrayed us, the witcher said dryly. After our conversation with the prefect and Angulheim's revelations, there's no doubt about it. And if one thinks it over carefully, one comes to the conclusion that there's a traitor among us, and it takes little pondering to guess who. It seems to me, Kaya frowned, that you have taken the liberty to suggest that the traitor is me. I don't deny that such a thought has occurred to me. The witch's voice was cold. There's much to suggest it. It would explain much, very much. Geralt, said Dandelion. Aren't you going a mite too far? Let him speak. Kaya curled his lip. Let him speak. Let him feel free. It puzzled us. Geralt swept his gaze over his companions' faces. How there could have been an error in the reckoning. You know what I'm talking about. That there are five of us and not four. We thought someone had simply made a mistake. The mysterious half-elf, the brigand Nightingale, or Angulem. But if we reject that, then the following possibility suggests itself. The company numbers five, but Nightingale is only meant to kill four, because the fifth is the assassin's accomplice. Someone who keeps them constantly informed about the company's movements. From the start, from the moment the celebrated fish soup was eaten and the company was formed. And we invited an elf guardian to join us. An elf guardian who must catch Siri, must hand her over to Emperor Emir for his life and further career depends on it. So I wasn't wrong then, Kaya said slowly. I'm a traitor after all. A lousy two-faced turncoat? Geralt, Rages began again. Excuse my frankness, but your theory is riddled with holes, and your thought, as I've already told you, is inopportune. I'm a traitor, Kaya repeated, as though he hadn't heard the vampire's words. 
As I understand it, however, there is no proof of it, only vague circumstantial evidence and the witch's speculations. As I understand it, the burden of proving my own innocence falls on me. So I'll have to prove I'm not what I appeared to be. Is that right? Don't be pompous, Nilfgaardian, snapped Geralt, standing before Kaia and glaring at him. If I had proof of your guilt, I wouldn't be wasting time talking. I'd have filleted you like a herring already. Do you know the principle of qui bono? So answer me. Who, aside from you, had even the slightest reason to betray me? Who, aside from you, would have gained anything from it? A loud and long-drawn-out crack resounded from the merchant's camp. A firework exploded in a burst of red and gold. Rockets shot out a swarm of golden bees and coloured rain fell against the black sky. I'm not what I appear, said the young Nils' guardian in a powerful, resonant voice. Unfortunately, I can't prove it. But I can do something else. Do what befits me, what I have to do when I'm being slandered and insulted, when my honour is besmutched and my dignity sullied. His attack was as swift as lightning, but it still wouldn't have surprised the witcher had it not been for Geralt's aching knee, which hampered his movements. Geralt was unable to dodge, and the gloved fist smashed him in the jaw with such force he fell backwards and tumbled straight into the campfire, throwing up clouds of sparks. He leapt up, too slow again owing to the pain in his knee. Kair was already upon him. Again, the witcher didn't even manage to duck. The fist rammed into the side of his head and colourful fireworks flared up in his eyes, even more glorious than the ones the merchants had set off. Geralt swore and pounced on Kair, wrapped his arms around him and knocked him to the ground. They rolled around in the gravel, thumping and pummeling each other. And all in the eerie and unnatural light of the fireworks bursting in the sky. Stop it, Dandelion yelled. Stop it, you bloody fools! Kair artfully knocked the ground out from under Geralt and smote him in the teeth as he was trying to get up and punched him again. Geralt crouched, tensed and kicked him, not in his crotch where he had aimed, but in the thigh. They grappled again, fell and rolled over, thumping one another wherever they could, blinded by the punches and the dust and sand getting into their eyes. Then suddenly they came apart, rolling in opposite directions, cowering and shielding their heads from the blows raining down on them. Having unfastened her sturdy leather belt, Milva had seized it by the buckle, wound it around her fist, fallen on the fighters and begun to flog them with lusty blows with all her might, sparing neither the strap nor her arm. The belt whistled and fell with a dry crack, first on Kair's, then on Geralt's arms, back and shoulders. When they parted, Milva hopped from one to the other like a grasshopper, thrashing them evenly so that neither of them received any less or any more than the other. You thick, thickheads, she yelled, cracking Geralt across the back. You doltish dolts, I'll teach you both a lesson. Enough, she yelled even louder, lashing Kaye's arms with which he was shielding his head. Had enough? Calm down now. Stop, the witcher howled. Enough! Enough, echoed Kaye, who was huddled up in a ball. That'll do. Uh, that will suffice, said the vampire. Uh, that really will suffice, Milva. The archer was panting heavily, wiping her forehead with her fist, belt still wound around it. Bravo, said Angoulême. Bravo, auntie. Milva turned on her heel and thrashed her across the shoulders with all her might. Angoulême screamed, sat down and burst into tears. I told you, Milva puffed, not to call me that. I told you. It's all right. In a somewhat shaking voice, Dandelion reassured the merchants and travellers who'd run over from the neighbouring campfires. Uh, just a misunderstanding between friends. A, a lover's tiff. It's already been patched up. The witcher probed a wobbly tooth with his tongue and spat out the blood dripping from his cut lip. He felt the welts beginning to rise on his back and shoulders and his ear, which had been lashed by the strap, seeming to swell to the dimensions of a cauliflower. Beside him, Kair clumsily hauled himself up from the ground, holding his cheek. Broad red marks quickly spread over his exposed forearm. Rain smelling of sulphur, ash from the last firework, was falling on the ground. Angoulême sobbed woefully, holding her shoulders. Milva threw aside her belt. Then, after a moment's hesitation, knelt, embraced and hugged her without a word.
I suggest, said the vampire frigidly, that you shake hands. I suggest never, ever revisiting this matter. Unexpectedly, a gale came down from the mountains in whispered gusts, in which it seemed some kind of ghastly howling, crying and wailing could be heard. The clouds, being blown across the sky, took on fantastic shapes as the crescent moon turned as red as blood. They were woken before dawn by a furious chorus of goatsucker nightjars and the whirring of their wings. They set off just after the rising of the sun, which later lit up the snows on the mountain peaks with blinding flame. They had left much earlier than that, before the sun had appeared from behind the peaks. Actually, before it appeared, the sky had become overcast. They rode amongst forests, and the road led higher and higher, which was discernible in the tree species. The oak and hornbeam finished abruptly, and they rode into a gloom of beech lined with fallen leaves, smelling of mould, cobwebs and mushrooms. The mushrooms were in abundance. The damp year-end had yielded a plentiful harvest. In places, the forest floor literally vanished beneath the caps of seps, morels and agarics. The beech wood was quiet and looked as though most of the songbirds had flown away to their mysterious winter haven. Only crows at the edge of the undergrowth cawed, feathers dripping. Then the beech ended and spruce replaced it. The scent of resin filled the air. More and more often they encountered bald hillocks and stone runs where they were caught by strong winds. The river Nevi foamed over steps and cascades. Its water, in spite of the rain, had turned crystal clear. Gorgon loomed up on the horizon, ever closer. All year long, glaciers and snows flowed from the angular sides of the huge mountain, which meant Gorgon always looked as though it were clad in white sashes. The peak of Devil Mountain was constantly swathed in veils of clouds, like the head and neck of an enigmatic bride. Sometimes, though, Gorgon shook her white raiment like a dancer. The sight was breathtaking, but brought death. Avalanches ran from the peak's sheer walls, wiping out everything in their path, down to the scree at the foot and further down the hillside, to the highest spruce stands above the Theodula Pass, above the Navy and Sans Retour Valleys, above the black circles of mountain tarns. The sun, which in spite of everything had managed to penetrate the clouds, set much too quickly. It simply hid behind the mountains to the west, setting light to them with a purple and golden glow. They stopped for the night. The sun rose, and the time came for them to part. Milva carefully wrapped a silk scarf around her head. Ragius put on his hat. Yet again, Geralt checked the position of the sile on his back and the daggers in his boots. Beside them, Kair was wetting his long Nilfgaardian sword. Angoulême tied a woolen band around her forehead and slipped a hunting knife, a present from Milva, into her boot. The archer and Regis saddled up their horses. The vampire handed Angoulême the reins to his black while he mounted the mule, Drahul. They were ready. Only one thing remained to be taken care of. Come here, everybody. They approached. Kair, son of Kyilach, Geralt began, trying not to sound pompous. I wronged you with unfounded suspicion and behaved shabbily towards you. I hereby apologise before everyone with bowed head. I apologise and ask you to forgive me. I also ask you all for forgiveness, as I shouldn't have made you watch or listen to it. I vented my fury and resentment on Kair and all of you. It was caused by knowing who betrayed us. I know who betrayed and abducted Siri, whom we aim to rescue. I'm angry because I'm talking about a person who was once very close to me. Where we are, what we're planning, what routes we're taking and whither we're heading, all was uncovered with the help of scanning, detecting magic. It's none too difficult for a mistress of magic to remotely detect and observe a person who was once well-known and close, with whom they had a long-term psychic contact which permits the creation of a matrix. But the sorcerer and the sorceress of whom I speak made a mistake. They've revealed themselves. They made an error when counting the members of the company, and that error betrayed them. Tell them, Regis. Geralt may be right, Regis said slowly. Like every vampire, 
I'm invisible to magical visual probing and scanning. That is, to a detecting spell. A vampire may be tracked using an analytical spell from close up, but it is not possible to detect a vampire with a remote scanning spell. The detection will report that there's no one there. Thus, only a sorcerer could be mistaken regarding us, to register four people where there were actually five. That is, four people and one vampire. We shall exploit the sorcerer's error, the witcher continued. Kair, Angulem and I shall ride to Belhaven to talk to the half-elf who hired assassins to kill us. We won't ask the half-elf on whose orders he's acting, for we know that already. We'll ask him where the sorcerers on whose orders he is acting are. When we learn their location, we'll go there and exact our revenge. Everybody was silent. We stopped counting the date, so we haven't even noticed it's the 25th of September. Two days ago, it was the night of the equinox. The equinox. Yes, that's exactly the night you're thinking about. I see your dejection. I see what your eyes are saying. We received a signal that dreadful night when the merchants camping beside us were keeping their courage up with aqua vitae, singing and fireworks. You probably had a less distinct sense of foreboding than Kair and I, but you're speculating too. You suspect and I'm afraid your suspicions are well-founded. The crows flying over the moorland cawed. Everything indicates that Ciri is dead. She perished two nights ago at the equinox. Somewhere far from here, alone amongst hostile people. Strangers. And all that's left to us is vengeance. A cruel and bloody revenge about which stories will still be told a hundred years hence. Stories which folk will be afraid to listen to after nightfall, and the hand of any who would repeat such a crime will tremble at the thought of our vengeance. We shall give a horrible example of terror, using the ways of Mr. Fulco Ottiveldi, wise Mr. Fulco, who knows how blackguards and scoundrels should be treated. The illustration of terror we shall give will astonish even him. So let us begin, and may hell assist us. Kair, Angulem, to horse, we ride up the navy towards Belhaven. Dandelion, Milva, Regis, make for Sans Retour towards Toussaint's borders. You won't get lost. Gorgon will point the way. Goodbye. Siri stroked the black cat, which had returned to the cottage in the swamp, as is customary with all cats in the world, when its love of freedom and dissolution had been undermined by cold, hunger and discomfort. Now it was lying in the girl's lap and arching its back against her hand with a purr signifying profound bliss. The cat couldn't have cared less about what the girl was saying. It was the only time I dreamed of Geralt, Siri began. From the time we parted on the Isle of Thaneth, from the Tower of the Seagull, I'd never seen him in a dream. So I thought he was dead. And then suddenly came that dream, like the ones I used to have, dreams which Yennefer said were prophetic precognitive, that they either show the past or the future. That was the day before the equinox, in a small town whose name I don't recall, in a cellar where Bonart had locked me, after he'd flogged me and made me admit who I am. Did you divulge to him who you are? Visogotta raised his head. Did you tell him everything? I paid for my cowardice, she swallowed. With humiliation and self-contempt. Tell me about your dream. In it, I saw a mountain, lofty, sheer and sharp like a stone knife. I saw Geralt. I heard what he was saying exactly, every word as though he were with me. I remember I wanted to call out and say it wasn't like that at all, that none of it was true, that he'd made an awful mistake that he'd got everything wrong. That it wasn't the equinox yet, so even if I happened to have died on the equinox, he shouldn't have declared me dead earlier, when I was still alive. And he shouldn't have accused Yennefer or said such things about her. She was silent for a time, stroking the cat and sniffing hard. But I couldn't say a word. I couldn't even breathe. 
as though I was drowning. And I awoke. The last thing I saw that I recall from that dream was three riders, Geralt and two others, galloping along a ravine with water gushing from its walls. Visogota said nothing. Had someone crept up to the shack with the sunken, moss-grown thatched roof after nightfall, had they peered through the gaps in the shutters, they would have seen a grey-bearded old man listening raptly to a story told by an ashen-haired girl in the dimly lit interior, her cheek disfigured by a nasty scar. They would have seen a black cat lying on the girl's lap, purring lazily, demanding to be stroked, to the delight of the mice scampering around the room. But no one could have seen it, for the cottage with the sunken moss-grown thatched roof was well hidden among the fog in the boundless periplot marshes, where no one dared to venture. It is well known that when a witcher inflicts pain, suffering and death, he experiences absolute ecstasy and bliss, such as a devout and normal man only experiences during sexual congress with his wedded spouse, ibidem cum ejaculatio. This leads one to conclude that, also in this matter, also, a witcher is a creature contrary to nature, an immoral and filthy degenerate, born of the blackest and most foul-smelling hell, since surely only a devil could derive bliss from suffering and pain. Anonymous Monstrum or a description of a witcher Chapter 6 They left the main track, leading along the navy valley, and took a short cut through the mountains. They rode as quickly as the track would allow. It was narrow and winding, hugging fantastically shaped rocks covered in patches of colourful moss and lichen. They rode between vertical rocky cliffs from which ragged ribbons of cascades and waterfalls tumbled. They rode through ravines and gorges, across small rickety bridges, over precipices at the bottom of which streams seethed with white foam. The angular blade of Gorgon seemed to rear up directly above their heads. The peak of Devil Mountain was not visible, but shrouded in the clouds and fog cloaking the sky. The weather, as happens in the mountains, worsened in the course of a few hours. It began to drizzle, bitingly and disagreeably. When dusk fell, the three of them nervously and impatiently looked around for a shepherd's bothy, a tumble-down barn, or even a cave anything that would protect them from the weather during the night. I think it's stopped raining, Angulem said hopefully. It's only dripping from the holes in the roof now. Tomorrow, fortunately, we'll be near Belhaven, and we can always sleep in a shed or a barn on the outskirts. Aren't we entering the town? Out of the question. Mounted strangers on horses are conspicuous, and Nightingale has plenty of informers in the town. We were thinking about using ourselves as bait, no, she interrupted. That's a rotten plan. The fact that we're together will arouse suspicion. Nightingale's a cunning bastard, and news of my capture has certainly spread, and if anything alarms him, it'll also reach the half-elf. So, what do you suggest? We skirt around the town from the east, from the mouth of the Sansa Tour Valley. There are ore mines there. I have a mate who works in one of them. We'll visit him. Who knows, with a bit of luck, the visit might prove profitable. Could you speak more plainly? I'll tell you tomorrow, in the mine, so as not to jinx it. Kair threw some birch branches on the fire. It had been raining all day, and no other fuel would have burned. But the birch, though wet, crackled a little and then flared up in a tall blue flame. Where are you from, Angulem? From Sintra, Witcher. It's a country by the sea, by the mouth of the Yaruga. I know where Sintra is. So why'd you ask if you know all that? Do I fascinate you so? A little, let's say. They fell silent. The fire crackled on. My mother, Angoulême finally said, staring into the flame, was a Sintran noblewoman from a high-ranking family, I believe. The family had a sea cat in its coat of arms. I'd show it to you. I used to have a little medallion with that bloody sea cat on it from my mother. But I lost it at dice. That family, though, besought them and their sea cat, disowned me, because my mother was said to have slept with some churl, a stableman, I believe, 
and so I was a bastard, a disgrace, an ignominious stain on their honour. They gave me away to be raised by distant relatives. Admittedly, they didn't have a cat, dog or any other fucker on their arms, but they weren't bad to me. They sent me to school and generally didn't beat me, though they reminded me pretty often who I was, a bastard conceived in the straw. My mother visited me maybe three or four times when I was small. Then she stopped. And to be honest, I didn't give a shit. How did you fall among criminals? You sound like an examining magistrate, she snorted, contorting her face grotesquely. Among criminals, pshaw, fallen from virtue. <laughs> she grunted, rummaged around in her bosom, and took something out which the witcher couldn't see clearly. One-eyed Falco, she said indistinctly, rubbing something vigorously into her gum and inhaling. Isn't a bad old fellow. He took what he took, but he left the powder. Want a pinch, witcher? No, I'd rather you didn't take it either. Why? I just would. Can you? I don't use fish stick. Well, it's clear I've landed up with a couple of goody-goodies. She shook her head. You'll probably start preaching that I'll go blind, deaf and bald from this stuff, I suppose, and give birth to a crippled child. Leave it, Angle Lem, and finish the story. The young woman sneezed loudly. Very well, as you wish. Where was I? Ah, the war broke out, you know, with Nilfgaard. My relatives lost everything, had to abandon their house. They had three children of their own and I'd become a burden to them, so they gave me away to an orphanage. It was run by the priests of some temple or other. It was a jolly place as it happens. A bordello, a whorehouse, simple as that, for people who like their fruit tart and with white pips, get it? Young girls, and young boys too. So... When I joined them, I was too grown up, adult. There were no takers for me. Quite unexpectedly, she blushed with shame, visible even in the firelight. Well, almost none, she added through clenched teeth. How old were you then? Fifteen. I met one girl and five boys there, my age and a bit older, and we'd teamed up in no time. We knew, didn't we, the legends and tales about Mad Dea, about Blackbeard, about the Cassini brothers. We wanted to get out on the road to taste freedom, to maraud. So what, we told ourselves, if they feed us twice a day? Does that give some lechers the right to screw us? Language, Angulem. Keep it in moderation. The girl hawked noisily and spat into the campfire. Preg. Very well. I'll get to the point, because I don't feel like talking. We found knives in the orphanage kitchen. We just had to wet them well on a stone and strop them on a belt. We made some excellent clubs from the turned legs of an oaken chair. All we needed was horses and coin, so we waited for two perverts, regular customers, old buggers of ugh, at least forty. They came, sat down, sipped wine and waited for the priests to tie the chosen kid to a special contraption, as was customary. But they didn't get their oats that day. Angulem. All right, all right. In short, we knifed and clubbed to death those two lecherous creeps, three priests and a page. The only one not to bolt, he was guarding the horses. We roasted the temple warden's souls until he changed his mind about giving us the key to the coffer. But we spared his life, because he was a nice old gaffer, always kind to us. And we took to the road to plunder. We had our ups and downs, won some, lost some. We gave and took some beatings. Full bellies, empty bellies. <laughs> We're often empty. I've eaten everything that crawls, anything you could fucking catch, and things that fly. I even ate a child's kite once, because it was made of flour and water paste. She fell silent, then distractedly messed up her flaxen hair. What's past is past. I'll just say this. No one who escaped with me from the orphanage is still alive. The last two, Owen and Abel, were dispatched a few days ago by Mr. Fulco's pikeman. Abel surrendered like me, but they stuck him anyway, even though he'd thrown down his sword. They spared me. Don't think it was out of the goodness of their hearts. They'd already spread eagled me on a cloak, but an officer ran up and stopped their sport. And then you saved me from the scaffold. She was silent for a time. Witcher? Yes. 
I know how to express gratitude. So if you'd ever like to... Excuse me? I'll go and look over the horses, Kaya said hurriedly, and rose, wrapping himself in his cloak. I'll take a walk around the place. The girl sneezed, sniffed and cleared her throat. Not a word, Angulem, Geralt warned her, genuinely angry, genuinely confused, genuinely embarrassed. Not another word. She gave a slight cough again. Do you really not want me? Not even a bit? You've already tasted Milva's strap, little punk. If you're not quiet this instant, you'll get a second helping. I won't see another thing. Good girl. Pits and holes, shored up and lined with planks, connected by footbridges, ladders and scaffolding, gaped in a hillside covered in misshapen and twisted pine trees. Catwalks, supported by crisscrossed posts, protruded from the holes. People were busily pushing carts and wheelbarrows along some of the catwalks. The contents of the carts and wheelbarrows, which at first sight seemed to be dirty, stony soil, were being tipped from the catwalks into a great quadrangular trough, or rather a complex of increasingly small troughs divided up by shutters. Water, supplied from a forested hillock along gutters supported on low trestles, gushed through them, and yet more channeled it away down towards a cliff. Angoulême dismounted and indicated to Geralt and Kair to do likewise. Leaving their mounts by a fence, they headed towards the buildings, wading through mud beside the leaking gutters and pipes. It's an iron ore washing plant, Angoulême said, pointing at the equipment. The ore is carted out of those mine shafts, tipped into the troughs and rinsed with water from the stream. The ore settles on the sifter and it's taken from there. There are tons of mines and washing plants around Belhaven and the ore is carted down the valley to Mag Turger, where there are bloomeries and forges because there are more forests there and you need wood for smelting. Thanks for the lesson. Geralt cut her off sourly. I've seen a few mines in my lifetime. I know what's needed for smelting. Why have we come here? To have a chat with one of my mates, the foreman here. Follow me. Ah, I can see him, over there, outside the joiner's shop. Let's go. You mean that dwarf? Yeah, he's called Golan Drotsdek. As I said, he's the foreman here. You said. You didn't say, though, what you want to chat with him about. Look at your boots. Geralt and Kair obediently examined their footwear, which was covered in sludge of a strange reddish hue. The half-elf we're seeking, Angoulême anticipated the question, had the same crimson mud on his shoes when he was talking to Nightingale. Get it? I do now. And the dwarf? Don't say a word to him. I'll do the talking. He should take you for types that don't talk, just cleave. Look tough. They didn't have to make a special effort. Some of the miners who were watching quickly looked away. Others froze with mouths open. The ones in their way hurriedly stood aside. Geralt guessed why. He and Kair still had visible bruises, cuts and swellings, vivid tokens of their fight and the hiding Milva had given them. They looked like types who took pleasure from punching each other in the face and wouldn't need much persuasion to punch someone else. The dwarf, Angoulême's mate, was standing outside a building bearing the sign Joinery Shop and painting something on a board made of two planed staves. He saw them coming, put down his brush and tin of paint and scowled. Then an expression of utter amazement suddenly appeared behind his paint-spattered beard. Angoulême? What cheer, Drotsdek? Is it you? The dwarf's hairy jaw fell open. Is it really you? No, it isn't. It's the freshly resurrected prophet Lebioda. Ask me another Golan, a more intelligent one, perhaps. Don't mock, flaxen hair. I never expected to see you again. Molika were here five days since. He says they nabbed you and stuck you on a stake in Rita Bruna. He vowed it were true. Everything has its benefits. The girl shrugged. Next time Mulika borrows some money and vows he'll pay it back, you'll know what his vow's worth. I knew that before, the dwarf replied, blinking quickly and twitching his nose like a rabbit. I wouldn't lend him a broken farthing, even if he bent down and licked my boots. But you're alive and kicking. I'm glad, I'm glad. Hey, 
Perhaps you'll pay back your debt too, eh? Perhaps. Who knows? I know who you got with you, eh, Flaxen Air? Sound fellows? Right to mates. And where are the gods leading you? Astri, as usual. Angoulême, unconcerned by the witcher looking daggers at her, sniffed up a pinch of fish tech, rubbing the rest into her gum. Fancy a snort, Golan? I should see. The dwarf took and inhaled a pinch of the narcotic. Truth be told, the girl continued, I'm thinking about going to Belhaven. You don't know if Nightingale and his hands are hanging around somewhere there. Golan Drojdek cocked his head. You, Flaxenair, should stay out of Nightingale's way. He's as pissed off with you, they say, as a wolverine roused from his winter sleep. Blow that? And when the news reached him that I'd been spitted on a palisade by a two-horse team, didn't his heart change? Didn't he regret it? Didn't he shed a tear, foul his beard with snot? Not at all. I heard, he said, Angulem's finally got what she had coming to her, a stake up the ass. Oh, the boor. Vulgar, lightish chump. Prefect Falco would call him the arse end of society. To me, he's what comes out of the arse. You will be better off, Flaxenair, saying things like that out of his earshot, and not hanging around Belhaven. Give it a wide berth. And if you have to enter the town, better go in disguise. Hey, Golan, don't teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Wouldn't dream of it. Then listen, dwarf. Angoulême rested a boot on a step leading to the joinery shop. I'll ask you a question. Don't hurry with the answer. Think it over well. Ask away. A half-elf hasn't caught your eye recently by any chance. A stranger? Not from round here? Golan Drochtek breathed in, sneezed loudly and wiped his nose on his wrist. A half-elf, you say? What half-elf? Don't play the fool, Drochtek. The one who hired Nightingale for a contract. A contract killing. Of a witcher. A witcher? Golan Drostek laughed, picking his board up from the ground. Well, I never. Believe it or not, we're looking for a witcher. Look, we're painting signs and putting them all up around you. See? Witcher wanted. Decent pay, board and lodgings included. Particulars at the office of the Petite Babette or mine. How's it spelled, anyway? Particulars or particulars? Just paint it out and write details. What do you need a witcher at the mine for? And now she's asking. Monsters, of course. Like what? Vespertils and Barbagazzis. They're running rampant in the lower galleries. Angoulême glanced at Geralt, who nodded to confirm he knew what that was about, and coughed meaningfully to signal that she ought to get back to the subject. Getting back to the subject, the girl understood at once. What do you know about that half-elf? I don't know nothing about no half-elf. I told you to think it over well. So I did. Golan Drostek suddenly assumed a sly expression, and I decided it doesn't pay to know anything about this case. Meaning? Meaning it's shaky here. The ground's shaky, and the times are shaky. Gangs, Nils guardians, partisans from the free slopes, and diverse foreign elements, half-elves, each one raring to commit assault. Meaning? Angoulême wrinkled her nose. Meaning you owe me money, flaxen air, and rather than pay it back, you're getting deeper into debt. Serious debt, because you might get a whack on the head for what you're asking, and not with a bare hand, but an axe. What kind of business is that for me? Will it pay if I do know something about the half-elf, eh? Will I get anything out of it? For if it's only risk and no profit. Geralt had had enough. The conversation was boring him, the jargon and the dwarf's mannerisms annoying him. As quick as lightning, he caught the dwarf by the beard, yanked down and pushed him over. Golan Drochdek tripped over the can of paint and fell. The witcher leapt on him, pressed his knee against his chest and flashed a knife in front of his eyes. You may profit, he growled, by escaping with your life. Talk. Golan's eyes looked as though they would pop out of their sockets and go for a stroll. Talk, Geralt repeated. Tell us what you know. Otherwise, when I slash your throat open, you'll drown before you bleed to death. The, the, the Rialto, the dwarf stammered. The, the Rialto bit. The Rialto mine didn't differ very much from the Petite Babette mine, 
or from the other mines and quarries that Angoulême, Geralt and Cahir had passed on the way, which were called Autumn Manifest, Old Mine, New Mine, Juliet Mine, Celestine, Common Cause and Lucky Pit. Work was in full swing in all of them, soil and ore being carted out of every shaft and pit to be tipped onto a sluice and washed in the sifters. There was an abundance of the characteristic red mud in all of them. Rialto was a large mine, located near the top of the hill. The crown had been sliced away and formed a quarry. The actual washing station was located on a terrace carved out of the hillside. Here, at the foot of a vertical wall, in which shafts and drifts scaped, was a sluice, sifters, gutters and other mining paraphernalia. There was also a veritable village of wooden huts, sheds, shacks and hovels covered in bark. I don't know anyone here, said the girl, tying her reins to the fence. But let's try and talk to the overseer. Geralt, if you could, maybe don't seize him by the throat immediately or threaten him with a shiv. First we'll talk. Don't teach your grandmother to suck eggs, Angolem. They didn't get as far as talking. They didn't even reach the building where they suspected the overseer had his office. They ran straight into five horsemen in the square where the ore was being loaded onto wagons. Oh, shit, said Angoulême. Oh, shit, look what the cat dragged in. What's up? They're Nightingale's men, here to extort protection money, and they've recognised me. Damn it, now we're in the shit. Can't you lie our way out of it? Gaia muttered. I wouldn't count on it. Why? I skinned Nightingale when I escaped from the Hansa. They won't forgive me for that. But I'll try. Be quiet. Keep your eyes open and stay alert. For anything. The horsemen rode up, with two of them at the head. A fellow with long, grisly hair wearing a wolfskin, and a young beanpole with a beard, clearly grown to cover acne scars. They feigned indifference, but Geralt noticed veiled flashes of hatred in the glances they were casting at Angoulême. Flaxen here! Novasad, Yerl, greetings. Nice out today. Pity about the rain. The grizzly-haired man dismounted, or rather leapt down from the saddle, briskly swinging his right leg over his horse's head. The others also dismounted. Grizzled hair handed his reins to Yerl, the beanpole with a beard, and came closer. Well, well, he said. Our big-mouthed little magpie. Looks like you're alive and well. Alive and kicking? You brazen little upstart. There was a rumour you were kicking, but on a stake. Rumour has it, one-eyed Falco caught you. Rumour has it, you sang like a bird when you were tortured, told them everything they asked. Rumour has it, Angolin snapped, that your mother only charged her customers four shillings, but no one would give her more than two. The brigand spat at her feet contemptuously. Angolin hissed again, just like a cat. Listen, Novasad, she said insolently, arms akimbo. I need to talk something over with Nightingale. Interesting. Likewise he with you. Shut your trap and listen, while I still feel like talking. Two days ago, a mile outside Reed Bruna, me and these companions of mine slotted that witcher the contract out for. Get it? Novosad glanced knowingly at his comrades and then pulled up his sleeves, scrutinizing Geralt and Kair. Your new companions, he drawled. Ha! Huh. I see from their faces they're no choir boys. They killed the witcher, you say? How? A stab in the back? Or in their dreams? That's a minor particular. Angulem grimaced like a little monkey. The major particular is that the witcher is six feet under. Listen, Novasad, I don't want to quarrel with Nightingale or get in his way. But the deal's a deal. The half-elf gave you an advance on the contract, so I shan't demand it. That's your money for costs and for your trouble. But the second instalment, which the half-elf promised after the job was done, that's mine by right. By right? Yes. Angoulême ignored his sarcastic tone. We carried out the contract and killed the witcher, proof of which we can show the half-elf. Then I'll take what's mine and head off into the sunset. I don't mean to compete with Nightingale, because the slopes aren't big enough for the both of us. Tell him that, Novasad. Is that all? Stinging sarcasm again. And a kiss. Angoulême snorted. You can hold your arse out on my behalf, per procurer. I've a better idea, Novasad declared, glancing at his companions. I'll drag your arse to him, Angoulême, 
I'll deliver you to him in fetters, and then he'll discuss and straighten everything out with you, and settle up everything. The question is who owns the money from the half-elf Skiru's contract, and your repayment for what you stole, and that the slopes aren't big enough for all of us. Everything will be sorted out the same way in fine detail. There's one snag. Angulem lowered her hands. How do you plan to take me to Nightingale, Novasad? Like this. The brigand held out a hand. By the neck. Geralt's sile was out in a flash and under Novisad's nose. I advise against it, he snarled. Novisad sprang back, drawing his sword. Yirul drew a curved saber with a hiss from the scabbard on his back. The others followed their example. I still advise against it, the witcher said. Novisad swore. His eyes swept over his comrades. Arithmetic wasn't his strong point, but he calculated that five was considerably more than three. Get them, he yelled, lunging at Geralt. Kill them! The witcher evaded the blow with a half turn and slashed him viciously across the temple. Even before Novosad had fallen, Angoulême ducked forward with a short jab. Her knife whistled in the air and Yirul reeled away, the bone handle jutting from beneath his chin. The brigand dropped his saber and jerked the knife from his throat with both hands spurting blood but Angoulême sprang up to kick him in the chest and knocked him to the ground. Meanwhile, Geralt had struck another bandit. Kair hacked the next one to death. Something shaped like a slice of watermelon dropped from the robber's skull after a powerful blow of his Nilfgaardian blade. The last thug fled and jumped onto his horse. Kair tossed up his sword, seized it by the blade, and hurled it like a javelin, striking the brigand right between the shoulder blades. The horse neighed and jerked its head, sat hard on its haunches and stamped its hooves, dragging the corpse over the red mud, its hand tangled up in the reins. The whole thing took less than five heartbeats. Hey! yelled somebody from among the buildings. Help! Help! Murder! Vicious killers! Troops! Call out the troops! shouted another miner, shooing away children who, as is the immemorial custom of all the world's children, had appeared from nowhere to watch and get in the way. Someone run and call the army! Angoulême picked up her knife, wiped and sheathed it. Let them run by all means, she shouted back, looking around. What is it, quarrymen? Are you blind or what? That was self-defense. They fell on us, the bloody thugs. Don't you know them? Haven't they done you enough harm? Haven't they extorted enough from you? She sneezed loudly. Then she tore the purse from the belt of the still twitching Novosad and leaned over Yirul. Angulem. What? Leave it. Why should I? It spoils. Short of money. Angulem. You. A voice suddenly shouted. This way, please. Three men stood in the open doorway to a barrack serving as the tool store. Two of them were heavies with low foreheads and closely cropped hair of undoubtedly limited intelligence. The third, the one who'd shouted to them, was a very tall, dark-haired, handsome man. I couldn't help overhearing the conversation preceding the incident, the man said. I found it hard to believe you'd killed the witcher, thinking it empty bragging. I don't think that now. Step inside. Angoulême drew an audible intake of breath. She glanced at the witcher and nodded barely perceptibly. The man was a half-elf. The half-elf Shkiru was tall, well over six feet. He wore his dark hair tied on his neck in a ponytail falling down his back. His mixed blood was betrayed by his eyes, which were large, almond-shaped and yellowish-green like a cat's. So you killed the witcher, he said again, smiling repulsively. Forestalling Homer's dragon, also called Nightingale? Fascinating, fascinating. Put simply, I ought to pay you fifty florins, the second instalment, which means Stragan received his two score and ten florins for nothing, for you surely can't suppose he'll give it up. How I settle accounts with Nightingale is my business, said Angoulême, sitting on a crate and swinging her legs. The contract on the Witcher was a one-off commission, and we carried out that commission. We did, not Nightingale. The Witcher's in the ground. His company, all three of them, are in the ground. In other words... Job done. At least that's what you claim. How did it happen? Angoulême kept swinging her legs. I'll write my life story when I'm old, 
she declared in her usual impudent tone. I'll describe how this, that and the other took place. You'll have to hold on till then, Mr. Skiru. It shames you that much, then, the half-breed remarked coldly. So you did the deed foully and treacherously. Does that bother you? Geralt asked. Skiru looked at him intently. No, he answered after a moment. Geralt, the witcher of Rivia, didn't deserve a better fate. He was a simpleton and a fool. If he'd had a finer, more honest and honourable death, legends would have sprung up around him. But he didn't merit a legend. Death is always the same. Not always. The half-elf turned his head, trying to catch a glimpse of Geralt's eyes, shaded by his hood. Not always, I assure you. I presume you dealt the mortal blow. Geralt didn't reply. He felt the overwhelming urge to grab the crossbreed by the ponytail, knock him to the floor and wring every detail out of him, knocking his teeth out one by one with his sword pommel. He held himself back. Good sense suggested Angoulême's hoax might bear better results. As you wish, said Skiru, not getting an answer. I won't insist on the report about the course of events. It's clearly difficult for you to talk about it, and there's clearly not very much to boast about. Supposing, of course, that your silence doesn't stem from something quite different. For example, that nothing at all occurred. Do you perhaps have any proof of the veracity of your words? We cut off the witch's right hand, Angoulême replied impassively. But later, a raccoon took it and devoured it. So we have only this. Geralt slowly unbuttoned his shirt and drew out his medallion with the wolf's head. The witcher wore it around his neck. May I? Geralt didn't hesitate for long. The half-elf hefted the medallion in his palm. Now, I believe, he said slowly, the Gugor emanates powerful magic. Only a witcher could have had something like this. And the witcher, Angulem continued, wouldn't have let it be taken from him while he was still breathing. It's rock-solid evidence, so slap the cash on the table, maester. Shkiru carefully put the medallion away, took a wad of papers from his bosom, put them down on the table and spread them out with a hand. Over here, please. Angoulême hopped off the crate and walked over, mocking him and swinging her hips. She leaned over the table. As quick as a flash, Skiru grabbed her hair, slammed her down on the table and shoved a knife to her throat. The girl didn't even have time to cry out. Geralt and Kair already had their swords in their hands, but it was too late. The half-elf's assistants, the muscle men with low foreheads, were holding iron hooks, but they were in no hurry to come closer. Drop your swords, Skiru snarled. Both of you, swords on the floor, or I'll widen the slut's smile. Don't listen, Angulem began, and ended with a shriek as the half-elf ground his fist into her hair and scored her skin with a dagger. A glistening, red, wavy line trickled down the girl's neck. Swords on the ground. I'm serious. Perhaps we could talk this out. Geralt, heedless of the rage seething inside him, decided to stall for time. Like civilized folk. The half-elf laughed venomously. Talk it out. With you, witcher. I was sent here to finish you off, not talk. Yes, yes, freak. You were lying, putting on a song and dance, but I recognized you the moment I saw you. You'd been described precisely to me. Can you guess who described you so precisely? Who gave me precise instructions about where and in what company I'd find you? Oh, I'm certain you've guessed. Release the girl. But I don't just know you from the description, Skiru continued with no intention of releasing Angoulême. I've seen you before. I even tracked you once, in Temeria, in July. I followed you on horseback to the town of Dorian and to the chambers of the jurists Kodringer and Fenn. Ring any bells? Geralt twisted his sword so that the blade flashed in the half-elf's eyes. I wonder, he said icily, how you mean to get out of this stalemate, Skiru. I see two solutions. The first, you let go of the girl right away. The second, you kill the girl, and a second later your blood paints the walls and ceiling a pretty red. Your weapons! Skiru brutally yanked Angoulême's hair, will be lying on the ground before I count to three, 
Then I start butchering the slut. We'll see how much you manage to cut off. Not much, I reckon. One, two. Geralt had begun his own reckoning, whirling the sile in a hissing mullinet. The thudding of hooves, the neighing and snorting of horses, and yelling reached them from outside. And what now? Skiro laughed. That's what I was waiting for. It's not stalemate, but checkmate. My friends have arrived. Really? said Kaia, looking out through the window. I see the uniforms of the Imperial Light Horse. Checkmate indeed, but against you, said Geralt. You lose, Skiru. Release the girl. Like hell. The barrack doors yielded to kicks, and about a dozen men entered, most of them in identical black uniforms. They were led by a fair-haired, bearded man with a silver bear on his spalder. Quit Ian's witches, he asked menacingly. What's going on here? Who answers for this brawl? For the bodies in the yard, speak up this minute. Commander, Gladivian Vort, drop your swords. They obeyed, for crossbows and arbalests were being aimed at them. Released by Skiru, Angoulême meant to spring up from the table, but suddenly found herself in the grasp of a stocky, colourfully dressed bruiser with bulging frog eyes. She tried to cry out, but the bruiser clamped a gloved fist over her mouth. Let's abstain from violence, Geralt suggested coolly to the commander with the bear. We aren't criminals. Well, I never. We're acting with the knowledge and permission of Mr. Fulco Artivelde, the prefect of Riedbrunne. Well, I never, repeated the burr, signalling for Geralt and Kaia's swords to be picked up and confiscated. With the knowledge and permission of Mr. Fulco Artivelde, the esteemed Mr. Artivelde, hear that, lads? His men, those dressed in the black and colourful clothes, cackled in unison. Angoulême struggled in the grip of frog eyes, vainly trying to scream. Needlessly, Geralt already knew. Even before the smiling Skiru began to shake the hand proffered to him, even before the four black-uniformed Nilfgaardians seized Kair and three others aimed their crossbows straight at his face. Frog eyes pushed Angoulême into the arms of his comrades. The girls sagged in their grasp like a ragdoll. She didn't even try to offer any resistance. The bear walked slowly over to Geralt and suddenly slammed him in the crotch with his armoured gloved fist. Geralt bent over but didn't fall. Cold fury kept him on his feet. Then the news that you aren't the first asses to be used by one-eyed Fulka for his own purposes may console you, said the bear. Profitable business deals like the one I'm carrying out here with Mr. Homer Stragen, known by some as Nightingale, are a thorn in his side. It pisses Fulko off that I've recruited Homer Stragen into the Imperial Service and appointed him commander of the Volunteer Mines Defense Company to expedite those deals. Unable thus to avenge himself officially, he hires a variety of rogues. And witches, a smiling Skiru interjected scathingly. Outside, said the bear loudly. Five bodies are getting soaked in the rain. You murdered men in the Imperial Service. You disrupted the work of this mine. I have no doubt about it. You're spies, saboteurs, and terrorists. Martial law applies here. I hereby summarily sentence you to death. Frog eyes cackled. He walked over to Angoulême, who was being held up by the bandits, grasped one of her breasts, and squeezed it hard. Well then, flaxen hair, he croaked and it transpired that his voice was more frog-like than his eyes. His bandit soubriquet, assuming he'd christened himself with it, showed a sense of humour. But if it was an alias intended to disguise, it was extremely effective. We meet again, then, the frog-like nightingale croaked, pinching Angoulême in the breast. Happy? The girl groaned in pain. Where are the pearls and stones you stole from me, you whore? When I'd Fulco took them for safekeeping, Angoulême yelled, ineffectually pretending that she wasn't afraid. Go and claim them back. Nightingale croaked and goggled his eyes. Now he looked like a genuine frog, which any moment would start catching flies with its tongue. He pinched Angoulême even harder. She struggled and groaned even more pathetically. Through the red fog of fury covering Geralt's eyes, the girl had once again begun to resemble Ciri. Take them the bear ordered impatiently. To the yard with them. He's a, a witcher, 
said one of the bandits from Nightingale's Mines Defence Company, hesitantly. He's a hard case. How can we take him with our bare hands? He's liable to cast a charm on us or somewhere else. No fear. A smiling Skiru patted his pocket. Without his witch's amulet, he's unable to work magic, and I have it. Take him. There were more armed Nilfgaardians in black cloaks in the yard, and more of Nightingale's colourful Hassa. A clutch of miners had also gathered. The ubiquitous children and dogs were also milling around. Nightingale suddenly lost control of himself, quite as though a devil had possessed him. Croaking furiously, he punched Angoulême, and when she fell, kicked her repeatedly. Geralt strained in the grip of the bandits and was hit on the back of the neck with something hard for his pains. They said, croaked Nightingale, hopping over Angoulême like a frantic toad, that you'd had a stake shoved up your backside in Reed Brunner, you little strumpet. You were destined for the stake then, and it'll expire on the stake today. Boys, find a post and sharpen it to a spike. Look lively. Mr. Stragon, the bear grimaced. I see no reason to indulge in such a time-consuming and bestial execution. The prisoners ought simply to be hanged. He fell silent under the evil gaze of the frog-like eyes. Be quiet, Captain, croaked the bandit. I pay you too much for you to make improper remarks. I promised Angulem a foul death, and now I'm going to deliver it. Hang those two of you must. I'm not bothered about them. But I am, Shkiru interrupted. I need them both, especially the Witcher, especially him. And since skewering the girl will take some time, I shall make use of it. He walked over and fixed his feline eyes on Geralt. You ought to know, freak, he said, that it was I that dispatched your comrade, Codringer, in Dorian. I did it on the orders of my lord, Master Vilgefortz, whom I've served for many years but I did it with immense pleasure. The old rogue, Codringer, the half-elf continued without getting a reaction, had the audacity to stick his nose into Master Vilgefortz's affairs. I got at him with a knife, and I torched that loathsome monstrosity Fen among his papers and roasted him alive. I could have simply stabbed him, but I devoted a little time and effort to listen to his howling and squealing. And howl and squeal he did, I swear like a stuck piglet. There was nothing, absolutely nothing human in that howling. Do you know why I'm telling you all this? Because I could also simply knife you or order you stabbed to death. But I shall put in a little time and effort and listen as you howl. You said death is always the same? You'll soon see it isn't. Hey, boys, heat up some pitch in the tar kettle and fetch a chain. Something smashed against the corner of the barracks and exploded with a red flash and a frightful crash. A second vessel containing petroleum, Geralt recognised it by the smell, landed plumb in the tar kettle, and a third shattered just beside the men restraining the horses. It boomed and belched fire, and the horses fell into a frenzy. There was a turmoil, and from it rushed a howling dog in flames. One of Nightingale's bandits suddenly spread his arms and keeled over in the mud with an arrow in his back. Long live the free slopes! Figures in grey mantles and fur hats loomed at the top of the hill on the scaffoldings and the catwalks. More missiles, trailing wakes of flames and smoke behind them like fireworks, fell onto the people, horses and mine buildings. Two flew into the workshop onto the floor strewn with shavings and sawdust. Long live the free slopes! Death to the Nilfgaardian invaders! Arrow fletchings and crossbow bolts sang. One of the black-uniformed Nilfgaardians tumbled down under his horse. One of Nightingale's bandits fell with his throat pierced, and one of the close-cropped muscle men dropped with a bolt in his nape. The bear sprawled with a ghastly groan. An arrow had hit him in the chest under the sternum beneath the gorget. The arrow had been stolen, though no one could have known that from a military convoy and was standard issue of the Imperial Army, slightly adapted. The wide, two-bladed arrowhead had been filed in several places with the aim of fragmentation. The arrowhead fragmented beautifully in the bear's guts. Down with the tyrant Emir! The free slopes! Nightingale croaked, grabbing his arm grazed by a bolt. One of the children rolled over in the mud, pierced through by an arrow from one of the less accurate freedom fighters. 
One of the men holding Geralt dropped. One of the men holding Angoulême fell over. The girl wrested herself free of the second, drew a knife from her boot in an instant, swung hard and slashed. In her frenzy, she missed Nightingale's throat, but mutilated his cheek splendidly, almost down to the teeth. Nightingale croaked more gratingly than usual, and his eyes bulged more bulgingly. He slumped to his knees, blood spurting between hands clutching his face. Angoulême gave an unearthly scream and leapt forward to finish the job, but couldn't, for another bomb exploded between her and Nightingale, belching fire and clouds of foul-smelling smoke. Fire roared all around, and a fiery pandemonium raged. Horses thrashed, whinnied and kicked. The bandits and Nilfgaardians yelled. The miners ran in a panic. Some fled and others tried to put out the blazing buildings. Geralt had managed to pick up his sail, which the bear had released. He jabbed it into the forehead of a tall woman in a chainmail vest who was aiming a blow at Angoulême with a morning star as she rose to her feet. He sliced open the thigh of a black-uniformed Nilfgaardian running at him with a half-pike. He then slashed the throat of the next one, who simply happened to be in the way. Right alongside him, a frantic, scorched horse, rushing blindly, knocked over and trampled another child. Seize the horse! Seize the horse! Kair was now right beside him and created room for them both with great swings of his sword. Geralt wasn't listening or looking. He slew another Nilf guardian. He looked around for Skiru. Angoulême, on bended knee, shot a crossbow she'd picked up, sending the bolt, at a distance of three paces, into the belly of a bandit from the mine's defence company who was coming for her. Then she sprang to her feet and hung onto the bridle of a horse running by. Grab one of them, Geralt, Kair yelled, and ride! The witcher slit open another Nilf guardian from breastbone to hip with a downward stroke. He shook blood from his eyebrows and eyelashes with a sharp jerk of his head. Skiru, where are you, you bastard? A stroke, a cry, warm drops on his face. Mercy, howled a lad in a black uniform, kneeling in the mud. The witcher hesitated. Wake up, yelled Kair, grabbing him by the shoulders and shaking him hard. Control yourself. Are you in a frenzy? Angoulême was returning at a gallop, dragging another horse by the reins. She was being followed by two riders. One of them fell, hit by the arrow of a fighter for the freedom of the slopes. The other was hurled from the saddle by Kair's sword. Geralt leapt into the saddle. And then he saw Skiru in the light of the blaze, summoning the panicked Nilfgaardians to himself. Beside the half-elf, Nightingale, croaking and bawling out curses with his bloody maw, looked like a veritable cannibal troll. Geralt roared furiously, reined his horse around and whirled his sword. Beside him, Kair shouted and swore, wobbling in the saddle, blood from his forehead pouring over his eyes and face. Geralt, help me! Shkiru had gathered a group around him and was yelling and ordering them to shoot their crossbows. Geralt slapped his horse on the rump with the flat of his sword, ready for a suicidal charge. Skiru had to die. Nothing else meant anything or mattered. Kair meant nothing. Angoulême meant nothing. Geralt, Angoulême yelled. Help, Kair! He came to his senses and was ashamed. Geralt held Kair up, supported him. Kair wiped his eyes with a sleeve and the blood instantly poured over them again. It's nothing. A scratch. His voice shook. Ride, witcher. Follow Angoulême. Ride. From the foot of the mountain came a great cry and a crowd armed with picks, crowbars and axes came rushing out. For miners from the neighbouring mines of Common Cause and Lucky Pit were hurrying to help their mates and comrades from the Rialto colliery. Or from some other. Who could possibly know? Geralt kicked his horse with his heels. They rode at a gallop, recklessly. Ventre à terre. They pounded on, not looking back, hugging their horses' necks. Angoulême had landed the best horse, a small but fleet and sturdy bandit steed. Geralt's horse, a bay with Nilfgaardian trappings, was beginning to snort and wheeze and was having difficulty holding its head up. Kair's horse, also an army beast, was stronger and tougher. But what of that when its rider was causing problems, swaying in the saddle, mechanically clenching with his thighs and bleeding profusely onto his mount's mane and neck? 
but they galloped on. Angoulême, who had pulled ahead, was waiting for them on a bend, in a place where the road went downhill, winding amongst rocks. Our pursuers, she panted, smearing dirt on her face, will come after us. They won't give up. The miners saw which way we fled. We oughtn't to stay on the highway. We have to head into the forests, get off the road, lose them. No, the witcher protested, anxiously listening to the sounds coming from the horse's lungs. We must stay on the highway, take the straightest and shortest route to Sans Retour. Why? There's no time to talk. Let's ride. Squeeze what you can from the horses. They galloped on. The witcher's bay wheezed. The bay wasn't fit to ride any further. It was barely walking, legs as stiff as boards, panting hard, the air escaping from it in a horse wheezing. It finally fell over on its side, kicked stiffly, looked at its rider, and there was reproach in its cloudy eye. Kair's horse was in somewhat better shape, but Kair's condition was worse. He simply fell from the saddle, raised himself, but only onto his hands and knees, and retched spasmodically, though his stomach was empty. When Geralt and Angoulême tried to touch his bloodied head, he screamed. Damn it, said the girl. It's quite a haircut they've given him. The skin of the young Nilfgaardian's forehead and temple, along with the hair, was detached from the skull along a considerable length. Were it not for the fact that the blood had formed a sticky clot, the loose patch would probably have fallen off all the way to his ear. It was a gruesome sight. How did that happen? They threw a hatchet right at him. To make it even funnier, it wasn't an Elfgardian, nor any of Nightingale's men, but one of the quarrymen. Doesn't matter who threw it. The witcher bound Kair's head tightly with a torn-off shirt sleeve. It matters, luckily, that he was a poor shot, and that he just scalped him rather than smashing his skull in. But Kair took a hefty whack in the pate, and the brain felt it too. He won't stay upright in the saddle, even if the horse could bear his weight. What shall we do then? Your horse has died, his is almost dead, and the sweat's dropping off mine. And they're on our trail. We can't stay here. We have to stay here. Me and Kair, and Kair's horse. You ride on, hard. Your horse is strong, it can withstand the gallop. And even were you to exhaust it. Angle them. Somewhere in Sans Retour Valley, Regis, Milva and Dandelion are waiting for us. They don't know anything of this and may fall into Skiru's clutches. You have to find them and warn them and then all four of you must ride as fast as you can to Toussaint. You won't be followed there, I hope. What about you and Kair? Angoulême bit her lip. What will happen to you? Nightingale isn't stupid. When he sees a half-dead, riderless horse, he'll rake over every hollow in the region and you won't get far with Kair. Skiru, for he's the one pursuing us, We'll follow your trail. Do you think so? I'm certain. Go. What will Auntie see when I show up without you? You'll explain. But not to Milva. To Rages. Rages will know what's to be done. And we... When Kaye's mop dries a bit harder onto his pate, we'll make for Toussaint. We'll meet up there somehow. Very well. Don't dally. Get on your horse and ride. Don't let our pursuers get any closer. Don't let them hunt you by sight. Don't teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Look after yourselves. Farewell. Farewell, Angoulême. He didn't move too far from the road. He couldn't deny himself a glance at their pursuers. And in fact, he didn't fear any trouble from them, knowing they wouldn't waste time and would pursue Angoulême. He wasn't mistaken. The riders, who thundered into the pass less than a quarter of an hour later, stopped, admittedly, at the sight of the dead horse, shouted, argued, trotted around the roadside bushes, but returned almost at once to the road to resume their pursuit. They clearly believed that two of the three fugitives were now riding one horse, and it would be possible to catch them quickly if they didn't dawdle. Geralt saw that some of the pursuing horses weren't in the best of shape either. There weren't too many black cloaks of the Nilfgaardian light horse among them. Nightingale's colourful brigands predominated. Geralt couldn't see if Nightingale himself was taking part in the hunt or if he'd stayed behind to treat his mutilated face. When the hoofbeats of the vanishing pursuers had faded away, Geralt stood up from his hiding place in the bracken, lifted and held up the moaning and groaning Kair. 
The horse is too feeble to bear you. Will you be able to walk? The Nilfgaardian made a noise which might as easily have been agreement or disagreement, or something else. But he shuffled forward, and that was the main idea. They went down to the stream bed in the ravine. Kair negotiated the final few yards of the slippery slope in a rather chaotic descent. He crawled to the stream, drank, and poured the icy water copiously over the bandage on his head. The witcher didn't hurry him. He was breathing heavily himself, gathering his strength. He walked upstream, supporting Kair and pulling the horse at the same time, wading in the water and stumbling on pebbles and fallen tree trunks. After some time, Kair stopped cooperating, stopped shuffling his legs obediently. In fact, he stopped moving them at all, so the witcher simply dragged him. It was impossible to continue like that, particularly since the stream bed was obstructed by rocks and waterfalls. Geralt grunted and lifted the wounded man onto his back. Neither did pulling the horse make life any easier. When they finally emerged from the ravine, the witcher simply collapsed on the wet forest floor and lay, panting, completely drained, beside the groaning Kair. He lay there for a long time. His knee had begun to throb again with intense pain. Kair finally started to show signs of life once more, and soon after, astonishingly, got up, swearing and holding his head. They set off. Kair marched bravely at first, then slowed, then slumped down. Geralt heaved him onto his back again and lugged him, grunting, slipping over the stones. Pain shot through his knee and fiery black bees seemed to flash in front of his eyes. Just a month ago, Kair moaned from his back. Who'd have thought you'd be lugging me like this? Quiet, Nilfgaardian. You're heavier when you talk. When they finally made it to the rocks and the rock walls, it was almost dark. The witcher didn't look for or find a cave. He fell exhausted by the first opening he came across. Human skulls, ribs, pelvises and other bones were strewn around on the cave floor, but, more importantly, there were also dry branches there. Kair was feverish, trembling and shivering. He endured the sewing of the patch of skin to his skull using twine and a crooked needle manfully and fully conscious with his faculties intact. The crisis came later during the night. Geralt lit a fire in the cave, disregarding safety considerations. Actually, outside it was drizzling and a strong wind was blowing, so it was unlikely that anybody was wandering around watching out for the glare of a fire, and he had to keep Kair warm. The fever lasted the entire night. He trembled, moaned and raved. Geralt enjoyed no sleep. He kept the fire burning, and his knee hurt like hell. A young and sturdy fellow, Kair came around the following morning. He was pale and sweaty, and the heat of his fever could still be felt. His chattering teeth somewhat complicated articulation, but what he said was comprehensible and he spoke lucidly. He was complaining of a headache, a fairly normal symptom for someone whose scalp has been torn from their head by an axe. Geralt divided his time between anxiously catnapping and catching rainwater dripping from the rocks in beakers he had fashioned from birch bark. Thirst was tormenting both him and Kair. Geralt? Yes. Kair tidied up the wood in the fire using a femur he'd found. When we were fighting in the mine, I was scared. I know. For a moment, it looked as though you'd gone berserk. That nothing mattered to you any longer, aside from killing. I know. I was afraid, he calmly finished, that you'd butcher Skiru to death in your frenzy, and we wouldn't get any information out of a dead man, would we? Geralt cleared his throat. He was growing to like the young Nilfgaardian more and more. He was not only brave, but smart, too. You did right, sending Angolem away, Kaya continued, 
his teeth chattering only slightly. It isn't for girls. Not even for girls like her. We'll sort it out, the two of us. We'll ride down our pursuers. But not in order to slaughter them in a berserker frenzy. What you said about revenge that time? Geralt. Even inventions, there must be some method. We'll catch up with that half-elf and force him to tell us where Ciri is. Ciri's dead. Not true. I don't believe she's dead. And you don't either. Admit it. I don't want to believe it. A gale was whistling outside, and the rain was whispering. It was cosy in the cave. Geralt? Yes. Ciri's alive. I've had dreams again. Yes. Something happened at the Equinox. Something dreadful. Yes, without doubt, I felt and saw it. But she's alive. She's definitely alive. Let's hurry. But not to avenge and murder. To find her. Yes. Yes, Kai, you're right. And you? Don't you have dreams now? I do, he said bitterly. But seldom since we crossed the Yaruga. And I remember nothing after waking. Something has ended in me, Kai. Something has burned out. Something has ruptured in me. Never mind, Geralt. I shall dream for both of us. They set off at dawn. It had stopped raining. It even seemed that the sun was trying to find a hole in the greyness enveloping the sky. They rode slowly on the single horse with the Nilfgaardian military trappings. The horse trudged over the pebbles, moving at a walk along the bank of the sun's retour, the small river leading to Toussaint. Geralt knew the way. He had been there once, a long, long time ago. Much had changed since then. But the valley had not changed, and neither had the Sans Retour stream, which, the further they went, became more and more the river Sans Retour. Neither the Amel Mountains nor the obelisk of the Gorgon, Devil Mountain, had changed. There were certain things that simply didn't change. A soldier doesn't question his orders, said Kair, feeling the dressing on his head. Doesn't analyze them, doesn't ponder over them, doesn't wait for them to be explained to him. That's the first thing they teach a soldier where I come from. So you can understand that not for a second did I ever question an order which was issued to me. The thought of why I had to capture a Sintran princess didn't even cross my mind. An order's an order. I was cross, naturally because I wanted to taste fame, fighting against the knighthood, against the regular army. But working for the intelligence service is also treated as an honor where I come from. If it had only concerned a more taxing task, a more important prisoner, but a girl. Geralt threw a trout's spine onto the fire. Before nightfall, they had caught enough fish in a stream flowing into the sans retour to eat their fill. The trout were spawning and easy to catch. He listened to Kaia's account, and the curiosity in him struggled with a feeling of profound hurt. It was essentially chance, Kaia went on, gazing into the flames. Pure chance. There was, as I found out later, a spy at the Sintron court, a valet. When we'd captured the city and were preparing to encircle the castle, the spy stole out and gave a sign that he would try to get the princess out of the city. Several squads like mine were formed. By accident, it was my group the men spiriting Syria away ran into. A chase through the streets began, in a quarter that was already on fire. It was sheer hell. Nothing but the roar of flames, walls of fire. The horses didn't want to go there, and the men, what can I say, were in no hurry to urge them. My subordinates, there were four of them, began to claim I'd gone mad that I was leading them to their doom. I barely managed to wrest back control. We pursued them through that fiery bedlam and caught up with them. We suddenly had them before us. 
five mounted Sintrans, and a bloody fight began before I could tell them to watch out for the girl, who ended up on the ground at once anyway, as the man who was carrying her perished first. One of my men lifted her up and onto his horse, but he didn't get far, for one of the Sintrans stabbed him through the back. I saw the blade pass an inch from Ciri's head, and she fell in the mud again. She was dazed with fear. I saw her cuddling up to the dead man, saw her trying to crawl under him, like a kitten by its dead mother. He fell silent and swallowed audibly. She didn't even know she was cuddling up to the enemy, to a hated Nilfgaardian. We ended up alone, she and I, he continued a moment later and all around us, corpses and fire. Siri was groveling in a puddle, and the water and blood were beginning to steam. A house collapsed, and I could see very little through the sparks and smoke. The horse wouldn't go any closer. I called to her, appealed to her to come to me. My voice had almost gone, trying to outshout the conflagration. She saw and heard me, but didn't react. The horse wouldn't move, and I couldn't control it. I had to dismount. There was no way I could lift her with one arm, and I had to hold the reins with the other. The horse was struggling so much it almost threw me. When I lifted her, she began to scream. Then she tensed up and fainted. I wrapped her in my cloak, which I had wetted in a puddle, in mud, mark and blood, and we rode on, straight through the fire. I don't know by what miracle we managed to get out of there. But a breach in the wall suddenly appeared, and we were by the river. Unluckily, it turned out, for it was the spot the fleeing Nordlings had chosen. I discarded my officer's helmet, for they would have recognized me right away by it, even though the wings had burned off. The rest of my clothing was so blackened, it couldn't have betrayed me. But had the girl been conscious, had she screamed, they would have put me to the sword. I was lucky. I rode a few furlongs with them and then fell back and hid in the bushes by a river, bearing dead bodies. He fell silent, coughed slightly, and felt his bandaged head with both hands, and blushed. Or was it merely the glare of the flames? Siri was so dirty. I had to undress her. She didn't resist. She didn't scream. She just trembled, eyes closed. Each time I touched her to clean her or dry her, she tensed and stiffened. I, I know, I, I ought to have spoken to her, calmed her. But suddenly I couldn't find the words in your language, in my mother's language, which I've known from a child. Unable to find the words, I tried to calm her by touch by gentleness. But she stiffened and whimpered. Like a baby. That haunted her in her nightmares, Geralt whispered. I know. Mine too. What then? She fell asleep. So did I, from fatigue. When I woke, she wasn't beside me. She was nowhere to be seen. I don't recall the rest. Those who found me claimed I was running around in circles, howling like a wolf. They had to tie me up. When I'd calmed down, I was taken in hand by intelligence agents, Vatia de Rido's subordinates. They wanted to know about Cyrilla, where she was, where she fled to, how she gave me the slip, why I let her escape. And again, from the beginning, where was she, where had she fled to? Infuriated, I yelled something about the emperor hunting a little girl like a sparrowhawk. For that, I spent a year locked up in the citadel. But then I was back in grace, for I was needed. On Thanet, they needed someone who spoke the common speech and knew what Siri looked like. The emperor wanted me to go to Thanet. And not to fail this time, but bring him Siri. He was silent for a time. Emir gave me a chance. I could have refused, 
It would have meant absolute, total, perpetual disfavor and oblivion, but I could have declined if I'd wanted. But I didn't decline. For you see, Geralt, I couldn't forget her. I won't lie to you. I saw her constantly in my dreams, and not as the skinny child she was by the river when I undressed and washed her. I saw her, and I still see her, as a woman, comely, aware, provocative, with such details as a crimson rose tattooed on her groin. What are you talking about? I don't know. I don't know myself. But that's how it has been and is yet. I see her in my dreams, just as I saw her in my dreams back then. That is why I volunteered for the mission to Thanith. That's why I wanted to join you afterwards. I... I want to see her. Again. I want to touch her hair again. Look into her eyes. I want to gaze on her. Kill me if you will, but I won't pretend any longer. I think... I... I think I love her. Please don't laugh. I don't feel like laughing. So that's why I'm riding with you. Do you understand? Do you want her for yourself or for your emperor? I'm a realist he whispered. I mean, she won't want me. But as the Emperor's spouse, I could at least see her. As a realist, the Witcher snapped. You should remember, we have to find and rescue her first, assuming your dreams aren't lying and Ciri is really still alive. I'm aware of that. And should we find her, what then? We shall see. We shall see, Kaia. Don't deceive me. Be frank. You won't let me take her, will you? He didn't reply. Kair didn't repeat the question. Until then, he asked coolly, may we be comrades? We may, Kair. I apologize again for back there. I don't know what came over me. I've never seriously suspected you of treachery or duplicity. I'm not a traitor. I'll never betray you, Witcher. They rode along a deep gorge, which the swift flowing and wide Sandra Tour, now a river, had carved out of the hills. They rode east towards the border of the Duchy of Tusa. Gorgon, Devil Mountain, rose above them. To look at the summit, they would have had to crane their necks. But they didn't. First, they smelled smoke, then a moment later beheld a campfire with spits over it and filleted trout roasting on them. They then beheld a solitary individual sitting beside the fire. Not long before, Geralt would have mocked, mercilessly ridiculed, and thought a complete idiot anyone who would have dared claim that he, a witcher, would feel great joy at the sight of a vampire. Oh ho! Emil Regis Rolehek Tetsiev Godifroy said placidly, adjusting the spits. Look what the cat dragged in. The knocker, likewise called a knacker, Koblinau, Butra, Polterduk, Karkurios, Rubertsal or Pusteki, is a form of kobold, which nonetheless, the knocker considerably surpasses in magnitude and strength. The knocker, as a rule, also wears a great beard, which kobolds habitually do not. The knocker dwells in adits, vertical shafts, spoil heaps, precipices, tenebrous hollows, inside rocks in diverse grottos, caves and stone wildernesses. Wherever it dwells, natural riches such as metal, ore, carbon, salt or petroleum are surely buried in the earth. Thus, one may often encounter a knocker in mines, particularly abandoned ones, although it is also likely to appear in active ones. It is a vicious scourge and pest, a curse and veritable divine retribution for miners and quarrymen whom the vexatious knocker leads astray. By knocking on the rock, it beguiles and frightens, obstructs galleries, steals and spoils mining equipment and all kinds of belongings, 
and is also inclined to strike one on the head from a place of concealment. But it may be bribed to curb its mischief-making by placing in a dark gallery or shaft some bread and butter, a smoked cheese, or a flitch of smoked gammon. But best of all is a demijohn of alcohol, since the knocker is extremely greedy for such. Physiologists 